you just do it, it'll turn out okay. <laughs> and today has been a hell of a day of stuff I did. You look pretty worn out. I rode my bike 26 miles. You said on Dapper Stream. Yes, but if it was just that, I mean, that would be saucy enough, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got a late start doing it. Got a late start doing it. I was going to do it in the early morning before it got too, too hot. I mean, lucky it was in the 70s today. By the time it was in this. Uh, Plan was in the in the sixties, but yeah, that that got delayed to, from eight a.m. to about eleven a.m. Then, for like a say about uh, half a mile of a, a bike trail, I did. I had to go on a mile and a half detour on my bike. Then when I got there. The original plan was to uh, catch a ride back, you know. Mm -hmm. But then there, that plan changed, so I had to, so I had to rest up. Uh, I went to Panera, charged my phone, rested up a bit, and then but took the 20, 30 miles back to where I started. I was gonna ride the bus, ride the bus from, from my down downtown to where I live. Missed that bus by like five minutes. So I think it's the, the next bus, which was only, it's only makes it halfway mm. to the thing, to work to just just like a Walmart in my down my area. Then I do the rest of the from like maybe a, about another mile trip, give or take, from there to back home. And I just got here like literally twenty minutes ago. Jeez. And then you know, like I said, I left. On the same time, around the same time this morning, so I think I'm 12 hours. For like, it was gonna be like a really quick, maybe two hour bike ride turned into a, a 12 hour experience. Jeez. But today, we're, we're, we're talking about my travels. We're here to talk about the American travels. <laughs> <laughs> that was a heck of a segue. <laughs> All right. Go fast. Get a sponsor up here. And I look at that night now. You, you, you have to have the art, uh, the archives on you. Mm -hmm. The screen sharing. You have the, you have, you have the stuff on decoration on you. you yeah. Screen share. I've got my uh, my avatar up, but um, uh, hold on. Can you screen? Okay. What are what are we talking here? It it's be the button third button on down here. It says share screen. Oh yeah. Um. Well, what I if not, I can if not I can I can find I can go online and find my find a copy. I've got uh, actually I've got the Wikipedia page up on my computer because that was handy. Um, okay. just to consult on to. Um. Here, uh, are you not gonna just let me find? You're just not gonna let me switch, so you're gonna have to. There we go. There is my my Wikipedia page. Awesome. So. Uh all right, so let's go. Where did all this come from? Where did this come from? Why? Why did we do? So the the history of the United States as you know European colonies was well over 150 years old at this point. Um, Plymouth is 1620, but Plymouth wasn't the first British colony, which wasn't even the first colony in what is now the United States. The first permanent colony in, this world, in what is now the United States that is still being um, 
uh, is still populated and has been continuously a city that whole time is St. Augustine, Florida. Um, but that was Spanish, so it's not really relevant to the... We, we don't count that because we're not Spanish. Florida might count it. Yeah, Florida is very, very proud of St. Augustine, and rightfully so, but they're not relevant to the Declaration. Uh, right, so was, was it Jamestown, then, for, for us? Yeah, Jamestown, 1603. Or, not 1603. Seven. 1607, yeah. Which is just barely into the reign of James I. Um, there's a reason that the first settle, you know, the first territory is called Virginia, but the first city is called Jamestown. Yeah, uh, yeah, Virginia is for the f f former former leader whose colonies didn't work out very well. Yeah, so tried to Roanoke, think. you know, Roanoke is its own whole thing, but they tried. And one of the fun thing is one of the reasons the Roanoke colony failed was uh, when the governor went back to try to get more assistance. Uh, ships were being borrowed from everywhere for the, the attack of the Spanish Armada. So that's 1588. So we're talking over, we're talking nearly 200 years before the Declaration of Independence. Um, and for most, you know, there's a lot of colonial history, but for most of that time, contrary to what a lot of people think, the the colonists kind of went along as if the the as if what was going on in England didn't a hundred percent matter. Um, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. Basically, yeah. Like, what are they going to do about it? Seems to have been the prevailing attitude because it was a long, treacherous journey by ship across the Atlantic. And nobody important ever took that journey because why? Yeah, I, I guess after us, they they started paying more attention to their, their colonies. Yeah. The, well, the, the, the thing is, is they were starting to pay more attention to their colonies, uh, starting with what in the United States is called the French and Indian War, or what's called in Europe the seven the Seven Year War. Right, right. French and Indian War is actually a really bad name for it because it sounds like the French and the Indians were fighting, well, which but, they were, but they were fighting against the British. Yeah, it's weird. I, I learned a lot of what, uh, what we had in a, your names over there had different names over here, like the Queen yeah. Anne War, all that stuff was like the Spanish Succession War over yeah. there, and all these different successions. And we like, what's, yeah. what's, called the, what's, what's called the war that the name of our current monarch? <laughs> Yeah, well, and you know, um, that's that's not just the stuff that happened before independence, because all of the battles of the Civil War have different names, depending on whether you're in the North or the South. So, you know, it's like, well, is it Bull Run, or I believe it's uh, Manassas is the Southern yeah. name for it. Um, and apparently the... Um, uh, the one side tended to name the battles after towns, and the other tended to name the battles after waterways. Yeah, and so well, we that's why you got. To... Yeah, we can talk about we can talk about that failed case of independence at their time. Oh yes, but yeah, and the the documents of of attempted secession are interesting and really put the lie to the whole it wasn't really slavery thing, but. Um, about the time of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, um, the British uh, royalty started realizing, the British government started realizing that uh, colonies could have an influence on how things played out in Europe. And they started taking a much more direct role well, in how things were governed in yeah. the Americas. Well, after that war, that they got they got the hands on Canada, India, and what's yep. other 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 important things. Well, Canada except for Quebec. Oh, I, 
Well, I thought I mean, Quebec Ke- was the thing they got because Quebec, Quebec is, is Quebec is its own thing that I would argue even Quebec doesn't really control. But um, Quebec was French, but a lot of the rest of Canada had already been British, and actually, uh, the Basque had been fishing off the coast of Nova Scotia since before Columbus. So Canada is its own really complicated thing that I'm not as much up on because I'm not Canadian. But, um, so they, the, not only did the English government start sending more troops just on a regular basis as sort of a, hey, we should have these here in case we need them kind of thing. But... The idea came that, hey, maybe the the Americans should be paying for some of this. And the Americans were like, hey, how about you let us have a voice in Parliament before you make us pay taxes? I wonder what happened the, if they actually got a, if each state got their own Parliament, at least one Parliament seat. <laughs> you know, it probably would have only delayed uh because i mean even canada eventually split from from the uk but it also would have helped them hold on to some of their other colonies for longer too because that became a real thing with the other colonies was like wait a minute we don't have representation either of course even if even though canada split they still considered they're yep. still connected the, i mean the commonwealth is a whole thing and uh I've I've been in the um it's not a parliament because it's unicameral, I forget what it's called, but the legislature building in uh Victoria, British Columbia, and they had at the time I was there, which was some years ago, obviously, a very large portrait of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Because technically she was she is still their monarch. But the and let's be clear independence was an elite movement in in the colonies um it's like commerce not care that much either way well yeah they they didn't have time if if all you were doing was subsistence farming it kind of didn't matter whether you were subsistence farming under the British crown or your own new, you know, freely elected government. Your life wasn't going to change all that much either way. And of course, as we'll discuss as this goes on, if you were a slave, uh, yeah, it mattered even less, except for the part where during the revolution, the, um, the, British were offering freedom to slaves who fought for them. And the Americans weren't. Because the American slave-owning aristocracy was very prominent in the Continental Congress. Fun times. Yeah. Um, John so, Adams had feelings on the subject. Yeah. So, first, so first, I guess first we tried the diplomatic approach. That didn't work. Yeah. We tried the diplomatic approach repeatedly. And actually, um, it's interesting to note that Benjamin Franklin was, for a while, fairly strongly opposed to independence, in part because he had been in London on behalf of the Continental Congress and didn't really have a feeling of how things were going back in the colonies. And so he was still convinced that reconciliation could work, uh, sorry, until he came back and it was like, oh, no, I guess it can't. Um, and by the time the, the Congress met to discuss independence, the Revolutionary War had already started. Yeah, this was after the like, Second Continental Congress at this point. Yeah, we're, you know, this is after Lexington and Concord. This is, you know, George Washington was 
off leading an army at the time. Okay, so he he already got in tra- he's already in charge by then. He's already in charge by the time all of this starts. Um, after having spent a fair amount of time um, during the first Congress sitting around in his uniform from the French and Indian War to remind everyone that he had experience as, as a soldier, so they might maybe want to consider putting him in charge. You know, we discussed when we went over the Constitution how reluctant Washington had been to become president. He was not reluctant to take over the army. He wanted to take over the army. Well, at least in America, military leadership and political leadership are two two different issues. Yes. At least it should should be. (laughs) Um, And so... The, the issue is, and I'll confess here that I haven't seen Hamilton, but what I have seen a bunch of times is 1776. And I don't know if you've seen that one, but that is, uh, that's a musical so old that the movie was shaped by the politics of Richard Nixon um, about the declaration and one of it doesn't get everything right but one of the things it does get right is that the idea of the declaration was a controversial one even within congress i've seen estimates and i lord i don't know how they came by these statistics but i've seen estimates that one third of the colonial population at the time actually supported independence. One third supported staying with the, the, with Great Britain and one third did not care and just wanted the war to end and everything to just sounds, sounds American to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense because again, for a lot of these people, their lives were not going to substantially change. You know, they might have slightly better say over over their uh, their laws, but only slightly, given that even with independence, it was still considered that only white male property owners were going to make any laws at all. Were going to even be allowed to vote. So if you weren't a white male property owner, hard to imagine you cared very much who was making the rules. Yep. The answer was not you. This is why most of them couldn't vote for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's the the number of people in this country eligible to vote has been on a slow upward progression the entire time we've been a country. And we've gone through several of those things in our, in our, uh, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Amendment and, talk. And there are some that we didn't even get to, um, such as things like, you know, the idea that you didn't have to own property. Yeah. As long as you're a male, male and, uh, right. and white. That's if it. you're a white dude, you can still vote whether or not you have property. And, you know, with the, the Chinese Exclusionary Act and, and other laws of that kind in the 20th century, um, if you were a Chinese immigrant, you were never going to be able to vote because you couldn't become a citizen. It was illegal. So by abolishing that law, which did not take an amendment, that increased the number of people who were now suddenly eligible to become eligible to vote. Uh, so most of the country didn't really care, but a handful of elite guys met in Philadelphia in what was apparently a very hot summer to talk about can we fix it or do we have to break away? Funny story real fast. Mm-hmm. You originally talked to me about doing this on the third, but mm-hmm. 
but plans. Otherwise, I had to wait till, till September 9th. Yeah, well, you know. For what it's worth, um, most of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, contrary to our mental image of it, did not sign on July the 4th. They straggled in over months. It's almost like transportation was an issue back, back then. It's a bit like, yeah. You know, that is one of the things 1776 does get wrong. It ends on this big dramatic moment of these guys getting up one at a time. And that's not how it happened. And the that's guy, not even close to and how the it guy happened. And the guy doing this big, big, the guy doing this big, uh, 20 foot, 20 point font. Yeah. Oh, John Hancock's signature is really huge on it. And the joke has always been that it was so that George could read it without his glasses. Um, it's a. It's much more likely that he was just the first person to sign. He had the most room. <laughs> he was the president of the Continental Congress, so he was the first one to sign. Everybody else had to cram their signatures in, and he didn't have to worry about it. Now, was there more than one writer or an editor? Or is it... Yeah, there was originally a... Uh, five-person committee. What it was, was it had been said that in order for the declaration to be ratified, it had to be unanimous. No state was colony, still colonies at the time, no colony was going to be cut away from England without its consent. And they could not get a unanimous vote and they knew it and so they said okay well let us have a written document explaining exactly what our problem is and why we feel we need to dissolve these ties and so they appointed a five-person committee and I have to confess, I can only off the top of my head remember three of the people in it, but three of the people in it were Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, so you don't really need to remember the other two guys, because they weren't that important. A lot of people, a lot of people only, don't even remember the two of those guys. Right, exactly. Well, you know, <laughs> and, and it really was something that John Adams said at Thomas Jefferson's funeral, was that when it came time to remember the um the whole revolution nobody was going to remember him nobody was going to remember most of the people they were going to remember ben franklin and george washington and what they would remember was that george was that ben franklin struck the ground with his lightning rod and george franklin or george washington sprung fully formed from the ground on his horse and then so won the, the battle all by himself so you said you said when John Adams at his funeral, his Jeff's funeral, it was like it was like two hours before his own funeral. It was Ben Franklin's funeral. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Ben Franklin's funeral. Okay, I thought yeah. it was like Tom. Tom, Tom, no, no, Tom no. They, they died the same day. An hour, they did die the same day. No, Ben Franklin died a bit before them. He was the oldest uh, member of the Congress at the time. He was in his seventies. Yeah, he died right, 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 right after the Constitution got yeah. ratified. He was not a young man. And he was old and tired and had gout. And uh, one of his, his children, he had an illegitimate son who his way of rebelling against his father was being the royal governor of the, the state of New Jersey. In fact, was the British. <laughs> yeah. And he was actually in, uh, captured and imprisoned around the time of, of uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, it should be said that they hadn't spoken to one another for some time at that point and that Franklin didn't entirely care. Not a loving family, but, um, it was agreed that, uh, for a lot of reasons, it had to be a Southerner writing the declaration. A lot of what's going on behind the scenes is... We have to involve the Southerners, and in because, particular, we have to involve Virginia. Because at this point, most of this, the stuff had been up, up, up north, like Massachusetts and stuff, and Rhode Island. And all, yeah, well, it's partially that most of the battles were happening in the north, but it's also mm -hmm. that most of the money was in the south. Well, I, I meant, well, well, yeah, but the battles too, but, but you know, 
the Boston Tea Party, the Boston Massacre. Yeah. All that. A lot of a lot of the stuff leading into the revolution was northern. But the money that basically the, the country was strongly influenced by the southern aristocracy. The slave money. Well, the slave money, but wealthy, educated men um, who were farmers. The northerners were tradesmen and they were lawyers. And there was still that kind of looking down on tradesmen and looking down on anyone who worked for a living. So even small independent farmers were not as important as rich slave-owning farmers who didn't have to do their own work. So there was a lot of that going on. So they knew that they needed to include the South. And Virginia was the uh, best regarded part of the South. The Carolinas and Georgia were, were not yet. Yeah, well, the Carolinas were fairly wealthy on the coasts. Georgia was not a lot. Georgia was still probably the poorest of the Southern states. What? What? Uh... What 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 started as a slave not a slave state a uh, prison state? It had, yeah, it had started unlike the other colonies. It had literally started as a prison colony, so the, Georgia was very not very highly regarded at the time. But Virginia, you know, the first permanent British settlement, uh, the first British settlement was in Virginia. You know, there was a lot of like, well, Virginia is really important. Uh, you know, all, all of this stuff happened in Virginia. So they had to include a Virginian. And um, Thomas Jefferson was Dr known to be a good writer. And drew the lucky straw. Well, he didn't really think so. He kind of got drafted. But he was given really very little time to produce the document because... I mean, the war was already going on, and they kind of needed to get everything settled as quickly as possible, and he's still a working member of Congress <laughs> at the time. So finally, he produces the document, and he brings it forward, and they rip it to shreds. Everybody had something to complain about in this document as presented. The biggest struggle was... Jefferson blamed King George III for the slave trade, which is ludicrous on so many levels. Since it was happening way before he it was, that. it was he, happening. You know, the first slaves were brought to the New World from Africa to Jamestown. Like 16, um, what was it, 16, 19? Yes, thereabouts, thereabouts. And Native Americans had been enslaved. The, the two reasons they didn't just stick to keeping Native Americans as slaves were, number one, it was far too easy for them to get away clean if they escaped. Because, you know, they, they know the territory. So they've been there for a while. Right. Well, and also they could just go to other Native Americans who would help them get away. That too. And they died too quickly because they didn't have resistance to old world illnesses. So native slaves were much more likely to, say, die of measles and die of smallpox. And African slaves had more resistance to that. At least the, at least the ones that were... At least the ones that were in the sugar mines. <laughs> well, I mean, if you were if you were a uh, if if you were working in the sugar fields, then you weren't dying from measles or smallpox. You were dying from exhaustion and possibly yeah. malaria. Yeah, that's, I gotta say that the one th I, 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 thing you're positive about is there was less turnover in the, in the American northern colonies. I guess because you know, yeah, the, they weren't dying on the first trip. 
like like I think the thing they said like ninety ninety percent the ninety nine ninety five percent of the slit of the transport went to went to Brazil and the Caribbean, while only like five percent went to America. Yeah, um, slavery in in Brazil and the Caribbean was brutal, in part from climate, in part from the kind of work that you were doing, and so many slaves just died that course, it was constant attempting to keep the replacement rate up of course the bad part about that that is they uh Pierre, they live long you know the bad part is they live long enough to, you know, to have kids and you know yeah so that was yeah that was ne negative up here because you know hey your kids are slaves too now congrats <laughs> yeah no it's you know and a lot of the a lot of the founding fathers and believe me the british were not averse to pointing out the hypocrisy involved here a lot of the founding fathers were slave owners now one of them after signing the declaration released his slave because he couldn't and apparently he only had the one um because he couldn't continue to own a human being while fighting for the rights of human beings to be free so good on him you know and ben franklin uh started an anti-slavery society the first anti-slavery society in the united states was founded by ben franklin you know and there were abolitionist or what would later be called abolitionist signers of the declaration but most of them were neutral to wow you own a lot of slaves yeah of course you probably i'll say i'm not you know saying this for a fact but probably a lot of the, even the even at this time the, the anti-slavery people weren't, weren't like weren't let's give weren't, weren't you know let's give black people rights to this this freedom yeah it was it was not we're going to free you and make you equal to white people it's we're going to free you and uh Whatever. figure out what we do then yeah so you know so he put this line in and ended up with the choice of either you take out the line about slavery or the south will not sign this document and the line got omitted and the thing is is they didn't put this line in 1776 because they thought it was too on the nose but john adams said i think it was john adams it might have been franklin said that by ignoring the issue of slavery in 80 years time it would be something their grandchildren would curse them for yeah well a lot now of, well, what is it, what does 80 years work out to well 1860 that's four square years yeah like i guess like i said of course not just this a lot of the things was like this the 1820 thing the 1850 thing was all, all this kicking yeah. down kick, this like tick like pff, not my yeah. problem kick down the road kick down the road a little bit yeah and in this case several of the people knew that they could not kick it down the road forever and several of the people thought that it wasn't a problem so who cared if they were kicking it down the road but not only did john adams know that kicking it down the road was a problem that was not going to fix things but he managed to predict almost to the year how long it would take before everything blew up kind of which is amazing uh, kind of like uh, that happened i think it happened several times in history like one with the uh Hinden the Hindenburg, the bismarck guy Mm -hmm. pretty much take pretty near world war two world war one yeah time. and then same thing maybe 20 years after world war one almost between world war two yeah well and there was um uh i forget which branch of the service he was there was a guy named billy mitchell who was convinced that air power was going to be really really important Oh yeah, in World I, War II. I, I remember that. Like, like airplanes, like airplanes, won't, airplanes won't, won't be important. Like, whatever. Go. He actually got court-martialed for his insistence that they needed to think about airplanes and how airplanes could be used against the United States. And then Pearl Harbor happened, and they all went, "Oh, 
Like, but at that point, uh, look, at least most, at least some bombing, most planes were dogfight planes, you know, like that. Yeah. What are they gonna do? Fire on from the fire on the ground from up no, up there? S silly guy. Yeah. So, you know, before you can even get into what it says, there's a lot of background about. Yes, these people were absolutely the elites of the country. No, not everyone in the country cared. Yes, uh, slavery is a thing that they were deliberately not talking about in this specific document. Um, and it was uh, voted on on July 2nd was the day that John Adams thought should be the holiday and officially ratified on July 4th. Now, we, we, sorry. a lot of people, I think, don't even, I think don't even know about the first the preamble part. They always get the like, second part. Yeah, the the introduction is. Um, actually, I learned it from Ben and Me, which is a, a Disney cartoon. Nice about Benjamin Franklin and the mouse who worked for him. Um, was it, was it Mickey Mouse's ancestor? <laughs> No, no, they're drawn in completely different styles. But it's a cute cartoon. It's really adorable. Um, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Uh, I believe Jefferson's original draft didn't mention God, and somebody got kind of annoyed at him about that, and so they inserted the God bit. Yeah. Take out the slaves, put in the God. Right. That's, yeah. But it's basically like, look, you know, we tried... We are in our rights to do this. Our rights don't come from the law. Our rights come from the world, the universe. We have these these rights from laws that no human controls. It's basically what this is saying. You know, but we also need to explain what we're doing here. Because if we're going to claim that we have these rights without saying why we have them, we look like whiny little crybabies. It's also worth noting that most Americans at the time weren't paying taxes because one of the biggest uh, industries in the colonies was smuggling. Yeah. Of course, but, you know. Were, were taxes more, more, more like called tariffs back then? Well, no. Oh. oh. No, tariffs are, um, you know, duties paid for import and export. And these were direct taxes. These were payable when you bought the thing. All right. um, there was a thing called the Stamp Act, which basically said that anything you bought that was printed, you had to pay to have a stamp put on it. To show that you had paid the taxes on it. And that was newspapers, that was playing cards, that was books, that was everything. And the tax on tea. You know, you bought tea, you had to pay this tax, which was then payable to the crown, to whatever. And, and most people were not officially buying tea. They were buying smuggled tea. And, and sugar but, and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, various of the founding fathers made a living through smuggling whatever their official job title was they were smugglers um but it wasn't the taxes themselves it was the belief that nobody should be able to tell them that they have to pay these taxes that they're not going to pay anyway And there were a lot of other factors going in. The tax, the tax thing makes an easy talking point. 
but you know we talked when we went over the the amendments about the whole quartering soldiers thing you know people were being forced to let soldiers stay in their homes for free and nobody wants to do that that sucks you know that's not fair it's it's like when an rp character goes into goes into your house and breaks your pot and steals your all your right. dress and stuff exactly it's like no, you, that, that's not okay and i've actually played video games where you try to like open people's doors and things and the characters yell at you and say who do you think you are and i appreciate that you know and and the soldiers were actually required to get jobs because they weren't really being paid enough so in order to to survive they had to get jobs and that was really damaging the job market in the colonies anywhere where soldiers were being kept so there were a lot of factors involved but they um they only had to work with what they had and no taxation without representation is a nice pithy rallying cry which is why it's still on washington dc license plates which is also washington dc being really passive aggressive yeah a lot of there a, a lot of for and a lot of supporters of the, of the our ex president <laughs> yeah um so then we get to the preamble which is the part that people actually know the, the one people can re almost recite recite by yeah. memory at this point yep we hold these truths to be self-evident which is you know you don't need to prove this this is itself it's something that proves itself just when you say it that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness not happiness you're not entitled to that but you're entitled to do what you want within reason if that makes you happy that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness you, you know you get a government but if the government isn't doing what it should to make sure that you can have life liberty pursuit of happiness you can either change the government or start over the change part is built right in from the beginning um there are a lot of people who need to recognize that some of them may be on our supreme court um prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons or causes and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while eves are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing forms to which they are accustomed it's easier to go along with things than to change them yeah which yeah that's a that's a pretty accurate summation of the human experience right there but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security like when you've had enough it is your obligation to fix it and to make it right and they had enough at this point and they had had enough at this point um you know and yeah there's some skillful propaganda involved in getting to them getting them to the point where they'd had enough um a deep dive into the boston massacre is fascinating stuff because it is it did not happen the way most americans think it did the boston tea party didn't happen the way most americans thought it did yeah i learned a lot of stuff like like we you know like like 
I think John Adams defended the, the, yeah. the shooters. John Adams defended the soldiers in court in part because he believed that everyone was entitled to a defense, but also because they were provoked. Nobody knew who ordered to order them to fire and they were scared as hell. And he got them off too. A jury of Americans because the trial was in Boston. A jury of Americans found the soldiers not guilty. So, you know, there was propaganda involved in getting the, the colonies to the revolution point, but they were also being oppressed. So it is what it is. And we get the Bill of Grievances, which gives you a really interesting insight into 18th century Americas. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And then the wording there is important because they are not saying this is for the king. This is for parliament. They're saying this is for everyone. We are showing this to everyone. Because it is no longer just between us and the king, us and parliament. We want the world's opinion on what we're doing. In part because, frankly, we would not have won the Revolutionary War without a strong ally. Uh, uh, talking about the French? The French. We would not have won between the French and... Um, Van Steuben, who came from Germany and actually got the the con the colonial army on something of a uh, professional basis, and you know a handful of other Europeans, we would have lost. Yeah, I, I hope they turn out okay. I don't know what happened to the French after after the revolution over here a few years later. I, 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 well, I you know they. <laughs> spent a lot of money on our revolution and decided that the way to get it was not by taxing people who had money, but by taxing the poor people. Well, it's funny. The the seven years slash French Indian War led to the American Revolution. The American Revolution led to the French, Re French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Which then led to the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. Wars are just a series, a never-ending series of dominoes. But uh, yeah, the, the whole thing about how, uh, you know, they tax the poor instead of the rich gives some of us a something, something, condemned to repeat it, something, something kind of feeling. Um, he has refused his assent to laws, the whole, most wholesome and necessary for the public good, which was, he wasn't, they felt he wasn't doing his job. You know, he wasn't when they passed laws, he wasn't allowing them to be enforced without, you know, Parliament deciding that they were a good idea. The colonies couldn't govern themselves. He has forbidden, see, here we go. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation until his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. So if, let's say, New Hampshire passes a law in their own government, in the colony, saying, you know, um, um, public houses have to require employees to wash their hands. Which they wouldn't have, but it's a fairly benign law. Um, you know, the benefits of hand washing weren't known yet. But let's say that they had somehow decided to pass that law. That law could not go into effect 
unless George the Third approved it. And he wasn't doing that. They'd send it back to England and their things would stay. Of course, at, the, at this of course, at, I don't know, at this point, the king don't even have any power at this point. It was, oh, it was the, it's the... complicated. He didn't have as much power as his ancestors had had. Um before Charles the First, who it's worth noting, yes, the current British royal family is German, but yes, they are also descended from Charles the First oh. through his second son James. Yeah, yeah, I still found the tree thing about about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, of course, of course, technically, uh, the current royal family is also descended from Charles the Charles the First is father james the first yes yes they are descended from from james um james charles the first and then james the second why met on the other side james's daughter granddaughter was... oh yes 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 um and then uh if william takes the throne um, he's actually descended from Charles II, which no monarch of England ever has been, because Charles had no legitimate children. Through, through his mom? Through his mom. His mom is descended from, I think, two of Charles's illegitimate children. Yeah, so this, this Stuart family makes his return to Britain after, mm -hmm. after, they, after they're like, you're, you're too Catholic. <laughs> Let's go over, yeah. over, over the German... And yeah, they're German, well, but they're Protestant, so they're kings now. Camilla is descended from a different one of the illegitimate children. He had a lot of illegitimate children. Historically, I don't tend to put the blame for queens when they don't have children, except in the case of Charles II's wife. It is quite clear that he was capable of having children. To bad none of them was with his wife. Yeah, well. Um, so, you know, they would be passing these laws and they would just sit there and nothing would happen. And so George didn't have as much power as James had had, as Charles the first had tried to have yeah. because of the whole parliament, Oliver Cromwell beheading thing. Yeah. After that. And, the, and then the combining Scotland and Brit, Brit Scotland and England and the Brit yeah. Britain. Yeah, but um, George still had more power than Victoria would. The power of the throne was very much in flux at this point. Um, and at the very least, he was still in control of the colonies. That was in his direct authority. He had to put his signature on these laws, and he wasn't doing it. Um, he has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right to rep of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. Uh, as I recall, they wanted more territories. They wanted to establish more territories, more colonies. West of the Appalachians. Yes, but George wouldn't allow colonies that didn't have in their charters that they were subservient to parliament and to the king so he would not allow them to be self-governing yeah I, th I think the pl plan was if, if, even after that first was this th send this go this make the state go western like then virginia or carolinas or whatever yeah. to the west officially the um the borders of a lot of the early colonies extend to the Pacific Ocean, according to their charters. In practical terms, no, they didn't. Yeah. So, so, oh, I, so right now I live in Ohio, so technically I live in Pennsylvania, second edition. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly where Olympia would be under those rules because I'd have to I'd have to look at a map and draw lines and things, 
but uh, yeah, technically, I'm in one of the original 13 colonies, too. Um, by their original charters. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. So the governor would be able to, you know, the governor of um, Virginia would be able to say, okay, well, we're having, uh, we're having our, our meeting uh, this place now. Or, you know, the governor of New York could say, you know, I think the state capitol was actually in New York City at the time, and would be able to say, well, we're going to have it in uh, Niagara Falls this this week. Of course. Because I felt like it. Of course, at this point, too, uh, we, we weren't technically a country yet. We were, we were still yeah. s- several colonies or states working together. Yeah. Well, working at not quite completely cross purposes a fair amount of the time let's be real and we'll talk, we'll talk about that more in our, in our next episode in a month or two yeah um he has dissolved representative houses repeatedly proposing with manly firmness of his invasions on the rights of the people i love the phrasing on this one i really the manly firmness um which is basically he'd dissolve if he was mad at the Virginia House of Commons, he would dissolve it and say, yeah, you you don't exist anymore because you've made me mad. He has refused for a long time after dissolution, such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within with no government you know they if they were invaded by the french the spanish native americans trying to get their land back whoever um or if there were let's be real he's probably talking about slave revolts though revolts of white people were not unheard of either there was nothing the state could do about that the colony could do about that um after its legislature had been dissolved he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for for naturalization of foreigners refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands um it was it was immigration issues um he could say no you can't have german people more americans are descended from germans than any other european ethnicity um no no spanish people no french people let's not even talk of people from places other than that and you know oh you want to have the the you know the polish encourage their people who are looking for farms to come and farm in your state yeah you can't do that so he was you know let's go with instead of blaming george personally the british uh government was deliberately keeping the population of the colonies low as best they could to prevent the colonies from having the power to do anything about it. Yeah, well, I guess to to, to British commoners were just foreign Americans. Whatever. Yeah, well, <laughs> I do have some British blood, but I also have a lot from a lot of other places found out recently my great grandmother was slovakian nice. well, I, 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 yeah i don't know about my blood but my i have my adoptive family was scottish yeah well my great grandmother was born in the austro-hungarian empire so i knew as a kid she was born in czechoslovakia and then that country stopped existing too yeah so. as far as you know as i, I doubt as far as i know my one of my my my, my adopted answers might be one of the one, one of the uh 
illegitimate kids of Charles the First. I mean, really, who among us is not descended from an illegitimate child of Charles the Second? And the answer is the current royal family. Like Charles the Third is not descended. But um, let's see. Uh, he has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing ju judiciary powers. They couldn't have new judges. When they wanted a new courthouse in a new town, that had to go through the British government. And they weren't being allowed to do that. And, and it's not like this time they get called the phone and ask permission. They, 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 okay, write a, write a letter, send the ship there. Send the ship there. Get, 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 wait. Wait for that and then send the ship back and then yes or no. And a lot of the time, it was literally just wait because they didn't do anything either way. You'd wait three years and get an answer of no. So then you'd have to go through the whole process all over again. Like, these are legitimate grievances, a lot of these. I, You know, I, I tease. But a lot of what's going on, in part because of the communication issues, is just not tenable. It is not possible to run a country, you know, to run any area without being able to set your own judges. Which is the next one we get to. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. The British government in London is appointing judges and setting their salaries. And I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that very few people in London knew what the cost of living was in Charleston, South Carolina at the time. So was the judge being paid enough? Was he being paid too much? Nobody in authority to set the, the, the cost of, you know, the salary had any idea. It was a real problem. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Tax collectors. Um, there were a lot of civil servants who were controlling aspects of American life while they couldn't get the things they did want help with dealt with. Is they that, were getting civil servants. Is that where we get the tar and feather thing? Yeah, mm. well. Um, he has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. No quartering soldiers. And in many ways, they were being treated like an occupied territory. And well, before they were like, we're British citizens too. Yeah. Um, there's a line in 1776 that I'm pretty, a lot of the lines in 1776 are accurate, but not all of them. And so it's like, well, somebody says it, but I don't remember if this is one of the real ones or not. But um, uh, Franklin is, is asked if he, what's the problem with being given the honor of being called an Englishman? And he says it's like an ox being called a bull. He appreciates the honor, but he'd rather have the entitlements. Um, because, of course, oxen are castrated. Um, he is affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. Um, the fact that the Boston Massacre is the only time I know of where American soldiers were tried, where, where British soldiers were tried for crimes against American citizens, you know, the, the military was in charge. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws giving him his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Um, I believe this is the one that refers to the Scottish mercenaries. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. 
for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. Because, you know, I talk about how the Boston Massacre didn't happen the way people think it did, and, and those people were provoked, and, and so on and so on. But that doesn't mean there weren't real instances of soldiers killing American citizens in yeah. what was... That was the most public part of it. Yeah. And a lot of the other ones were not provoked and were not the same kind of situation at all. And a lot of other soldiers didn't suffer anything for it because George didn't make them. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. The Americans were only supposed to trade with the British. By British law, the colonies could only trade with the British. And here was another fact about that. They weren't supposed to be manufacturers themselves. They were supposed to create raw materials, which would then be sent to England, where English factories would produce goods, which would then be sent back to the Americas to be sold. Yeah, you, 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 got your, you have your, your cotton shirt in a, in a, in a year or two. <laughs> yeah, with, you know, a lot of the price of it going to line the pockets of English factory owners. Because the finished shirt is going to cost you more than the raw cotton cost the British. Because you can't even make the yarn. You have to send it back as cotton. So a British factory is going to make the yarn. And then a British factory is going to make the yarn into cloth. And then a British factory is going to make the cloth into a shirt. And all three of those factories are going to take their cut. And you're going to pay them for the privilege of having waited two years. Oh, the, 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 the dying. The dying yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. The dying, shirt. too. Let's not forget them. So four British factories. Yeah. And you can't go to a French company that But but but, but don't worry, uh, they're going they're going to use that money th that the British will use that money to go down to Africa to get more slaves for you. Mhm. Mm yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's another one where it's like, yeah, when you listen to what their actual grievances are, some of them are seriously legitimate. Um for imposing taxes on us without our consent. And whether or not they paid the taxes, it is true that they didn't have any say in them. For depriving us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury. And this leads to one of the... One of the uh, 1776 is a very funny musical, but to me one of the funniest moments is when they are picking the first draft of the Declaration to bits. And one of the guys says that in his colony, they've never been deprived of trial by jury. And in, and John Adams is like, well, in Massachusetts, we have. And he says, well, can we just add in many cases? And one of the other members of the Congress just is like, you're going to tell your grandchildren that you've got that phrase put in there, aren't you? <laughs> you must be so proud. But it is, you know, there were people who were just thrown in trial or thrown in jail because, you know, as I said, when we covered the, the amendments, when you look at the Bill of Rights, you can see what the big issues under the English were. And a lot of them deal with courts. Because the, col the, the colonies were not protected in the courts the way they felt they should be. For transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. This is why you have to be tried in the place where the crime took place in the U.S., unless you go through a lengthy process. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing, I think this is Canada, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. Back when we thought Canada or Quebec, whatever it was, might be the 14th yeah. colony. 
Yeah. They were like, yep, they're they're just trying to make Canada into what they want us to be. And and we you can't fool us about Canada. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. So during the reign of Charles II, obviously we're going back a bit for this one. Um they asked to have the original charter sent back so that the king could review it. And the people in, in Massachusetts were like, you can't fool us. <laughs> like, no, I don't think we'll be doing that. And they were like, uh, we lost it. And it's still in, it's still in Boston. But they, the crown was repealing charters and replacing them when there were terms in the charter that they didn't like. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. Again, just, you can't have your government, we're in charge now. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his pr protection and waging war against us. Like I said, the war was already going at this point. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Yeah. You know, they were at war. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries, that's the Scots and some Germans, to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. That is, to put it charitably, an exaggeration of how the war was going at the time. But it is true that, you know, they hired mer mercenaries. And that, uh, you know, a state of war did exist. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. Um, if, you, if your ship was stopped by a British naval vessel and the British naval vessel needed people, they had the legal right to take anyone they wanted off that ship. And you were in the Navy now. And because they didn't consider the Americas to not be British, that included Americans. It's actually one of the causes of the War of 1812, is they were still doing that in 1812. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. And if you read the history of the colonies, calling the, the natives in, uh, merciless savages is a take. In every state of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. And there it is. Like, look, here's a list of complaints we have. Some of them are exaggerated, but a lot of them are real grievances that you can document through history. Like, yes, th this refers to this thing, this refers, you know, what have you. And um, we don't have any other way of making our case known except by revolution. So here we are, which then goes to the failed warnings. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. 
We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice mm -hmm. and of consanguinity, consanguinity, excuse me, which is basically parliament isn't listening to us either. And that was also true. You there? Yeah. Okay. So then denunciation. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. Like, you know, if anybody else tried to pull this crap, we would be their enemy too. Since it's you, that doesn't change anything. Hmm. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, the first ter time that term was ever used, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world, which is, you know, let's talk about God again, for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and the state of great britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war conclude peace contract alliances establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes and our sacred honor and then the signatures and then the signatures and i have to tell you i get chills reading the conclusion real fast uh hmm. and there's something We'll be back in the next episode, but like, I like how they said the states, not the country, the states. Yeah, the states. The thing is, they all knew they couldn't survive alone. If they had tried to establish 13 individual countries, They'd have been snapped up by France and Spain and whoever all within 10 years. They needed each other. And so they are states. They are connected. But at this point, they, they don't want to have too much together power. Just we yeah. work together, but we're still our own thing. Yeah, they're, they're doing what in, in early childhood education is referred to as parallel play. They're not playing together. They're playing next to each other in a social kind of way. But we'll talk more about that in our next episode. Yes. So, and there it is. Uh, and I, I heard... Uh, I don't know if it's myths, if it's a myth or not, or, or rumors. You know that that once these people signed this stuff, they they, knew they had to win or else because their names were on the document. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of the quotes is, uh, "If we do not hang together, we will surely all hang separately." Um, and again, this is another 1776 one, which is you know they're all standing around making all of these jokes about things, and one of them is saying that. Uh, you know, he's so fat that he'll drop right away, but this other guy is so skinny that he'll be dancing long after the other guy is gone. <laughs> and John Hancock, and this one is definitely from the musical and not from reality because we know how long the signatory process took. But um, John Hancock was like, this is all very funny, guys, but if the Redcoats burst in here right now, my name is still the only one on the damn thing. <laughs> You know, like, this was the, the term, you know, stemming from Julius Caesar's, this is the crossing of the Rubicon. 
this is the minute where you win or you die. These are the choices these men had. And, you know, fortunately for them, they won. But, you know, there's this belief that their lives were all devastated by the signing. And that is just ridiculously untrue, leaving aside that there were two presidents in the room. You know, a lot of these people went on to very long, very healthy careers. Yeah, true. But still, at this point, they had it was it was it was all or nothing. Yeah, but if if they had lost, uh, yeah, they would have been screwed. You know, instead of the ones who died, it's like, well, yeah, Caesar Rodney was already dying. So <laughs> the fact that he died a few years later was because he had cancer had nothing to do with the British, you know, and the fact that Samuel Adams, I'm pretty sure died a pauper has to do with the fact that Samuel Adams was a terrible businessman. He was one of the ones who made a living smuggling. Yeah. You know, but this was it for them. This was the moment. The minute they put their name on that, on that document, they have to, they have to win because where else are they going to go? No other European nation dared take them in. Even France could not have taken them in. Because that would have meant war. And France was able to support the Americas. But it was never an actual declared war with England. And if they had taken in the revolutionary leaders, that would have been an act of war. So... The do or die at this point. You know, it's another one where I can mock them a lot. But the act of signing that document was one of incredible bravery. And a lot of them did go on to become soldiers or to hold um, positions of authority in, in the various colonial governments during the war a lot of them were governors or members of congress or what have you throughout the revolution um you know the ones from new york there was this whole thing where new york spent most of the war in british hands so they're not just their lives but their families' lives were in danger and they still did it and they still did it because they believed it was the right thing to do so yeah, they were elites, and yeah, a lot of them were slave owners and what have you. But there is something admirable about all of these men. Yep. So, overall, what's your opinion on this document? For one thing, it's just beautifully written. You know, there's a reason they picked Jefferson to write it. And not just the political reason, though God knows the political reason was was important. But it's because, say what you want about the man, and I could, but my gods, he could write. Um, it does, in its finished condition, show a few signs of having been edited by committee. But... It is also an extremely well-crafted five-paragraph essay. Which is the convincing form of essay that you're taught to write in high school. You say what you're going to say. You say what you're saying. You say what you said. We have been wronged. Here is how we have been wronged. We have been wronged. And we're going to do something about it. You know... Did it convince anyone outside the Americas? Did it convince anyone outside that room that the Declaration, you know, that, that independence was a moral right for the Americas? I don't know. Yeah, like, like you said, the Americans, most of them are like, okay, go ahead, we're, we're new, new, new leaders, whatever. Yeah. And, they, it, and, and then, then the European was like, oh, so we, we may or may not have no, no trade partner in, in a few years. Yeah. 
a lot of parliament disliked the Americans in, uh, intensely on every level. And there were some whose feeling on the subject was good riddance. And yeah. most of them was let's kill all the traitors. Yeah. And there were a few who'd been on the side of independence from the beginning. Yeah, so I, I get, yeah. oh, I, I, I get, I get, I get, not a joke, but really, really, your countries were like, oh, so we can trade directly with America now and get their, it's in grand, they're going through Britain mm -hmm. to get their, get, their, get their stuff. We can... Yeah, exactly. Like, we don't have to go through smugglers anymore. We can legal, you know, no hiding in dark coves off the coast of, of, uh, you know, off the coast of New Jersey. We can just go into the port of New York. And that was quite the selling point, honestly. Um, it did not take very long at all for European powers to start recognizing the Americas when they realized what a force for trade the Americas were going to be. Um, you know, he has a thing about, the, about North America in general in the United States. And what even just what it held at the time in particular is it's big. Even, there even, are, yeah, even when it was just the 13, the 13, it's still. There are more than a few individual colonies that are bigger than a fair few European countries. You know, I, yeah. I would have to compare maps. But you look, I mean, sure, you get like Andorra and whatever, but this is also <laughs> the days. This, sorry. But this is also the days before United, a United Italy and a United Germany. So you get all those yeah. little tiny pocket sized countries all yeah, over we, Europe. At this point, we still have the the, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, mm -hmm. the papal Germany states. The thing. Yeah, like Poland, 15 Poland, different German countries. Poland may or may not be a thing at this point. Who yeah. even knows with Poland? <laughs> yeah, you know, and and so there's a lot of like, this is a lot of land with a lot of resources, and even at the time it was mostly agrarian, and but now that's we, a lot now, of farmland. And now you don't have to go. We don't have to go through the British, <laughs> right? Exactly. And the British were adding tariffs when they were selling American goods on to other countries, which also the Americans weren't seeing any of. So. Yeah, this was a very good financial windfall for a lot of European countries. So nobody was exactly going to leap to the British defense, even though in the long run, um, you know, revolutions are inspired by previous revolutions. Yeah. So now we get to the, the more modern thing of this, where some people still y use this for their problems today mm -hmm. so the first thing it's worth noting is the declaration of independence has absolutely no force of law in the united states whatsoever this is not a law we quote it a lot and there are some parts of it that are our core national philosophy the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is, I would argue, a much stronger core national ideal than e pluribus unum is. Um, but the idea that when you have a problem you write it down and present it to people is i think a much more powerful one than than people realize um what occurred to me a few years ago is that the fourth of july is a holiday celebrating politicians we don't think of it that way but it is the fourth of july is about people in a room trying to negotiate and it is our most sacred national holiday yeah it's another case of our not living up to our ideals but what do you do i just i just i just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just 
I suppose I got holiday pay for when I had to work that work 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 then. <laughs> yeah, I think I got holiday pay for it once. But uh, also, Americans don't get holiday pay. So, yeah. Um, Lisa, I'm lucky I get Christmas off sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but that's a different topic. <laughs> yes. Trying to explain all of this on a 4th of July weekend, actually, to my partner's sister's Swedish in-laws was Ooh. a lot of fun. Now you can just show them this video. Right, exactly. Um, but I, I feel like, even though it doesn't have any force whatsoever in law, it does have force in what we believe about ourselves. We believe that we are the kind of people who produce documents like this when we need them, with basically no notice. We are the kind of people who can list in very clear terms what our problems are. We are the kind of people who can write beautiful, beautiful language about how much we hate tyrants. And yeah, we are going for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as the thing that is most important to us. And there are, of course, all those other people who, what they get out of it is, um, so we should be able to overthrow the government anytime we don't like who got voted in. What's, that, what's, that, what's, what's what they try to do in the, the 1860s? Yeah, well, not just the 1860s. Well, that's the, well, like I said, that's what... The... Yeah, but that was, that was the thing, was they felt in 1860 that... Um, because the majority of the population was in the North, that the North was a new tyranny, and they ignored the part about how they did still have elected representation of their own. It was just that they were a minority, and sometimes you're in the minority and you don't get what you want. And that's a life lesson that your parents should have taught you. Yes, yeah, like I said, I'm like, I'm like, Unlike British back then, they had like you said they had they had representation. They 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 were just being slowly slowly out outnumbered. I guess outvoted. Yeah. So, you know, it, you, you're being outvoted doesn't mean you don't have representation. And and even then, like I said, like, 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 the other thing is, that at, at first they weren't even trying to eliminate slavery; it was just contain like, like contain yeah. it. Nobody, even in 1860. You know, um, Lincoln was an abolitionist, but Lincoln was not saying, I am going to eliminate slavery. They just assumed that that was the natural um, goal of any abolitionist president. He was like, uh, I don't think I have the power to do that. Oh, you're giving it to me. Okay. It's like, because they, like, they, 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 you know, once, if they can't expand it anymore, eventually it would choke yeah. out. Like, like I, I heard things like, like it might have been dead already for the cotton gin. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. The the kind of cotton that grew well in the Americas um is very sticky and holds on to the seed very tightly and took an enormous amount of manpower to seed before the cotton gin was developed. Yeah, most of the money crop was the tobacco. I think tobacco, um, indigo, actually. Uh, which is the dye that uh, blue jeans used. The the blue that jeans are dyed is indigo, which is a plant native, I think, to India that was grown in the South. Um, some sugar cane, rice. Actually, a lot of slaves were from rice-growing parts of Africa and were imported specifically for their rice-growing abilities. So, yeah. But cotton wasn't a cash crop until the cotton gin. So, yeah, the, the idea that cotton would come along and extend slavery is kind of what created the Civil War as much as anything else did. But, you know, any time somebody gets angry at the government, this document gets hauled out. Rightly or wrongly. Yeah. 
And honestly, I agree with the passive aggressive statement on the Washington DC license plate. Because if you look at the state of Washington, you know, the, the situation, let's let's be clear on our terms here, the situation in Washington, DC, they are under a lot of the rules of the colonies at the time. So are the United States territories. Like Puerto Rico. Which, like Puerto Rico, but the Virgin Islands, right. Guam, the Mariana Islands. The United States has a lot of territories that never get brought up. And well, I think it's probably because at, the, at this point, more the most of the talking is that, is that Puerto Rico and, and, and Washington, D.C. are becoming states at this point. Well, yeah, yeah Washington, uh, Washington D.C. and Puerto Rico have the advantage of being close. And most of our other territories are somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. And small. Like, like Hawaii was for a long time. Like Hawaii was for a long time. And there are a lot of Native Hawaiians who do not accept statehood because their consent was not asked. Which I is why I... things are so complicated in Puerto Rico right now, because they don't want to repeat of that. But I think it's funny. You know, some some people don't they don't even consider it Puerto, even though they, they, they think right to do. They're still technically they're still American citizens. People, some people don't even recognize that. Like yeah, where are we getting money to Puerto Rico for the the hurricane? They're not Americans. I'm like yes, they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, West Side Story. You know, Puerto Rico's in America. Um, my my dad's sister married into a massive Puerto Rican family. And he, my my uncle was one of something like ten kids, and my aunt had four kids, and I think it's one of the smaller families of that generation. Huge, huge family, and they were all born United States citizens. Two of my cousins married women from Puerto Rico. Their wives United States citizens before they got married. Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but they don't have the same ability to set their own laws as the rest of the united states they don't have the same say in federal laws as the rest of the united states they can't vote for president they can't vote for president they don't control what what military forces are there and they have you know, no all... their, their, their representation they, they make they can send people yeah. which like like hi can you do this like like no okay yeah but they're like like suggestions <laughs> and i mean not to get super political, but how much did the failures of the United States government to take action after, what was it, Hurricane Maria? How much does that resemble the complaints about, you know, he has refused his assent to laws and things of those lines? Like, Puerto Rico's got a lot of the same legitimate grievances as the colonies did. So, yeah. Um, I'm sure so do a lot of the other territories. I don't know them as well, in part because I don't have family there. But, you know, Guam and, and the Marianas and so forth probably also have a lot of these same problems where they're not getting the attention from the U.S. government that they should and that, according to the Declaration of Independence, is their natural right. Like, 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 like you said, legitimate complaints, not... Yeah. Not, well, we don't pay taxes anyway, but you're making us pay taxes kind of thing. But the yeah. legitimate, like... You know, like, we don't get to set our own judges, kind of thing. Yeah, well, like, not, you know, it's not like, uh, like I said, I don't like, I don't like the, the, the president, so I'm going to storm the Capitol building. <laughs> right. Like, you know, you don't let us run our own state legislature. Um, you don't let us appoint our own judges you don't let us have any say in the house of government where our laws are passed like those are legitimate grievances and the u.s territories have those same legitimate grievances that our country talked about you know 
I was actually born in 1976, so literally 200 years before I was born. Were you born near the, before or after the 4th? After. December. But it still makes it really, really easy for me to do the math. It's like, oh, well, we're after, you know, the 4th, but before my birthday. So on my next birthday, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 247 years ago, which is why I died a little inside when Dapper referred to something the other day as having been uh, nearly half a century old. And it was from the year after I was born. Yeah, I, I, I was talking, like I said, when I was talking in their chat, you know, about how the, the 70s show is now an old, old, considered an old show now. I'm like, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, yeah. So Danny Masterson was born in the 70s, was on that 70s show, and will be getting out of prison when he's in his 70s. So, a little sneak peek for our next episode, whenever that may be. Mm -hmm. It happens literally happens right after the almost right after this because the the articles were written while the the war is going on almost. Yes, yes. But, but, but like I said, like I said, that's a story for another time. Mm hmm. So, what do you think you want to do that one? Um, you know, I'm I'm good with next month. I'd have to check my calendar, but I uh, think I'm pretty open on Saturdays next month. Cool. Like I said, thing I've scheduled. For next for October right now is the fourteenth. We're going to be talking about Friday the thirteenth <laughs> series on the fourteenth on October the fourteenth. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, if I if I don't work if I, if I don't work on if I don't work on Fridays, I'm like, why don't we still on Friday the thirteenth? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, and I would have loved to have done this last month too, but the first three weekends in August, I'm in a field in in. These days in Monroe, Washington. So, what? but next week we're we're going to go less historical and more scientifical. We talk about the Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> but th thank you, thanks again for Jillian. Is that your yep. name? Yep. For being on and sharing her historical knowledge with us. Anytime. But until then, we meet again. Never stop learning and throw the hand in this. I'll see you next time. Yep. Bye. Bye. If you just do it, it turn out okay. And welcome to the very first broadcast on my brand new PC. Hopefully, the lagging and stuff is a thing of the past. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. Fingers crossed. Yeah. But today, we are here to talk about the Ark of Confederation and why they failed miserably. The precursor of the Constitution. So do you have a, do you have an idea why they failed? Well, because they weren't really yeah. capable of, of succeeding. They were destined to fail because yeah. it turns out that you can't run a country on them. Yes. Um, it uh, put a whole bunch of responsibility on the federal government and gave it absolutely no authority. And that fight's still going on today, really. We'll talk about that in, in a bit. Yeah. But you, could you have, a, you have an article you can sh screen share? Um, I've got the the Wikipedia up because okay. that's that's the simple way of doing it. All right. Uh, we'll go. Put it up. Yeah, and hold on. Let me actually let me see if they link to the full text because that would be better. Yes, they, they have the original parchment, but I don't want the original parchment. I want something legible. What you can't read something something eighteenth century script. I can, but it's all fading. Uh, there we go. Transcript. Here we go. Okay. So let me share screen. Select. I think we're going to be doing screenception for a second here, but right. bear with me. All right. 
We got it? Yes. All right. Make it a little bigger? Uh, I can try. Uh, view. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, make it a little bit bigger. Goodbye, chat. <laughs> All right, sorry, chat. No chat for no chat script for you. Yeah, that's much better. I can see it now. Okay. All right, so what's the his what's the history of the articles? So at about the same time as the Declaration of Independence, they realized they did need some form of of federal, for lack of a better word, government, because, you know, new country, new government. Um, and within a year, they had hashed this out. Now, they didn't want to give the federal government any more power than the king and parliament had previously had. But as you may recall, one of the issues was that uh, the king and parliament were trying to run the colonies without any real authority or anybody wanting to pay taxes or anything like that. Yep. So it was basically 13 separate groups trying to, um, to control things while at the same time um, not allowing anyone to control them. Yeah, so basically it's 13 separate countries working together. Right. Kind of. right. <laughs> and without anyone else's bad example of doing the same thing, and I think that's a really important aspect, is, you know, you get things like the EU and the UN and so forth, and first off, they're not really controlling countries. But second... Yeah they have seen the Articles of Confederation fail. <laughs> so they know some of the things that you have to step in and say, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it this other way. And so each state wanted their own, had all the power and that and they didn't want, they didn't want, to, they didn't want to like answer anybody else. The states didn't necessarily want to control each other. They just didn't want anyone to control them. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you get, you know, the one that was most trigger happy on their veto power was Rhode Island. The smallest state. The smallest one. Because, as we'll get to, every single uh, colony for lack of a better term, they still weren't really states, um, had a full veto over anything that got passed. Yeah. And if, there, if 12 agreed and one didn't, fail. Right. And I went to a liberal hippie college and all student organization decisions were supposed to be reached by consensus. And I am here to tell you, you can hardly figure out what you're going to have for dinner if everybody has to agree. Much less how you're going to run a country. And uh, this is what this was the government we had during, during the revolution. Yes. Yeah. Um, it lasted about 10 years. The articles were passed in 1777 and were um, going to be overhauled, was the official uh, claim in 1787 when the delegates sat down for what would become the Constitutional Convention. Because I mean, they knew that overhauling was not enough. Yeah, I think we might have talked about it. I, we did the constitution thing, but it's like they like they came in like like okay, they looked at it like no, no, this is impossible. No. You can't run a country this way. Yeah. Now, 
a lot of let's let's start with the beginning of this so, so far. Mm -hmm. So we go to all whom these presents shall come. We, the undersigned delegates of the states affixed to our names, send greeting. Which is just such a homey way to begin. I like that. <laughs> Whereas the delegates of the United States of America in Congress assembled did on the 15th day of November in the year of our Lord, 1777, and in the second year of the independence of America, agree to certain articles of confederation and perpetual union. Let's, let's pause here a second. Even with the articles of confederation, they were very clear on, but you don't get to just walk away. All right. It's like... Once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, you're in. The um, United States Confederacy, 90-odd years later, um, would actually include that in their own Articles of Confederation, despite the fact that they were themselves breaking away from the country. It's a whole thing. Um, between the states of New Hampshire, one word, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island. I don't know if these one words are from the original or just how this was transcribed, but it's kind of entertaining. Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, the full name of Rhode Island. Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia in the words following this, Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union between the states of We Just Went Over This Bit. Article 1, the style of this confederacy shall be the United States of America. This is the first time that was officially the name of the country. Um, in 1776, which we have talked about a few times before, they give uh, the custodian of the Congress the line that he doesn't like it as the name of a country. And I kind of agree with him. Because there's no good adjective form. Um, in Spanish, which is the only language other than English which I have any kind of fluency, um, it's Estado Unidencio or something along those lines where you have to say basically United States. -y. Because the only alternative is American, which, um, you know kind of leaves out most of the inhabitants of the continents of North and South America. Yeah. It was not a well-chosen name. We should have picked something else. Uh, Article 2. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. Basically, if the Articles of Confederation don't explicitly say the Congress has that authority, then the state retains that authority. And one of the problems they were already starting to have was that the states were um, enforcing tariffs against one another and joining one another for, we have a free trade pact between, you know, like, New Hampshire and and Massachusetts, but it's against the Carolinas. So they have to pay these tariffs that these other states don't. And it was this whole complicated thing. And that was still perfectly fine under the Articles of Confederation, even though it was already a problem. So, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's not really, so it, 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 like I said before, it, it, it's its own power. Yeah. I don't think there was even a Supreme Court yet. Like, there was no ultimate authority vested in the American government. Speaking of, oh, sorry, yeah. speaking of the Supreme Court, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, okay. the very first, quote, quote, president of, the, of, the, of this Congress was later the first Supreme Court justice. Um, I, he was on the Supreme Court, but yeah. And you get a lot of people like, oh, he was really the first president of the United States. No, he wasn't. Like, like I, said, I said, quote, quote. Congress yeah. president. Yeah, I just want to clarify for, for anyone who's listening. He was absolutely not the first president of the United States because 
basically his job was, and we don't technically have one of these at the moment, he was Speaker of the House. Or a house, you, of, a house of no power at all. Right. Or if you prefer President Pro Tem of the Senate, he, he was in charge of the Congress. Which, which had no power at all. Which had no power at all. He certainly, he was not considered a, um, a spokesman for, um, for the United States as a whole. He didn't have, you know, he wasn't commander in chief of the army. He had nothing except the responsibility for being in charge of Congress. So if anybody ever tries to tell you that we really had all of these presidents before George Washington, they really do not fundamentally understand the government. And it's worth noting that we had something like eight of them in the 10 years that the Articles of Confederation were the authority of the government. Very high turnover rate. And I'm sure part of that was, you know, war. But part of it was also, it was just a thankless job. Uh, Article 3, the said states hereby severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defense, the security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare, binding themselves to assist each other against all force offered to or attacks made upon them or any of them on account of religion, sovereignty, trade, or any other pretense whatsoever. Basically, Okay. We are allies. You attack one of us, you've attacked all of us. It's just one good thing here. Like, Yeah, like, you know, this is basically establishing, yeah, it is all one country. Appearances notwithstanding. Um, and at the time, that was a really important consideration. You know, people do not, I think, fully realize how fragile the United States was in these early years. Like, yeah, we had just beaten the British, but that was by the skin of our teeth and through the aid of the French. And if the French decided to change their minds and go after us, I mean, who was going to help us? The English? You know, we were basically surrounded on all sides, well, except West, but yeah, no, by united forces considerably more powerful. In theory, the Louisiana Territory was to our West and owned by the French, but that's, that's a, that theory is doing a lot of work there. In practice, that was still controlled by Native American groups that weren't allied with one another most of the time. But to the south, you have Mexico and Florida and New Orleans and the powers of the Caribbean. And to the east, you've got the Atlantic and all of the European powers across the Atlantic. And to the north, you've got Canada. And it would have been trivially easy for, you know, the Spanish to invade Georgia. And so it was basically saying, yeah, they could do that, and then we will all fight together. And now, that was, in, that was in writing. How was that in practice? So were they, at the time, were they were helping each other? Or were they like, oh, this is my business? Well, in practice, um, most of the struggles were internal. Um, you know, the Spanish didn't try to invade Georgia. Um, there were a couple of rebellions that were actually part of what led to the need for the, con the Constitution. Uh, the most famous being Shays' Rebellion. And basically the consensus of the states was it doesn't count we don't have to help you with your internal stuff just the external stuff like if, if someone else was made if, like like if england came over france came over and yeah we're on your side but yeah this is this is this is a massachusetts problem yeah exactly so in practice it didn't really come up much and the, and the Shay Rebellion, that's one of the issues that came up with this because they, they had no power to stop the, 
Yeah. They, 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 they had no power to stop the rebellion. Nobody could nobody could go in and say, you know, hey, uh, we, we're kind of trying to have a country here. Because in practical terms, they weren't. In practical terms, they were trying to remain states. 13 countries in a trench coat. Um, Article 4, which is a long one, so we'll, we'll do it in chunks, I think, is the best way to do this. The better to secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse, in the old-fashioned sense, among the people of the different states in this union, the free inhabitants, emphasis on free, of these states, paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, which kind of makes me think these rights did not necessarily apply to, you know, me? Because I think I would have counted as a pauper. Um, so, so, like, basically, like, like, like for the voting rights, which is for rich, rich, land, yeah, well, this white, is Landoni right, whites. This is basically, you know, if you aren't in power enough to have a say in Congress, these rights don't necessarily apply to you. It wasn't necessarily about being rich, but definitely landowners and, and what have you. Um, you know, as a, well, I mean, as a woman, they definitely didn't apply to me, but as a poor person relying on a government handout, essentially, um, I probably wouldn't be considered to have a lot of these rights. Hold on a sec, yes, dear? Not right now, okay? Not right now. Sorry, my daughter wanted to ask me a question. Um, shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of free citizens in the several states. Basically, you have rights in one state, you've got rights in all of them. And the people of each state shall have free ingress and regress to and from any other state. You are allowed to go back and forth between the states without needing passports and what have you. The pauper thing makes me wonder if I would be allowed to visit my mother in Oregon if we were still under the Articles of Confederation. Um, and shall enjoy therein all the privileges of trade and commerce, subject oh, so to wait, so, so wait a minute, you, so you, you need a passport to go from state to state, basically? I mean, basically this is saying you don't need a passport to go from okay. state to state. Yeah, like we're all one unit, like the EU, you know, you don't need a passport to go between EU countries. You have the right of free travel from, you know, France to Germany. Um, it was the same basic principle here. Um, but what, what you say, you can't go to Oregon then? Well, I'm, I'm saying, you know, because this doesn't apply to paupers, doesn't okay. apply to poppers. Oh, so, so, so only right. landowners, landowners could go from state to state, no problem. But 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 the, us us poor or poor people were like they they had a little bit more trouble being going from Massachusetts to New York or something. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how much they enforce the poppers need. You know, poppers don't get these rights. Uh, for one thing, traveling between a lot of the states would have been fairly expensive at the time. And slow because the fastest thing is horses. Right. Like traveling, you know, around New England is one thing because a lot of those states are smaller, but traveling in the South would have been a very long, very slow, very expensive process. And this is this is even pre 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 trains. But yeah, this is pre train. This is before pre consistent stagecoach lines in a lot of places. Like uh most of the most of the paupers would be traveling on, as the saying goes, Shanks's mare, which means on foot. And even traveling from North Carolina to South Carolina on foot, unless you're already right at the border, is going to take you some time. Um, let's see. Uh, and shall enjoy therein all the privileges of trade and commerce, because that was a, a, a you know. While the one of the big struggles in the early days of the country was not technically between 
slave owner and non-slave owner, though in practice there was a lot of overlap, it was really between um, town and country, you know, between farmers and city people, manufacturing and, and trade. But they were definitely enshrining trade in the Articles of Confederation because it was really important. And they knew that even if they were all snobbish about it. Uh, subject to the same duties, impositions, and restrictions as the inhabitants thereof, respectively. Basically, um, you got to follow the law of Pennsylvania, even if you're from Virginia. Um, if you're in Pennsylvania. Uh, provided that such restrictions shall not extend so far as to prevent the removal of property imported into any state to any other state of which the owner is an inhabitant, which I suspect is basically saying um, you can't force someone to free their slaves just because they've moved to a different state. Like, that's me reading between lines, but it does not strike me as an unreasonable reading between lines. Because anytime they're really clear about things like removal of property, that's usually a euphemism for slaves. Uh, provided also that no imposition, duties, or restrictions shall be laid by any state on the property of the United States or either of them. Um, Basically, that's a tax thing again. Um, you can't tax people uh, who are just visiting your state, really. Um, you know, you can't uh, make the, the taxes of your state apply to people from other states. And you can't take away their slaves. And those are the two things that were very, very important to a lot of the people in charge of writing these documents. Oh. Um, if any person guilty of or charged with treason, felony, or other high misdemeanor in any state shall flee from justice and be found in any of the United States, you notice that United States is lowercase a lot of the time here. Because they're not really referring to it as a country. Because because we because we because we were like united in the loosest sense of the term. Right, right. What they're saying here is, you know, from one state to a next, not the country, because they didn't really think of it in terms of a country yet. Yeah, didn't they like? Didn't they? It was not where they after Civil War they, they changed the R to is. Yeah, one of the one of the big changes of the Civil War was in grammar. The United States went from being a plural to being a singular after we'd only been a country for, you know, 90 years, give or take. Um, he shall, upon demand of the governor or executive power of the state from which he fled, be delivered up and removed to the state having jurisdiction of his offense. You can't get away from your crimes by crossing state lines. At least, theoretically. In practical terms, it varied a lot based on how much you kept your head down and how famous you were. If I, for example, had robbed somebody and, and fled from, from New York to South Carolina and stayed quiet and didn't do anything and never came to anybody's attention... I probably wouldn't have gotten extradited simply because the logistics of knowing who I was were so complicated. Um, because I was not somebody whose face everyone would have known. If I changed my name, you couldn't even track me by name. It was really easy to escape your crimes by traveling 50 miles in those days. But in theory, if somebody did recognize me and say, hey, you know, that's that's Jillian. She, you know, beat up my mom and took 50 bucks from her. Then, yeah, 
I could be extradited back to where I had done the crime and the state that I was in would be forced to help with that. Um, full faith and credit shall be given in each of these states to the records, acts, and judi judicial proceedings of the courts and magistrates of every other state. So if you're convicted of a crime in one, then that's considered to be valid in others. If you're married in one, your marriage is legal in other states. Um, if you write out your will in one, then your will is considered binding in the other states. Legal documents follow you. And the states have to acknowledge them. Now, what's the what's the magistrate? Magistrate is basically a judge. Okay, so the old term for judge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, from Latin magister, I think it is, which is something along the lines of authority. And it's basically somebody in in power, but in practical terms, it's a judge. Okay. Article 5, which is another long one. Uh, for the more convenient management of the general interests of the United States, which I just love. Yeah, we're just making this convenient. Delegates shall, delegates shall be annually appointed in such manner as the legislature of each state shall direct. So... You know, if you recall from the, the Constitution was very clear on and here's how we're doing this and, you know, how much, uh, how many representatives each state is entitled to and blah, blah, blah. Articles of Confederation is like, yeah, you guys should have a delegation. That's important. To meet in Congress on the first Monday in November in every year with a power reserved to each state to recall its delegates or any of them at any time within the year and to send others in their stead for the remainder of the year. So you have to be at Congress, which met in several places during this time, uh, the first Monday of November. But if the state decides you're not going to stay there, they can call you back and send someone else, you know, if they feel like it. So is it, I'm going to get to that later, but how, how, how many... Uh, is it, is it one per state or was it how it was? How well, it that's the next paragraph because okay. it's, it's wild, this decision. No state shall be represented in Congress by less than two, nor by more than seven members. And no person shall be capable of being delegate for more than three years in any term of six years, nor shall any person being a delegate be capable of holding any office under the United States for which he or another for his benefit receives any salary, fees, or emolument of any kind. So, how big is each state's delegation? Somewhere between two and seven. Who decides that? The state. How? So. Yeah. Uh, how long can you be a delegate? Not more than three years in any term of six years. So they were term limits back then. There were term limits back then, which I have feelings about term limits. Um, I will say that nobody in this system of government could make the government work, so it doesn't really matter that nobody knew what they were doing. But yeah. <laughs> Like, what everybody knew was, this doesn't work. And beyond that, what was there to know? Um, but that may be, this all may be part of why the office of the President of Congress turned over so quickly. Because this is a fairly loony system. And theoretically, the state has just as much power to pull back the President of Congress as anyone else. Which they can do for any reason and uh neither can the delegate receive a salary or anything under the united states but 
another for his benefit probably means your slaves can't work for the government either if they're getting paid or you're getting paid for their work more accurately you can't rent your slaves to the government <laughs> well, if they do anyways like here this slaves could be my representative today no yeah no, uh, let's see. Each state shall maintain its own delegates in a meeting of the states and while they act as members of the committee of the states. Translated, the state has to pay everybody's salaries. They are not receiving a federal salary. Because the federal salary, all the things they have to work, they have to agree on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the state can decide how much people are getting paid if they're getting paid um could decide to make them all volunteers and it's all going to vary from state to state so this is why what washington and his army had trouble getting paid during the revolution because they yeah agree on yeah the 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 continental um army was the big testing point of the Articles of Confederation, because that was something where, I'm not gonna say everyone supported the army, but everybody who supported the idea of the United States as a country supported the army. But no state wanted to be the only one to pay for the army. And the little states wanted the the pay to be divvied up based on population and the big states wanted it to be each state gets a set percentage that they're responsible for congress couldn't tax anybody to raise the money and when the states just didn't pay which was what ended up happening congress couldn't do anything about that <laughs> so in the in the 10 years after the signing of the articles of confederation soldiers basically were getting paid poorly and randomly and that was one of the causes behind chase's rebellion in fact plus i think at this time i might get to it later but i think at this time he said it pretty much had his own currency too yeah yeah um in these days individual banks could have their own currency there was no standardized currency and some places were using um spanish currency and some places were still using british currency and the financial system of the united states and i am not an expert because this is economics and i didn't learn a lot of economics in school for reasons but the economic system of the United States under the Articles of Confederation was what the technical term is a hot mess. Um, and that was one of the handful of things where everybody knew it was going to have to be overhauled if the country was going to continue to exist. And if the country didn't continue to exist, then the colonies were going to get snapped back up by European powers and they all knew it. So the currency had to get fixed. Yes. Um, and then the worst clause in the entire article is right here. In determining questions of the United States in Congress assembled, each state shall have one vote. So, so not only the states have to agree, each each, each individual, each of the four, seven, two to seven delegates have to have to, have to agree for yeah. one vote. Every delegation had to agree to cast its vote, and every state could override any other state's vote by vetoing. <laughs> This is a document that was written to fail. I don't think that's what they were doing when they wrote it. I think they were trying to give people what they wanted, but it turns out what they wanted was bad and they should feel bad. And then kind of at random in this section, 
Freedom of speech and debate in Congress shall not be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Congress, and the members of Congress shall be protected in their persons from arrest and imprisonments during the time of their going to and from and attendance on Congress, except for treason, felony, or breach of the peace. You can't be arrested for murder on your way to Congress. <laughs> Yeah. Are you sure that's not currently a still in process? Uh, you know, <laughs> it only applies to members of Congress. So, and Congress has the power to do something about it if they actually get their act together. So, yeah. So, like, but yeah, like, basically, it's it's the people in Congress are allowed to say whatever the hell they want to and not get arrested for it. And if they are in Congress or on their way to and from Congress, which as established is going to take you a while, you can't arrest them unless they've actively, well, I guess felony would be murder, but you can't arrest them for like jaywalking or whatever. Oh, so they, they will get arrested for murder. I, it looks like, yeah, felony would include murder. Okay, I, I was, I was thought yeah. like, you can murder someone to yeah. Congress? Like, yeah. like, but like, oh, reach of the peace. So you can't be arrested for... I mean, I'd argue you can't be arrested for sedition. Um, but unless, you know, you're actively riling people up at the moment. But yeah, it's basically like, look, you know, people going to and from Congress have to go to and from Congress in order to make this uh, not at all functional government pretend to function. Leave them alone. So, yeah. <laughs> Article 6, which is actually some limitations on states. The, the, wow, the, the, first limita the first state limitations. It's the first state limitations we've gotten to here, and we're on Article 6. No state without the consent of the United States, and notice that United isn't capitalized, but state is, so it's basically saying all of the other states, not the country, in Congress assembled, and Congress also isn't capitalized, um, shall send any assembly any embassy to or receive any embassy from or enter into any conference agreement alliance or treaty with any king prince no comma or state nor shall any person holding any office of profit or trust under the united states or any of them except if any present emolument office or title of any kind from any king prince or foreign state nor shall the united states in congress assembled or any of them grant any title of nobility so that's a lot and it's one sentence so basically what we're looking at here is um no individual state is allowed to negotiate with any foreign power on its own they can only negotiate as a country all right um and no one who works for the United States or for any individual state can accept anything from a king, prince, or foreign state. And the country and the individual states are not allowed to grant titles of nobility. Uh, so, the states get, but all states have, all the states have to have degree on this, whatever they agree. Right, they all had to agree on it. Yeah, yeah. the The articles had to be ratified, and Maryland held out for two years under a procedural detail, but they did agree that yes, this was the the rule that they were all going to accept, and even Maryland eventually joined. Um, so they did all agree that yeah. No title of nobility, no accepting anything from foreign governments. Um, you know, the, the idea of no present got loosened a certain amount because if, you know, Queen Elizabeth II had wanted to give a president a, a, president a birthday present, like, you know, if Charles wanted to give uh, Biden a copy of his crappy book about um, um, 
alternative medicine. <laughs> um, Biden's allowed to accept that. I personally wouldn't, but he's allowed to. Um, but it's basically agreed that if it's anything of value, you know, it's not something that can be accepted under the United States laws. This came up a lot during the previous administration. The emoluments clause. Because I don't know what the previous administration would have had to do with receiving things from foreign governments. <laughs> anyway, no two or more states shall enter into any treaty, confederation, or alliance, whatever, between them without the consent of the United States in Congress assembled, specifying accurately the purposes for which the same is to be entered into and how long it shall continue. No trade pacts between two or more states against the rest of the country. Yeah. So, so like, so Massachusetts and Rhode Island couldn't trade as other not trade with anybody else. Right. Right. Um, you know, if Rhode Island and Connecticut decided that it's the two smallest states that were going to pair together against everybody else and have, you know, tariffs from any other um, state stuff coming into their two states, or they were going to go to war against Massachusetts or whatever, they're not allowed to do that without the um, agreement of all of Congress, which Massachusetts would invariably say no to because, I mean, yes. Um, so in practical terms, this meant that they couldn't uh, enter into treaties and things with one another. No state shall lay any imposts or duties which may interfere with any stipulations and treaties entered into by the United States and Congress assembled with any king, prince, state in pursuance with, of any treaties already proposed by Congress to the courts of France and Spain. So if Georgia decided they were going to nudge over the border a little bit into territories controlled by France or Spain. Uh, they weren't allowed to do that. Because it would get in the way of territories. You know, it would get in the way of the treaties that the U.S. was trying to have so that they could defeat the English, which was still a slightly pressing concern at the time. No vessels of war shall be kept up in time of peace by any state except such number only as shall be deemed necessary by the United States in Congress assembled for the defense of such state or its trade, nor shall any body of forces be kept up by any state in time of peace, found out where all those commas from the last one went, except such number only as, in the judgment of the United States, in Congress assembled, shall be deemed requisite to garrison the forts necessary for the defense of such state. But every state shall always keep up a well-regulated and disciplined militia, sufficiently armed and accoutred, and shall provide and constantly have ready for use in public stores a due number of field pieces and tents, and a proper quantity of arms, ammunition, and camp equipage. This is basically the formation of the National Guard. Was there that they have any power, National Guard? Well, again, it um within their own states. It, well, pretty much like a state militia, almost. A state yeah, militia. It's, it's a state national guard. Yeah. Um, it's saying that you know you could only have the amount of standing army and standing navy that Congress says you can have. Um, but you have to do it. You've got to have a well-regulated and disciplined militia. Um, and you've got to provide for them in case they're needed. Okay. <laughs> um, this would sort of shift into the Second Amendment, but this is, I have to say, much better worded than the Second Amendment. 
Like 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 how? Well, it's it's saying exactly what these people are for, exactly what has to be provided for them, um, and exactly the purpose of the militia. It's not just saying, yeah, you can have guns because militias. It's saying you will have a militia because defense. And the militia is under the, the authority of the state. And also, tents are nice. Second Amendment doesn't mention anything about tents. Yeah, where's the tent? Where's the tent? Where's the tent? Oh, freedom of to set up your own tents? Exactly. No state shall engage in any war without the consent of the United States and Congress assembled, unless such state be actually invaded by enemies, or shall have received certain advice of a resolution being formed by some nation of Indians to invade such state. And the danger is so imminent as to not admit of a delay till the United States and Congress assembled can be consulted. Nor shall any state grant commissions to any ships or vessels of war, nor letters of mark or reprisal, no privateers, except to be after a declaration of war by the United States and Congress assembled, and then only against the kingdom or state and the subjects thereof against which war has been so declared, and under such regulations as shall be established by the United States and Congress assembled, unless such state be infested by pirates in which case vessels of war may be fitted out for that occasion and be kept so long as the danger shall continue or until the United States and Congress assembled shall be or shall determine otherwise which again that's one sentence so 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 like Georgia couldn't go like I'm declaring war on 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 France for right um but they are invaded they could they can, they can yeah if if France had invaded Georgia and they knew there was no time to send news back to Congress and say, hello, <laughs> Frenchmen invading our country, help! You know, um, they could fight back, but they could not launch their own war. Um, of course, then, of course, that's even... The, the, like, so like all, then, then at that point, all the states have to agree to to declare war to right, help which, Georgia. Uh, yeah, so basically, I'd wait until I were being invaded too. Um, I will note that they only have to have received certain advice of a resolution being formed of Native American uprising. Um, which seems kind of um deliberately vague to now me. this is the, the native americans in their own state but not out, out of their state um well it says to invade but okay. i would imagine that uh that's another rule that kind of would get uh ignored in the moment like Again, I thought like uprising to, would be if, uh, if it was uprising it would be in their own borders. Yeah, to my knowledge, this never came up. Well, uprising would be within their own borders, but uh, invasion. You know, I strongly suspect that um, it would be counted as an invasion, even if they were the people who were in that area before colonization. Um. To my knowledge, this never really came up, but I think the intent is pretty clear there. Um, it is interesting to note, letters of mark or reprisal are how you get privateers. Uh, privateer is state-sponsored pirate. There have been any number of very famous ones throughout history. Um, Captain Kidd was for a while a privateer. Um, Sir Francis Drake was a privateer for a while. A lot of privateers. Um, and it was basically a cheaper way of waging naval warfare. Um, you, privateer, that, that's like a, that's a government-sponsored pirate, right? That's a government-sponsored pirate. You give out a letter saying, by the authority vested in me, by, you know, the, the, State of Delaware. Um, 
you have the authority to go and attack the vessels of, at this point, let's be realistic, of the England, in the name of the United States. And then your privateer would get to keep all the money and trade goods and cannon and whatever else it was on the ship that they wanted. And they would be fighting British ships for you. And there were some gray areas because, in theory, your privateers could only attack the ships of the country you were at war with. And once they started attacking, say, French ships instead of just British ones, hi, you've got a pirate on your hands. But, you know, in theory, um, the Articles of Confederation explicitly permit privateers. And if your state is infested by pirates, you can send war vessels after them. But Congress has to agree that you're infested. All of 13, had, all 13 states had to agree. All 13 agree. states have to agree that you're infested by pirates. <laughs> like, they're like, like, Georgia's like, you know what? I don't, I don't believe you are, so no. <laughs> right. And now I'm picturing, like, you know, Pennsylvania being tented for pirates. Uh, Article 7. When land forces are raised by any state for the common defense, all officers of or under the rank of colonel shall be appointed by the legislature of each state respectively by whom such forces shall be raised, or in such manner as such state shall direct, and all vacancies shall be filled up by the state which first made the appointment. Uh, generals are appointed by Congress. Colonel and under are appointed by the states. Which is not the sensible way of doing that. The sensible way of doing that is, you know, by um, actual competency. But political officers were a thing in the United States at least through the Civil War. Article 8. All charges of war and all other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or general war, uh, welfare and allowed by the United States in Congress assembled shall be defrayed out of a common treasury which shall be supplied by the several states in proportion to the value of all land within each state granted to or surveyed for any person as such land and the buildings and improvements thereon shall be estimated according to such mode as the United States in Congress assembled shall from time to time direct and appoint. The taxes for paying that proportion shall be laid and levied by the authority and direction of the legislatures of the several states within the time agreed upon by the United States in Congress assembled. So basically what we've got here is Congress is going to determine how much your state is responsible for paying in taxes for the common defense or general welfare, the state is going to figure out how those taxes get paid. This is clearly a fair and reasonable system that will never go wrong. And if they pay to begin with. If they pay to begin with, which, spoiler, they won't. Article 9. The United States and Congress assembled shall have the sole and exclusive right and power of determining on peace and war, except in the cases mentioned in the sixth article, which is, you know, pirates and, and invasion, of sending and receiving ambassadors, entering into treaties and alliances, providing that no treaty of commerce shall be made, whereby the legislative power of the respective states shall be restrained from imposing such imposts and duties on foreigners as their own people are subjected to, or from prohibiting the exportation or importation of any species or goods or com or species of goods or commodities whatsoever, of establishing rules for deciding in all cases what captures on land or water shall be legal, and in what manners prize is taken by land or naval forces in the service of the United I assume that's supposed to be states shall be divided or appropriated, of granting letters of mark and reprisal in times of peace appointing courts for the trial of piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and establishing courts for receiving and determining 
finally appeals in all cases of captures, provided that no member of Congress shall be appointed a judge of any of the said courts. So the Congress has the ability to declare war and um, sue for peace. Uh, the power of ambassadors, the power of treaties and alliances, um, but no treaty or alliance can screw over the states in the matter of their own commerce. Um, the U.S. decides who gets um, land or ships or what have you captured, um, can appoint uh, privateers during times of peace, and tries pirates and crimes on the high seas. Um, and no member of Congress can be a judge, which seems fair to me. Oh, Christ, I hope this isn't all one sentence. Okay! <laughs> Got to break it up a little bit? <laughs> right. This is a long one, kid. Well, someone needs to go back to grammar school, I guess. The thing is, is... Since we're not using it, the 17th century was much laxer when it came to ideas of maybe sentences should end sometime. Um, as long as you divided up all of your clauses within the sentence, the sentence could go on for days. So let's well, try, try, try your best. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I can get this by clause here because this is a long one. The United States and Congress assembled shall also be the last resort on appeal in all disputes and differences now subsisting or that hereafter may arise between two or more states concerning boundary, jurisdiction, or any other cause, whatever, which authority shall always be exercised in the manner following. Okay, we've got a period. Let's stop here. So Congress settles disputes between the states. Now that's going to get tricky as we will discover in the in the decade following this but um there's a book called how the states got their shapes that talks a lot about these l weird little niggling conflicts mostly caused by bad surveying between the states the mason dixon line was part of this attempt to make the state boundaries make sense and but that was after the that was the 1820s after all this yeah, but that's the thing, is even during this era, Congress had to step in occasionally and go, okay, back up. Because the reason it took Maryland two years to ratify was that Maryland wanted all of the states to agree technically under most state charters, most colonial charters, their land stretched to the Pacific Ocean. Oh yeah, anything past anything past the uh, the uh, Ohio River, anything past the Appalachians is ours. Right. Well, it was anything past the Ohio River was what Maryland wanted the states to cede to the federal government. But yeah, technically, if you look at the original charter of Virginia, Pennsylvania, what have you, you've got these straight lines stretching all the way across the continent. Well, I think at the time it was just to the, at the time it was just to the Mississippi because that's what we got in the war. According to the, the original charters. So we're talking, you know, 1600s here to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this was unenforceable by any conceivable stretch of the imagination. Because technically, anything past, was anything past the Mississippi at this point still either French or Spanish at this time? Yes, it was. Um, yeah. Parts of the West Coast were actually claimed by the Russians. There's a Russian fort in Northern California. I was there as a small child. I don't really remember it. But yeah, so basically this is saying the states have to let Congress be the final authority on borders. And that is, I, I think, part of trying to keep the states from going to war with one another, which did happen a few times over the years. Even though it's explicitly illegal by both the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. Okay, so where's our... There we go. 
Whenever the legislative or executive authority or lawful agent of any state in controversy with another shall present a petition to Congress stating the matter in question and praying for a hearing, notice thereof shall be given by order of Congress to the legislative or executive authority of the other state in controversy and a day assigned for the appearance of the parties by their lawful agents who shall then be directed to appoint by joint consent commissioners or judges to constitute a court for hearing and determining the matter in question. So, so far so good. Um, two states in conflict over a small hunk of land send a petition to Congress, which says, okay, we're going to appoint a commission. You, state A, pick your people. You, state B, pick your people. And then you get together and you both appoint people to make this decision from your state so that you're making the decision together. So far, so good. But, but did, you, that, did that work? <laughs> eh, sometimes. But if they cannot agree, Congress shall name three persons out of each of the United States and which uh, I doubt that's going to be a fair and equitable uh, chance at being one of the three people named, because if they don't know who you are, you're not getting picked. Um, and from the list of such persons, each party shall alternately strike out one, the petitioner's beginning, until the number shall be reduced to 13. And from that number, not less than seven, nor more than nine names, as Congress shall direct, because God forbid we have you know, settled numbers of anything in the Articles of Confederation, um, as Congress shall direct, shall, in the presence of Congress, be drawn out by lot, and the persons whose names shall be so drawn, or any five of them, shall be commissioners or judges to hear and finally determine the controversy, so always as a major part of the judges who shall hear the cause shall agree in the determination. So here's how we're going to decide the judges if y'all can't agree. Um, there will be a number of them. What number that is, we'll figure it out. So uh, wait a minute. So if, if they can't agree, they'll just, but I'm confused. If they can't, if, so they can't agree, they'll make the judges how they get out the power of all 13 states. Okay, so each state will have, where was it? Um, a certain number of people, three people out of each state will have their names put on a list. From that list, whoever brings the complaint gets to strike out one person, and then the people who got the complaint get to strike out another, and so on, until you have somewhere between seven and nine names left. Uh, or no, 13 names left, and then you draw by lot... Uh, somewhere between seven and nine, or maybe just five, um, to finally make the, the decision. And if either party shall neglect to attend at the day appointed, without showing reason which Congress shall judge sufficient, or being present shall refuse to strike, the Congress shall proceed to nominate three persons out of each state, and the Secretary of Congress shall strike in behalf of um, such party absent or refusing, and the judgment and sentence of the court to be appointed in the manner before prescribed shall be final and conclusive. You don't show up, you takes your chances. And if any of the parties shall refuse to submit to the authority of such court, or to appear or defend their claim or cause, the court shall nevertheless proceed to pronounce sentence or judgment, which shall in like manner be final and decisive. The judgment or sentence and other proceedings being in either case transmitted to Congress and lodged among the acts of Congress for the security of the parties concerned, provided that every commissioner before he sits in judgment shall take an oath to be administered by one of the judges of the Supreme or Superior Court of the state where the cause shall be tried, well and truly to hear and determine the matter in question according to the best of his judgment without favor, affection, or hope and reward, Provided also that no state shall be deprived of territory for the benefit of the United States. So Congress can't take it away from both of them. Um, right. You yeah. can't say, well, if, if you can't share, then neither of you get it. Which, you know, as a parent, is a solution I have used a time or two. 
Um, there's this enormously complicated, like, I've read it and I still don't fully understand how they're going to decide if things go wrong. And so, but a decision is going to be made. And... Uh, oh, that, so that's funny you said as a parent. Like, imagine if you know, your kids could override you. <laughs> Man. Like, no, there's, I'm not going to do that, Mom. There's a reason we only had two kids. We don't want them outnumbering us. <laughs> but yeah, it's basically saying, look, um, we're going to make a decision and everybody's going to agree to it. And if you won't show up for it, well, sucks to be you. But... In practice, this may not work the way we say it will, uh, not just because this is needlessly complicated. Um, yeah. Hopefully, this won't come up, I guess? Yeah. All controversies concerning the private right of soil claimed under different grants of two or more states because... some of the original colonial land grants overlapped and part of that was you know surveying in the in the 16th century was not great 17th century and part of it was um you know what grant one king issued was not necessarily worried about by his successors um, whose jurisdictions, as they may respect such lands, and the states which pass such grants are adjusted, the said grants of either of them being at the same time claimed to have originated antecedent to such settlement of jurisdiction, shall, on the petition of either party to the Congress of the United States, be finally determined, as near as may be, in the same manner as is before prescribed for deciding disputes respecting territorial dis jurisdiction between different states. So, if y'all haven't settled your land grant disputes by now, we'll do it the same way as the last paragraph. Don't make us write all that again. Which is fine by me, because don't make me read all that again. The United States in Congress assembled shall also have the sole and exclusive right and power of regulating the alloy and value of coins struck by their own authority. Not that they really had much authority to strike their own coin or by that of the respective states, fixing the standards of weights and measures throughout the United States. They actually did keep these standards of weights and measures. That is one of the few powers given to the government under the Articles of Confederation that remains part of the Articles of Confederation to, or of the United States to this day. Like, you can't ask Congress for a letter of mark anymore, but the United States still does handle its own weights and measures. Uh, regulating the trade and managing all affairs with the Indians, not members of any of the states. So, you know, the states negotiate their own way, but Congress handles treaties with Native Americans. Provided that the legislative right of any state within its own limits be not infringed or violated. So Congress makes sure that the states can do what they want to within their borders. Establishing and regulating post offices from one state to another throughout all the United States and exacting such postage on the papers passing through the same as may be requisite to defray the expenses of the said office. Again, one of the handful of things that was a through line from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. Appointing all officers of the land forces in the service of the United States, excepting regimental officers. Appointing all of the officers of the naval forces and commissioning all officers, whatever, in the service of the United States, making rules for the government and regulation of the said land and naval forces and directing their operations. So in theory, Congress was in charge of the Continental Army. But a lot of the Continental Army was made up of state militias, which didn't owe any allegiance to Congress. So it's all very complicated by the fact that all the states, you know, again, 13 smaller countries in a trench coat. So each state was fighting on their own, but not but together kind of at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this will continue even up through the Civil War. You know, if you study Civil War history, all of the all of the units in the Civil War have things like, you know, the 54th, 54th Massachusetts. So. Any Civil War unit is from a state. 
So even the, even the nor up north, they, they, they were states thing, not the, the, the south thing. Yeah. The north. yeah. Um, and they were all theoretically under control of the United States Army, but they were divided by state. All of the people in your unit were from your state. Most of the people in your unit were from your town. Um, which was devastating for a lot of small towns. Um, so, so did so were all the states fighting separately, or did they all work under Washington? Yes. Um, in theory, Washington was the commander in chief. He had been appointed to that position by Congress. Now, to be strictly fair, part of why it didn't work that way in practice was communication. It was, it's hard enough now being in control of an entire military that stretches an area the size of the 13 colonies. It was flatly impossible in the 1770s and 80s. There was just no way. They didn't, they didn't they could use the satellite to communicate back then? Yeah, you know, Washington's cell phone plan wasn't very good. But it was also the case that some states were provisioning their soldiers better than others. Some of them were paying them differently than others. Some of them were expecting Congress to pay. It was not, you know, um, the closest we got to any kind of organization was actually when uh, Baron von Steuben came in and worked to make the the government professional, which means that um, the professional nature of the original Continental Army was put in place by a gay German aristocrat. So that's fun. And plus the soldiers, if they went to their state, they couldn't use their money, their money in that other state. Right. Um, they would have to exchange money, which was often easier said than done. It was a lot. It was very complicated. It was very hard to maintain. Um, this is a document that is written to fail. Even if that wasn't the actual intent, that was in practice what is going on with the Articles of Confederation. They cannot succeed in successfully running a country. So naturally, the, the uh, Confederate states based their governing model on the Articles of Confederation instead of the Constitution. Because if they had learned anything, they wouldn't have seceded from the United States. Oh boy. Yeah. The United States in Congress assembled shall have authority to appoint a committee to sit in the recess of Congress to be denominated a committee of the states. The number of committees that were a thing at this time. People think that is a modern issue, but no. There's a bit in um, 1776 where um, they're listing all of the committees that existed in Congress at the time, and it is a lot. And there were just not that many guys in Congress. Um, let's see. And to consist of one delegate from each state and to appoint such other committees and civil officers as may be necessary for managing the general affairs of the United States under their direction to appoint one of their number to preside, provided that no person be allowed to serve in the office of president more than one year in any term of three years. So this is, you know, president of Congress here. To ascertain the necessary sums of money to be raised for the service of the United States and to appropriate and apply the same for defraying the public expenses, to borrow money or emit bills on the credit of the United States, which will not be very good credit, transmitting every half year to the respective states an account of the sums of money so borrowed or emitted, to build and equip a navy, to agree upon the number of land forces, and to make requisitions from each state for its quota in proportion to the number of white inhabitants in such state 
which requisition shall be binding. And thereupon the legislature of each state shall appoint the regimental officers, raise the men, and clothe, arm, and equip them in a soldier-like manner at the expense of the United States. And the officers and men so clothed, armed, and equipped shall march to the place appointed and within the time agreed on by the United States in Congress assembled. But if the United States in Congress assembled shall, on consideration of circumstances, judge proper that any state should not raise men or should raise a smaller number than its quota, and that any other state should raise a greater number of men than the quota thereof, such extra number shall be raised, officered, clothed, armed, and equipped in the same number as the quota of such state, unless the legislature of such state shall judge that such extra number cannot be safely spared out of the same, in which case they shall raise, officer, clothe, arm, and equip as many of such extra number as they judge can be safely spared. Uh, and the officers... Hmm? That, was, that was green. Yeah. Huh? What? Um, so what this is saying is here's how we're going to run our army. The, the, the federal army. Quote. The federal army, which we're making up out of bits from the states. And if the states don't think they can raise the number of men that we're asking them to, uh, they'll get close enough. So that's, that's going to go well. And the officers and men so clothed, armed, and equipped shall march to the place appointed and within the time agreed on by the United States and Congress assembled. So Congress is going to set the rules, say how many men they need, how they need to be equipped, and then the states will actually do it if they feel like doing it. And right. it's going to be in proportion to the number of white inhabitants. The word is actually in the text. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fine. So basically, uh, can you translate that a little bit? So basically what it's saying is Congress is going to put together a committee um, in the recess of Congress that figures out how the army is going to be run. So it's not going to be all of Congress. It's just going to be 13 guys. And they are going to run the army. Including trying to get the apportions out of the various states. So these 13 guys, it's their job to try to make the states do anything for the army. Um... They will appoint the officers, except for the regimental officers, which will be appointed by the regiments themselves. Um, the legislature of the state will appoint the regimental officers, raise the men, clothe, arm, and equip them in a soldier-like manner. But at federal expense, except the expense for doing it is going to come from the states. So, I can't explain how that's going to work, because the short answer is it won't. A lot of this is, we know that this has to be centralized in order to work. But we also know that we can't centralize things because it's going to piss everybody off. This is flatly untenable, this whole thing. And I know I keep saying that, but if you if you really listen to some of what's being said here, it's inherently contradictory. It's, oh, you know, the government is going to do these things, but only if the states say it's okay. I'm like, oh, but okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. The United States in Congress assembled shall never engage in a war, nor grant letters of mark and reprisal in time of peace, nor enter into any treaties or alliances, nor coin money, nor regulate the value thereof, nor ascertain the sums and expenses necessary for the defense and welfare of the United States, 
or any of them, nor emit bills, nor borrow money on the credit of the United States, nor appropriate money, nor agree upon a number of vessels of war to be built or purchased, or the number of land forces to be raised, nor appoint a commander of chief of the army or navy, unless nine states assent to the same, nor shall a question on any other point, except for adjourning from day to day, be determined, unless by the vote votes of a majority of the United States in Congress assembled. So they've got to have at least nine people, nine states say yes to doing anything. So, so, oh, so, so this, so this one was in the full thirteen had only nine states at the end of this thing. So, well, so if five states don't have delegations there, nothing gets done. Is what this one is basically saying. They have to have nine yes votes. They have to have a majority of the votes for the other things. But we haven't gotten to the veto part yet. Oh, joy. <laughs> yeah. Um the Congress. So, so, sorry, so so even if even if if nine states agree to it, one other state it vetoed it and still wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Congress of the United States shall have the power to adjourn to any time within the year and to any place within the United States so that no period of adjournment be for a longer duration than the space of six months and shall publish the journey journal of their proceedings monthly, except such parts thereof relating to treaties, alliances, or military operations, as in their judgment requires secrecy. And the yeas and nays of the delegates of each state on any question shall be entered on the journal when it is desired by any delegate, and the delegates of a state or any of them at his or their request shall be furnished with a transcript of the said journal, except, except such parts as are above accepted to lay before the legislatures of the several states. All of this has to be written down. Um, any of the delegates can request a copy of the proceedings to give to their states. Um, Congress can adjourn uh, whenever they want to and to anywhere they want to, but it can't be for more than six months. Mm -hmm. So they can go home, just, you know, not for more than six months of the year. They, 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 so they, so they have to do something, they have to, at some point, they, they have to go and do their quote, quote job. They, they have to be there. They don't have to be doing anything, but they have to be there at least six months of the year. Do we have that kind of thing now? or is it yeah. Also... yeah, we have the same basic thing. And there's some talk about, wouldn't it make more sense to have it be <coughs> virtual? Because we can do that now. <laughs> Congress via Discord messages. Yeah. It's theoretically doable. Um, And, frankly, that would enable the expanding of Congress because the number of, of people per representative has been steadily, well, not steadily, but mostly steadily going up the entire time we've been a country. Was it, was it like 100, 200,000 representatives? Yeah, people I would have to look it up. I would have to look it up to know what it was and what it is. But it says in the Constitution, you know, it shall be no more than such and, you know, no less than such and such. And that was how many there were per representative when the country started. And if we kept going so that... And this was before the... This is before the world hit 1 billion people. Oh, yeah. And when there were still only 13 states. If we kept going so that the number of people each representative served remained the same as it was on day one of this country, Congress would have to meet in an arena. Because it would be so big. Time to, time to tear down and rebuild the, the, the Capitol building. <laughs> There's not room on Capitol Hill. Not unless they made a skyscraper. Yeah. So that's a whole other conversation. But um, 
you note that in the Articles of Confederation, there's really no such thing as your representative. There's the somewhere between two and nine people who represent your state. But your state legislature chooses them. You don't have a voice. And um, they don't represent you. They represent your state and whatever your state legislature thinks are the state's interests. Right. And most of the people in your state didn't get to select their legislature either because, you know, even today, most of the people in any given state are women and children. So, so the state representative, representative the state congress, or so to say, is one that points these things. Yeah. So, kind yeah. of like how how before that was it was it I forget what the name it was, it was senators who were originally appointed by the legislature, but without without but unlike the senators these these people don't have any real power to do anything right article 10 the committee of the states or any nine of them shall be authorized to execute in the recess of congress such of the powers of congress as the united states and congress assembled by the consent of nine states shall from time to time think expedient to vest them with provided that no power be delegated to the said committee for the exercise of which by the articles of confederation the voices of the of nine states in the Congress of the United States assembled is requisite. So if Congress is, is not in session, if nine states' representatives get together and say, hey, we need to do a thing, as long as that thing is permissible under the Articles of Confederation and all nine of the states agree on the thing, they can do the thing. And did they usually agree? No. <laughs> Article 9, or excuse me, 11. I can read Roman numerals. Canada, acceding to this confederation and joining in the measures of the United States, shall be admitted into and entitled to all the advantages of this union, but no other colony shall be admitted into the same unless such admission be agreed to by nine states. So Canada, if Canada wants to come in, they, they get a free pass? Right. Because there was this belief that... Uh, it was in Canada's best in best interests, and whether or not this is true depends on who you talk to, but that it was in Canada's best interest to leave, um, you know, to stop being a British colony and to join the United States. And obviously they disagreed. They disagreed. And in fact, um, the king is still on their currency. I like it. So... That they did can't, can't quote Canada would have been the fourteenth colony. Yeah. Or state. Canada would have been one of the states. Not, not even like Quebec or Montreal. Or uh, well, they didn't really want Quebec because it was French and Catholic, and they were not fond. But you know, not even like Toronto and Nova Scotia and whatever. Canada, you're all one first one people. <laughs> yeah. That would be that would that be that's like a up north. I feel that population was, but that would be like a big, a big state, but with very little population. Yeah, um, I forget what percentage of Canadians live within a hundred miles of the American border, the U.S. Canada border, and I mean we're not even talking Alaska in this calculation here, but it is a vast percentage i think it's more than three quarters of all canadians live within 100 miles of the u.s canada border yeah i think like, most of them live on the south end not the north end is a little bit less populated it is a bit sparse um, until, until the yukon got the gold <laughs> after then yeah and even then, the Yukon is very sparsely populated. Um, it's just, there were people who came and looked for gold and then went, oh, it's cold here, and left again. Gold's gone. 
going home. Yeah. Well, like if you, if you look at um, California, which I uh, know a fair more about than I do about the Yukon gold rush for reasons of having grown up in California and not the Yukon. Uh, when California was divided into states or into counties, excuse me, every county had the same population. And so you can tell where the gold rush was by looking for all the little tiny counties. And now most of those counties do not have populations much larger than they did in 1850. And San Bernardino County and Los Angeles County are enormous. Um, San Bernardino County is larger than several states. But, and, un but, but unlike Yukon, they, they stayed after the gold rush was done. Right. Well, that's the thing, is that the gold rush counties all still have fairly, except San Francisco, but most of the gold rush counties still have fairly small populations uh, relative to the huge counties that didn't have big populations during the gold rush. So there's not a lot so, of gold in L.A. So basically the gold... Uh, the gold rush populations are descendants of the I mean, populations now there's, there's like gold rush descendants still living there some of it yeah well i mean some places also have like you know pot farmers and what have you but a lot of people came out to california for the gold rush stayed for a year or two and then left again and the climate of you know, a lot of those little tiny California counties is much nicer than the climate of the Yukon. But they were only there to see if they could get rich. And when they didn't, they went home again. You know, yes, there were people who stayed, but a lot more went home again or moved somewhere else. Um, if if the movie industry hadn't come to Los Angeles, Los Angeles almost certainly would have dried up. I finally found out why they had a city there. It was because they had an oil boom in the 1920s. So L.A. got big off of oil. And if it hadn't been for things like, you know, shipbuilding and, and the war industry and the movies... L.A. probably would have gone back to being a little nowhere frontier town. Because Boomtown's bust. It's part of a cycle. So, yeah. So, Canada could have been the 14th state. Mm. All of it. Uh, Article 12, all bills of credit emitted, monies borrowed, and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States in pursuance with the present confederation shall be deemed and considered as a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction whereof the said United States and the public faith are hereby solemnly pledged. This is another one that got messy. This is saying that if the United States accepted credit before the Articles of Confederation. The United States still owed that money as a country, not as individual states. But again, there's no power to tax in this document. Because they are just they just got through with... They're taxation yeah. representation, even though they had representation, even though they had representation now, they, didn't, they still don't like taxes. Yeah. The basic fact is the colonists didn't like paying taxes. It's true that no taxation without representation was unfair, but it's also true that they weren't paying those taxes anyway. Um, a lot of the more prominent members of colonial of the colonial United States were involved in one way or another in smuggling. And so they didn't want an authority, even one considerably closer to them, that they had some say in, 
being able to levy taxes on them. Even the states were limited, most of them, in their ability to tax. So they have all of these bills that like, yes, this is on us and our credit and we're taking this and so forth. Uh, we don't have any money. Okay. So that, that got very complicated. And it's one of the things that led to the French Revolution was we got all this money from France and could not pay any of it back. And that's how the, the same thing, that's, that's you know, we could pay them back. This like the was the seven years slash French Indian Wars, why they started talking mm -hmm. to us to begin with. Yep. France basically bankrupted itself to own the British in the Revolutionary War. Because that's why they were helping us. It was not out of any great love of Americans and their freedom. It was out of a thousand-year hatred of the English. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. Mm -hmm. And to be strictly fair, it you know it hasn't been a thousand years that they've been fighting, but it's been close. A few, a few hundred years at least. Ever, probably, I think ever since the the Norman inv Norman invasion. Yeah. What's a quarter of a millennium among friends? I think so, it's, well, I think a thousand years would be more the French German fighting. Yeah, no, the whole thing is just messy and complicated. Um, so the United States said, "Yes, we will take on this this responsibility for this money," and they did not have the money to take on the responsibility with. Oh, I saw something. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the United States operated like the like Europe did back in the day where the states could just invade each other. It's like this is my state now. You're like like yeah. Britain and France to invade each other, Germany and Oh yeah, Germany. it would be so much messier if if this hadn't constantly been part of our our nation's policy. Like I claim this Maryland in the name of Massachusetts. Right. And the thing is, is it was put as policy because of how weak the country was. Um, it's the, you know, unite or die. Um, everybody with any real authority in the U.S. knew that the states had to stand together or fall together. If we do not hang together, surely we shall all hang separately. I, 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 I remember that quote of who said it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that is why the laws are in place, even as early as the Article of Confederation, that the states do not get to go to war with one another. Because if they start that, it's not going to end well for anybody. I can I guess see it now. Massachusetts and Spain go to, teams up with Spain to go to war against France and and. New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, Article 13. Every state shall abide by the determinations of the United States in Congress assembled on all questions which by this article or this confederation are submitted to them. And the articles of confederation shall be inviolably, inviolably observed by every state and the union shall be perpetual nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made in any of them unless such alteration be agreed to in a Congress of the United States and be afterward confirmed by the legislatures of every state. The Constitution had to be ratified to go into authority. And they let it be by all, you know, by nine. They let it be the, the nine states that are frequently called on. Um, and now I'm looking at it. It may be that it was nine most of the time and not, you know, it couldn't be 12 against one, but the smaller states tended to band together and the larger states tended to band together. And it didn't take much to derail things. And it's not like Congress had any authority even without the uh, the states banding together to stop things getting done. Were there, were there also North and South lines being drawn at this time too? or just The North and South lines were really starting. The slave and free lines... Um, there wasn't any real single division in states the way there would be starting in the early 19th century because there were multiple divisions and each this is why the the founders didn't really think political parties would be a thing because 
they considered that a southern farmer and a northern farmer had more in common than a southern farmer and a southern merchant. But in some aspects, the southerners would ally against the northerners, and the slave owners would ally against the the they weren't really abolitionists yet. Some of them were, but most of them just didn't have slaves. Um, you know, it was seen that there were so many dividing lines and the big states against the small states. So Pennsylvania and Virginia would find a lot of common ground simply by being really big. And so the, the founding fathers, most of them, really did not believe that political parties would found as quickly and determinedly as they did, because they had a hard time believing that you would find anyone who agreed with you on every issue. And what they didn't realize was that good enough would be an ongoing factor. And that, in fact, there have been a lot of single issue voting issues and this in is the history what, of the country and this is what later came up with the, the, the two health system because the small states wanted something the big states wanted another thing yeah yeah a lot of what went into the constitution was compromised between the small states and the big states the um, small states wanted the senate and the big states wanted the representatives right right and there's a certain amount of north versus south compromise the three-fifths compromise is a north versus south compromise and you know like i was saying with how you can tell what people argued about by how long the articles are you know it's clear they put a lot more discussion into the executive than the legislative just based on the legislative is like ah yes supreme court let's have one of those Whereas legislative is like, and he will be this old, and he will have done this and that and the other thing, and here are the rules. Um, you know, you can also read a lot of who was compromising with whom based on some of the rules that were established by Congress. Um, anytime it looks like power is being divided between two groups, yeah, that's because it is. That's because they're trying to make a document that both parties in a dispute will agree with. It's the old saying, you can tell a compromise because nobody's happy with what they end up with. Um, and whereas it hath pleased the great governor of the world to incline the hearts of the legislatures we respectively represent in Congress. Okay. To approve of and to authorize us to ratify the said Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, know ye that we, the undersigned delegates, by virtue of the power and authority to us given for that purpose, do by these presents in the name and in behalf of our respective constituents fully and entirely ratify and confirm each and every of the said Articles of Con Confederation and Perpetual Union and all and singular the matters and things therein contained. And we do further solemnly plight and engage the faith of our respective constituents that they shall abide by the determinations of the United States in Congress assembled on all questions which by the said confederation are submitted to them. And that the articles thereof shall be inviolably observed uh -huh, by the states we respectively represent and that the union shall be perpetual. In witness thereof we have hereunto set our hands in Congress assembled. Done at Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania, the ninth day of July in the year of our Lord, 1778, and in the third year of the independence of America. So it took them a year. <laughs> and then you get the signers and so forth. Um, many of whom overlapped with signers of the Declaration of Independence, some of whom would later go on to sign the Constitution. There was a lot of overlap in these, in these people. So yeah, so you look at this document and there's some seeds of things that would continue and a lot of things that are designed to fail. 
Um, you see why they did it, but you know that it was not a good idea. And so, like, and the still, and that's still for today. It's even though we're more united than we before. Mm -hmm. Still, there's this. There's still the battle between what states can do and the federal government can do, even today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, and and we've realized that we have to give the federal government at least some power. To, and to, how to, like, much power yeah. that is has been changing back and forth for, you know. Depending on who's, who's in power. Yeah. Almost 250 years now, it's been going back and forth between whether the power uh, lands with the executive or the legislative. Yeah, it's like 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 was it, I think it was a year ago, last year, it was two years ago now that that the, the Supreme Court overturned this certain amend uh, uh, ruling, and each state got their own abortion rules now. And yep, and that was like, phew. yeah, and then we were off to the races. Yeah, um, but for example, uh, you know, a century ago, um, Calvin Coolidge basically thought his job as president was to not actually do anything. Like, he literally did not think that he, as president, should be doing anything. And most of the country seemed to agree with him on that. And then within 20 years, you get the wave that is FDR. Who did a lot of stuff. Who did a ton of stuff. You know, it's 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 interesting that the number of people on the Supreme Court has stayed static for as long as it has, given that a that's set by Congress, not by the Constitution. It doesn't matter things that grow on. It wasn't always nine either. It wasn't always no. Nine. It was not always nine. It's been nine for about 150 years now, I think. But there's no real reason for it to be nine. It's, it's like it's only it's like Congress has been four thirty five for like less than hundred about hundred years now. Yeah. Um, and again, arguably, it should be considerably higher than that. But the thing is, is I'm pretty sure we've had times where there have been an even number of Supreme Court justices, which is a bad idea, and not just because you know there's been stretches where they've needed an appointment in order to fill out the number, but because that was the number we had by act of Congress at that time. And then Congress went, oh, wait, tiebreakers are nice. You know, the, the Congress is set up with built-in tiebreakers. But... And so, so is the Senate technically, the, the, the VP voting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, maybe we should have one of those. For the Supreme Court. Um, you know, it's the balance of power and the balance of who sides with who and all sorts of things like that have been just continually in flux. You know, I've been threatening for years now to write a five paragraph essay that I can post on Facebook whenever somebody's uncle is being an idiot explaining exactly how the Democratic Party went from being the party of the KKK to the party of the Big Tent. Um, Because, yeah, that changed. And it wasn't an immediate change. Um, it took time. It started mostly with FDR and continued through to about Nixon. But, you know, there's a reason where Strom Thurmond was a member of two different parties during his stretch as a senator. Yeah, even even, even up to more modern times. I, I, forget, I forget who it was, but there's a... I think it was one of the... Eight, 2008 election or 2004 election, there's a Democrat congressman in, uh, at the rep, Republican represent at the Republican yeah. party. I don't think you remember this one. He, he says, I forget, I forget his name, but he challenged like Chris, one of the 
you just catch us to a duel. It was like it still challenged you to a duel. Like Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in the 60s, there were the Dixiecrats who were the Southern Democrats who were basically their own party. And, you know, the history of this country has not been one of stasis. I've long said that you can tell who doesn't know much about the Founding Fathers by who treats them as a single unit. I've said it once or twice tonight as a shorthand, but nine times out of ten, if somebody says to you, the Founding Fathers said or thought or did, they have just proven to you that they do not know anything about the Founding Fathers. Because most of the, if I get this a guess here, most of the people who voted on this were probably anti-federalists. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if Alexander Hamilton, who was in the army at the time, he was not a member of Congress yet. But if Alexander Hamilton had said the sky was blue, three guys would have gone to the window to check. You know? And um, shortly after this, uh, Jefferson and Adams would start a fight that would last for years. And, I mean, there's the whole uh, Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, again, actual literal duel. Like, the Founding Fathers were not anything like a cohesive unit, and never were. The only thing they agreed on was, I think the only thing they ever agreed on was Britain, Britain bad. <laughs> not even that. Um, one of the members of the uh, con of the Continental Congress would not agree to sign the Declaration of Independence because he still hoped that a resolution with with Britain was possible. But he left and went to go help prepare the defense of his state because they were actually being invaded by British forces at the time. So, like I said, like we said before, even after this, each one thought of themselves as a member of their state. Like, I'm a Virginian, yeah. I'm a New Yorker, I'm a... Yeah. Um, even as far as Robert E. Lee who, you know, had relatives who were involved in this whole thing. Um, but he waited until he knew if Virginia was going to secede or not before deciding which army he was going to be in. And when Virginia seceded, Robert E. Lee joined the Confederate Army. And that is nearly a hundred years after the United States had theoretically been one country. Four score and mumble mumble years ago, because it wasn't quite, you know, Gettysburg. But, but year two away. So yeah. five, five years, four years. Four score and like, I don't know, four or five years later. Um Robert E. Lee still thought of himself as a Virginian first, an American second. And don't get me wrong, I am not here to, do, to defend Robert E. Lee. I am here to use him as an example. You know, the specific unit I talked about earlier when I was talking about the units that fought in the Civil War was the 54th Massachusetts, which is the all-black unit except for the officers because racism that the movie glory is about yeah even today how do we decide when states should have the power when federals have the power a lot of fighting yeah uh um, like there is a town not that far from me the town of sumner washington is named after a senator i'm pretty sure charles sumner who delivered a speech on the floor of congress um calling slavery a sex worker he didn't use that term and the southerners who defended her the people who were paying her money and he was beaten nearly to death on the senate floor with a cane oh i remember that during 
the, right. the peace of civil because this peace of peaceful war fight. Yeah, like by another senator on the Senate floor, and then people sent the guy more canes, inscribed "Hit him again," and they the named. Yeah, it, it, sorry, it was the southern southern senator that hit the northern senator, right? Yeah, yeah, and then the town of Sumner, Washington, is named after the northern senator. But, but in Oregon, black people were illegal. Just, it was basically just illegal to be black and in Oregon. And that's a north. That's up north. And that's up north. Yeah, but also not far from me, uh, the the town of Tumwater, Washington, is the first town uh, founded by Americans. You know, people from the United States, and one of the founding members of Tumwater was a black man. So the United States has always been really, really complicated that way. Like, isn't know? it? I might be wrong. Isn't it illegal to own an umbrella up where you live? It's not, but it might as well be. My son really wants an umbrella, and I'm like, but nobody here uses. Them. It's like, don't say that word here around. We don't say I, that word around here. I, I this is this is absolutely not a joke. I have an umbrella that I only ever use when it's too sunny out. It's waterproof. It was bought, you know, it was made as a rain umbrella and I use it as a parasol because that is that is how we roll up here in Washington. Um, wet yeah. is how yeah, we roll. Yeah, I mentioned this before and other things, but I, I just love the uh, the hypocrisy sometimes between Satan and Satan. Like, like like when the when the when the Gay Merits Act passed, you know, there were some people were like, let the state decide who can get married or not. But when when each state passed it, the marijuana bill, they're like, that's a federal thing. The federal people should charge this. Yep. The state. <sighs> yeah. Um, I was I was at a friend's birthday in eastern Washington last weekend. And uh that was an interesting experience in a lot of ways because the the political divide in Washington follows the the line of the cascade mountains so western washington and eastern washington are very very different politically yeah i gotta share a video of you after this stream is over with about washington mm -hmm. I, I love my state but you know it is it is two states loosely knit together by a mountain range it's also worth noting that I was on the very, very end of the Scablands, um, as as uh, Dapper Dino viewers will remember from Kent Hovind not understanding. So, are, are you? A, do you live in the East or West Washington? I live in the West. I live um, uh, the very southern tip of the Puget Sound, not that far from the state capital. Um. And we are a, we are the liberal side of the mountains, but we also have the population. Eastern Washington is about two thirds of the state, but I drove through Eastern Washington last weekend, and there's a lot of nothing out there. You know, they would routinely the GPS would routinely say the next exit is in like fifteen miles. Oh right, you know farmland so, and mountains and nothing. So overall, what's your opinion on this article? I could see what they were trying to do, and honestly, I don't think the con the Constitution would have been ratified in seventeen eighty eight or seventeen seventy eight. Excuse me, it would not have been ratified. The states weren't ready for it. But this is such a flawed document that just cannot succeed as a way to run a country. So uh, after 10 years of it, they're like, no, this, this ain't working. After 10 years of it, they got permission theoretically to overhaul it and knew that the first thing they had to do was throw it out and start over. Yeah, because... The overhaul, all 13 states need to agree, and they would probably do that every, every little thing. Yeah. You know, technically, they only needed nine states to agree. You know, it says in the Articles of Confederation, you only need nine to agree. But 
in practical terms, they knew that you needed all 13. Is that why now, is that why now, like when an amendment needs to be passed or something, only like two thirds of this or three fourths of the states for an amendment? To yeah. It's generally agreed that getting the entire country to to agree on anything is not going to happen. But at the same time, they don't want a simple majority either. So things like constitutional amendments require a super majority. They require two thirds plus one. Yeah, I forget it's it's so much of the it's so much of each state congress and plus the plus the, the national congress too. Yeah, yeah, and technically, uh, Congress can set up however they want to to pass an amendment. There's a suggested route, and then it says, or if Congress decides to do something else, we'll do that. But it is very much a, you know, we need to have the population of the majority of the country because the majority of the country is going to follow this rule, but we can't let any one group hold everything up um unless it's promotions in the military which i guess one guy can hold up so that's good to know um being a student of history can be really depressing yeah yeah at least we're we learning more about our past now oh yeah no, and I do think it's all really important to know because, you know, yes, it's true that most of the police organizations in the United States have their roots in um, slave catching groups and things along those lines. But it's also true that um, having an organized police force uh, makes the streets safer in yeah. theory. Just like a, a, I forget who it was, had their origins in union busting. Yeah, the Pinkertons. Yeah, no, it's, it's, there's a lot of things where it's like, well, yes, but also no. And I feel that about the Articles of Confederation. You know, we did see some good things in here. Um, you know, hey, let's have a postal surface. It's a good idea. Yeah. But, but you're glad that you don't have that system still today. We would not exist as a country if we had tried to keep the Articles of Confederation. As soon as the, the states felt that they were safe from European invasion, the United States would have fallen apart if we had kept the Articles of Confederation. Yeah, I, I, so I can start to see now each state, control, each state being their own little thing and invading each other. Yeah, and probably some of them would have joined together in later years for, you know, common defense or be like, for... Be like, like New England might, might be New England. The whole thing of New England yeah, might be... Yeah, exactly. Like Italy and Germany weren't countries 250 years ago and are now. So maybe some of the states would have formed their own little countries and, you know, there would be 15 or 20 state countries across where the united states is now so why did why do you think that in the south they decided let's go back to this again <laughs> well because they thought that a lot of their problems came from federalism because outside forces were being allowed to control whether or not they were allowed to have slaves which you will note that no law was passed up until the Civil War, banning owning slaves. But the expansion of slavery was being limited, and that wasn't okay either. And that was clearly all outside forces being able to control them, and therefore they needed the Articles of Confederation so that they could each be independent, but they would be loosely allied together in case of, you know, what a lot of them still see as federal invasion. Um, and arguably for their needs, there is a kind of sense there because I would strongly argue that they weren't thinking past getting union recognition of their existence. 
I don't think any person involved in the actual formation of secessionist governments was thinking past recognition by the United States. And their confederacy would, you know, their, their document of confederacy would hold them together if they'd been able to pull it off that long. But they would not have been able to stay under an article of confederacy either. So if, if, even if they won the war, they'd have to re argue with the government or fall apart too. Right. Right. This is not a functional government. Because it puts a lot of responsibility on a government that doesn't have any authority to back it up. Well, thanks for being on today talking about this. Oh, sure. Is there any other or any other future articles you want to talk about in, in the United States in, in, or other countries if you have any knowledge about them? You know, um, there are a lot of things that I can talk about. Um, I actually do know a wide range of things, not just what uh, academic decathlon when I was in high school referred to as documents of freedom. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll figure something out. I'm definitely willing to be on again another time. Awesome. Well, okay, then hope you all enjoyed this, this learning experience. And remember, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. If you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And hopefully everyone can hear us. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We have no picture right now because I'm still terrible at looking Discord. <laughs> I mean, not Discord, I, OBS. But, so, first of all, I'll introduce my guest again. Hello. What do you what what do you do again? Well, I'm uh, I'm a stay at home parent and freelance writer, um, but I'm also an amateur historian. So that is how I am relevant today. Last time she she was here, we were talking about the, all the amendments to the Constitution. But today, we're going to go a little bit further back and see how it originally came about. I just found in the National Archive uh, website store a book depressingly titled OMG WTF does the Constitution actually say a non-boring guide to our democracy to how our democracy is supposed to work. And uh, I hope to give you information in a less appallingly cringe way than that. We can only hope. All right, so let's talk. Let's, let's, let's talk about how it began. What's, what's the preamble all about? Well, the preamble is basically what are we even trying to do here? Because the the thing to remember about the Constitution is technically they weren't supposed to write it. Uh, that was of the Ar yeah. Article of Confederation. Right. They were there not to write a Constitution, but to reform the Articles of Confederation. And basically everyone who was there went into it with the knowledge that the Articles of Confederation were hopelessly broken. They could not be fixed in a way that would create a viable country moving forward. Um, Congress had no authority any there's there's a whole thing about George Washington wasn't the first president, you know, this other person was because but the, their title was president basically president of Congress. And the Congress there, had no power whatsoever. Right. There was no chief executive. Uh Congress existed but they couldn't pass national laws in no small part because they had no authority to tax literally anything. They were completely reliant on essentially donations from the states. And 
because every single state had veto power. So, if, and apparently this was the biggest problem, if Rhode Island was feeling put out that day, because nobody was taking them seriously because they are too small, they could just prevent anything from happening and keep any laws from being passed. And there are some broken things with how laws get passed under our current system of government, but it's still better than that. So what the preamble is, is basically justifying what they're doing. It's saying, okay, this isn't what we were here for, but in order to, you know, keep our country going, we have created this constitution instead. Um, it has no power under law, because, I mean, there, there's no law there. It's just a list of goals. But it is seen as one of the important founding statements of our country as these are, you, these are the goals of the United States and this is what we want to be doing as a nation. Um, what promote the general welfare means, for example, varies quite a lot from person to person. Which posterity we're securing blessings of liberty for, you know, things like that. But as a, as a statement of ideals, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Article 1, what we call the Congress, or, le or legislative branch. Yeah. Um, this was based roughly around the, the British Parliament. Um, but what they, well, I'm going to preface everything I say with, there is no such thing as the Founding Fathers wanted. Because that assumes a degree of unanimity that does not exist. Yeah. If you look at their writings. Like you mean we weren't an altogether Christian nation back in the day? Oh, man. I tend to sum it up as, if Alexander Hamilton had said the sky was blue, three guys would have checked the window. Because there was so much conflict. You know, and yes, yeah, some of it was was religious. Um, I I like to tell the story of the um, I think I told this last time of the the congregation of Baptists who agreed that they wanted to vote for uh, Thomas Jefferson and not John Adams because they believed that Thomas Jefferson was an atheist, but an atheist would do less harm to them than an Episcopalian. Um, you know, so there was the obvious religious issues. Um, I think there were still some, some states that had laws on their books, like forbidding Catholics, <laughs> things like that. Uh, but also... A holdover from our Church of England days. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Uh, the If you look at the old laws of the Massachusetts colony, they are super strict. Because it, it wasn't that just you... You had to be Christian. You had to be one very specific kind of Christian. And Pennsylvania mostly exists because nobody liked Quakers. And Maryland exists because nobody liked Catholics. And, you know, it, Rhode Island exists because wanted, the rest of the people had to go somewhere. He wanted to... He, I, I think... I, I, remember, I could be wrong about history, but I think he's... They, he actually, he actually wanted to pay the in the, the Native Americans for their land, like like. Yeah. Yeah, and that was that was not a popular choice. So you know, then of course you get into the regional conflicts. Um, you know, North versus South, obviously, but even you know, New England versus New York and Pennsylvania, which were much more. Uh, commerce oriented. New England was still relatively agricultural in those days. Um, 
and so there was there was the conflict verse of agrarian versus um business and all sorts of conflicts like that so when i say the founding fathers said or wanted or anything like that remember that i am speaking in generalities and i myself can probably name at least three or four founding fathers who wanted something completely different um my most interesting example is that alexander hamilton wanted to abolish state lines like this no states just one country no states just one country and that's an admirable goal but um not really feasible especially in the days where communication and travel took as long as they did it is a lot easier for me to understand the needs of a floridian and i'm in washington state than it would be in those days for someone from new hampshire to understand the needs of someone from vermont just because i have a lot more access to what's going on in florida and, and so and back then the, the each of the state found themselves as their own country almost yeah, oh, absolutely. It's generally believed that one of the most interesting changes brought to the United States in the Civil War was a grammatical one, where the United States stopped being plural and started being singular. The U.S. is and the U.S. are is the big difference that, that uh, the Civil War brought as far as the broader political you know, the, the the patriotic change, as it were. Uh, Robert E. Lee thought of himself as a Virginian first and an American second. So, yeah. These people s still thought of themselves as Carolin North Carolinians, South Carolinians, Georgians. Uh, I don't remember the adjective form for New Jersey, but, you know, very much they are of this state and this state is part of this looser organization of states um so there's there's a lot of conflict and as we go through this you'll see where the biggest fights were because that's where the language is the most detailed because when they really really disagreed they went out of their way to hammer out a compromise that, if it didn't make everybody happy, at least made everyone the same degree of unhappy. So you get, you know, the, we're about to hit the three-fifths compromise. And there's a lot going on there. But that was, that was one of those things that if they hadn't come up with a compromise, there would not have been a country. So, for this, uh, oh. first section one, is like, it says a Senate and a House. Yeah, and that is basically based off the British Parliament. The um, House of Lords, House of Commons. House of Lords, House of Commons. This is what I was starting to say is the Founding Fathers didn't want a House of Lords. And again, let's go with most of them. Because there were a few who were very big on the idea of an American aristocracy. A, an American hereditary aristocracy but mostly it was just kind of assumed that there would be a de facto one without giving anybody titles and that's why the senate has certain privileges over the house because it was assumed that the senate would be our type of people the wealthy landed essentially american gentry and the house of representatives shorter term you know less power in as much as there's more of them so it's more spread out the equivalent of commons and obviously it wouldn't be peasants but you know yeah, a wealthy storekeeper would qualify yeah i, th I think even at first, all 
even even all white men couldn't vote. Only white landowning men could vote. Yeah. And again, that's one of those ones that varies based on where you are because the the voting requirements were obviously state by state. Um, but it was very much assumed that everybody who voted would have a certain amount of money. And the first it US history can kind of be seen as a history of expanding the franchise. So first it was white male landowners and then it was all white men and then it was you know oh i guess black people can vote too Only black and then yeah but they have to be men and then well i guess women can vote too and then oh i guess we meant it when we said black people could vote and then finally let's lower it down a few, few years yeah i guess if you're old enough to be drafted you're old enough to vote So, the House of Representatives was always seen as a lesser house, like the House of Commons, and the Senate was always seen as the upper house, like the House of Lords. Yeah, like, like, like you could get this, uh, a representative all, all the way at 25 years old. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually, my firstborn is old enough to be a representative now. Which is a little alarming to me, but will not be eligible to be president for another ten years. Um, and if you if you'll note here, uh, representatives also only have to be citizens for seven years. So like the, like the president we'll talk about later, they don't have to be mm -hmm. born in the country. Yeah. And and we will get into how vague the citizenship requirement for president is. But with representatives, seven years a citizen. Um, and you have to be an inhabitant of the state in which you are chosen, which historically... Um, the the actual requirements for what counts as an inhabitant are a little un, unenforced. Um, you know, people using their friends' addresses and buying houses they never actually live in and so forth um, to qualify as living in that uh, in that state. But officially and technically, you do have to live in the state you are a representative of, which is reasonable. I, you know, I'd, I'd hope you, I, I would hope you, you live in the state you're representing. It's like, like, I'm representing in Washington and I live in Florida. Yeah, it's, uh, not, just because I have a better shot at understanding the needs of Florida these days, doesn't mean I'm as effect as as affected by laws governing Florida as I would be if I actually lived there. Thank God. Um, right. and then we get into the three fifths compromise. Uh, yes. that, that was um, and I'm go I'm going to read this one out loud because it deserves to be read in its entirety just for there's a lot going on in this sentence representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons including those bound to a service for a term of years and excluding indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons so, indentured servants, which were still sort of technically a thing at the time, counted for representation. Um, it's really important to note that most indentured servants were white. Because that's an important distinction. 
between indentured servants and full-on slaves. Or, sorry, all other persons. The word slave does not appear in the Constitution. And the main reason for that was that the southern states were really big and really powerful. It is no longer true that more presidents have been from Virginia than any other state. But four of our first five presidents were from Virginia. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Yep. And, and the only remaining one was John Adams from Massachusetts. So if you look at the number of representatives, which comes up as what the original representatives were, uh, Massachusetts gets eight. Virginia gets ten. Each of the Carolinas get five. You know, yeah, New York gets six and Pennsylvania gets eight. But Maryland gets six, Virginia gets ten, the Carolinas each get five, and Georgia gets three. And most of the northern states get fewer than the Carolinas. So you had a lot more people living in the South at the time? A lot more people living in the South. And that would change as the United States industrialized and urbanized. But we were still, in 1789, a very agrarian nation. And that also meant that not just the population, but the wealth was still heavily concentrated in the South. Um, this is, this is be, this you know, before the uh, cotton gin became a thing. So this is like yeah. mostly, mostly tobacco, I think mostly tobacco stuff. Tobacco, rice, indigo, um, those were really the big three at the time. Cotton was starting to become a thing, but it was so expensive to produce. Um, and that's partially because of the seeds are really sticky and don't want to leave the cotton bowl. And that is what the cotton gin does. It gets the seeds out of the cotton. Um, and also, I'm not an expert on cotton, but if you study the Civil War, you have to learn at least a little bit. But there's two types of cotton as far as length of fiber. And we wanted the kind with the longer fibers because, I mean, obviously that's that's easier to work with. But I believe that is the kind with the worst seeds to deal with. Uh, that gain, gaining and loss. Like, like ooh, it's better fiber, but that's worse seeds. Yeah. So... You know, it's generally agreed that if the cotton gin hadn't been invented, um, it actually was possible for slavery to have died out simply because the the slave system was incredibly inefficient. But cotton needs a lot of manual labor. And by all accounts, it is extremely brutal yeah, I think the only thing, manual labor. I think the only thing worse than cotton back in the day was, was sugar. Yeah, and sugar does not grow well in the contiguous United States. Some in, like, Florida, but it's, it's worth noting that the only U.S. state that's ever been a major sugar producer is Hawaii. Yeah, I, I think they had more slaves in the, in the Caribbean and the South American countries than they did up north. Oh, absolutely. Slavery in Brazil is an incredibly horrifying topic. It's There's a lot going on in Brazilian slavery. And in the Caribbean, where you'd get the, the islands producing sugar. And, you know, it was very, very clear in the sugar-producing areas that you needed the manual labor. Yeah. And it was very clear once cotton became a thing that you needed the manual labor. And actually, rice... 
Um, what they needed was not entirely the labor so much as the knowledge. The slaves that were really in demand in, in regions that produce rice were ones from parts of Africa where rice is grown. And so they brought them to the United States because they knew what they were doing. And the plantation owners did not. But, you know, at, at the time, things were still so agricultural that they needed the South in order to hold the country together. And the fact that it is very specifically three-fifths, I think tells you a lot about that, because it's not half. It's slightly more than half. Because the South was able to get that little tiny edge. And the important thing about the, the three-fifths is about representation. The Southerners wanted slaves to count as whole people for the purposes of representation, not for taxes. but not for taxes. They wanted to be property for taxes and whole people for representation. And the Northerners was like, oh, no, I don't think so. You have to pick one of those. And what they were able to hammer out was the Three-Fifth Compromise. And a lot of people at the time were unhappy with it in one direction or the other. Obviously, the, the major slave owners mostly were like, no, but property when it counts and population when it counts. And a lot of the, the northerners flat out thought that slaves should count as property. Um, because if you treat them as property, then they're property, which is mm, not great, but also kind of true. But in order to get really mostly the Carolinas and Virginia into the Union. A compromise had to be reached because just abolishing slavery was not going to happen in 1789. The political will was not there now, anywhere. I don't, think, I don't think that it was even major of abolitionist at the time either, probably. Some. Um, what, I've, what I've long found interesting is, and I can't remember exactly who it was, and I don't remember what book I read it in, but I read a book about the Constitutional Convention a while back that pointed out that the longest and most passionate speech given about the moral evils of slavery at the convention was also given by its largest slaveholder. This is someone who owned 300 plus human beings as his personal property and knew that it was evil and said in his speech that allowing it to be one of the cornerstones of this country was starting the country off on the wrong foot and would only lead to horrible things. Did he free his slaves? He did not. Uh, ben Franklin, who was at the convention, one of the only people who was at both the Constitutional Convention and the um, Declaration of Independence, um, founded an abolition society. Alexander Hamilton was an abolitionist. There were a few abolitionists in the Constitutional Convention, but m most Northerners, the most that they wanted was... Um, don't spread it. You know, limit it to where it is now and don't bring in more slaves. And that goes to, the, after 20 years, no more slave trade. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's worth noting that that is purely the importation of slaves that is banned. Not, not breeding. Not breeding, not buying and selling ones that are already in the country. You just can't bring in more. And let's be real, part of that was pure racism. Part of that was, uh, we don't want any more black people in the country than, than we already have. But part of it was also 
the idea that maybe we can end it simply by ending the source. Because I don't think most people anticipated how cutthroat literal breeding would be in years to come. I, I, like I, said, like I was saying before, the, the southern United States had the least amount of slaves imported. Unlike the... Cause because unlike the, uh, I would say, I say this is even, I would say it's as bad, but unlike the the second ones, we didn't have the highest of death death overthrow. Yeah, oh yeah, no, the the death toll again in Brazil was shocking. It wasn't great in the United States, and God knows, you know, the passage had a horrifying death toll. But as far as once you got to the Americas. Anywhere was better than Brazil. Nowhere was great. Anywhere was better than Brazil. Because you're still a slave. Yeah. Okay, and then next, talking about, uh, they'll have a speaker. Mm -hmm. And impeachment power. Yeah. And this is another one where it was clear that everybody agreed that those should happen. And let's move on. Because there, there's still a lot of detail here. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers. How? What officers will those be? They'll figure it out. And and if if you've seen my video with uh, RJ, we talked about the four or five presidential impeachments we've had so far. And how they did it. <laughs> All house members. Yeah. Problems. All right. Section three. The Senate. Yeah, and this is the first part of the Constitution. I mean, leaving aside things like, you know, giving more people rights. But the first section of the Constitution where the actual laws have been changed. Because you'll note, uh, chosen by the legislature thereof. The state you know, House because... The Senate still take, take the yeah. U.S. Senate until recently. Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, I believe that's a 20th century amendment. Either way, it went more than a hundred years where the the state legislatures chose senators. And that was partially because the state legislatures were also assumed to be gentlemen and senators were too important to be trusted to the commoners. Like you said, they, they were more of an upper class at the t time. Exactly, exactly. Um, and this is, you know, we get into... And then we rotate every six years, but they're offset from one another. So you get different um, Senate elections every two years. And for Senator, you have to be 30 and nine years a citizen. And an inhabitant of your state. But this time only two state in that yes that population and that's another compromise um i forget how many representatives we would now have if we kept to the initial number of representatives um that uh you know one for every thirty thousand people I forget how many representatives we would end up with now, but it's a lot. Yeah, I, I've heard, way more than we currently have. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that we should at least modify it a little bit because you know we have very very high uh, disportations of people. Yeah, basically the the Senate or the House of Representatives would have to meet in an arena <laughs> if uh, if we kept up with with the number we had at the time. Was it now um, a million, million people for every, every representative now or something? Something. Depending on, you know, what state you're in. 
because there's also a minimum. You have to have at least one representative per state. Not for senators. I think this was a, another compromise where they wanted mm -hmm. the smaller states wanted equal population. The bigger states were like, no, 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 population, all population. Yeah. And some of those smaller states were also, you know, it was basically the the most of the founding fathers knew that this was an all or nothing situation. Either all the the states joined or the country wasn't going to work. So there are a lot of things in here that people are like, why do they do it this way? Well, because they had to. Because the power of the small states versus the power of the big states was an important consideration. Like I said, under the Articles of Confederation, um, Rhode Island did a lot just because they could. And they did not want to give up all the powers that they had under the Articles of Confederation. Um, so having two senators per state, regardless of population, is basically let's appease Rhode Island and Delaware. You know, New Hampshire a little bit, but mostly it's about Rhode Island and Delaware. Um, and there is a lot of language in Section 3 that makes it very clear that these are the people that they assume will have more power. Um, and more influence, and just be more important. And, um... A lot of the history of the U.S., that has historically been true. So why do they... I think we talked about a little bit in the, in the amendment. Why do they change it from having the state people, state government elect them, appoint them to having elections? What's well, it's partially that whole expansion of franchisement thing. Um, the current stance of the U.S. is to trust the will of the people more than the founding fathers generally did. Generally speaking, the founding fathers wanted to limit power in as few hands as possible, specifically theirs. And if you weren't elite enough to meet with them then you weren't important enough for your opinion about the country to really matter. And we have mostly moved away from that. And a lot more into the average person should have more of a say. And also, um... It's a lot easier to gerrymander a state house than it is to gerrymander a state. Uh -huh. So you can have a state that, because of districting lines, votes Republican as hell, but the majority of the population of the state um, would actually vote for a Democratic senator. And so there is at least that level of, okay, it's the debate about does land vote, do people vote, depends a lot. And in the case of senator, people vote within the state because everybody within the state has the same amount of control about who the senator is going to be. Except for the people who can afford to, you know, run for senator. And then we come to... The next one where it shows the VP's only power that we know of at the time. At least. Yeah. Tiebreaker. Um, I, I mean, tiebreaker is important. How often does the vice president actually over, over, senator, over the Senate? Depends on the vice president. Um, some of them go sit over the Senate because they don't have anything better to do. Some of them uh, don't have anything better to do, and that's the way they like it. Some of them actually work hand-in-hand -hand with their president and are off doing things for the president and don't have the time to sit and hold the Senate's hand during times when everybody knows how everything's going to go anyway. Which is why we have the president pro tempore. Yeah, president pro tempore. 
um, John Nance Gardner, who was um, FDR's first vice president, um, referred to the presidency uh, in the clean version as not being a, worth a pitcher of warm spit. There's another four-letter fluid that that sometimes is quoted as being, but generally it's accepted as having been spit and not piss. Um, and he mostly just went back to Texas, for what I can tell. Like, you're not giving me anything to do. I don't have any power in the Senate. I'm just going to go back home and hang out with my friends. Who said that again? That's John Nance Garner. Which is FDR's first uh, first vice president, also known as Cactus Jack. I was talking about Lyndon Johnson. Second. Yeah, I mean, they were they were certainly similar men in several notable ways. But, uh, yeah. I find this, you know, I find it funny, ironic. We talked about how the, the Senate is, the Senate, Senators are the upper house, but, mm -hmm. this, but, the, but in, 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 at least in current times, the Speaker of the House is higher the, is higher the order, order, of, order of presidency than the, the President pro Yeah. Us. Well, I mean, at the, at the time that the Constitution was actually written, they didn't have an order of succession. Like, as you may recall, we took quite a few amendments in before they finally went, oh yeah, and I guess the vice president should be in charge if something happens to the president. Yeah, for a while it was just assumed. Like, oh, the like, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in charge now. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, whatever. Yeah, but these days the Speaker of the House, and I, I think that's because there's a lot more room for negotiation in the House. Which means the Speaker actually has more control because the House is bigger and because there's a lot more possibility of horse trading. I will vote for you on this thing if you vote for me on this other thing. Um, less so these days than historically, but still, you know, a thing. Um... And, I mean, the vice president, as president of the Senate, is ahead of the, the Speaker of the House. The president pro tem is right under that, so... <coughs> how, how do they pick the president pro tem? Is it election or other... It's an election, okay. yeah. Um, I believe the president pro tem is of the House, of the party that controls the Senate just assumed even if that's not the same as the vice president but yeah it's it's one it's like the speaker of the house which we all saw in exhaustive detail how they choose a speaker of the house um but, but the, slowly and agonizingly over dozens of elections but the president pro temp can't break it break a vote break it no type no because he's a part of the of the hundred. Yeah, he is traditionally he is one of the hundred. Um and if it's split exactly fifty fifty, the vice president comes in and makes a big fuss and, and gets to vote and bangs a gaffle and then goes home again. And it doesn't happen very often. So his so his rare power is very rarely used. Yes. Well, these days, her, but yes. Uh, I just thought of something funny. Like, never, never, never mind. He was the president, so I wouldn't, wouldn't count. <laughs> I was thinking of something, but if, if a president's impeachment and the vice president's a tight, the sign, it's a tiebreaker. <laughs> I mean, there have been vice presidents who would have voted against their president. 
Um, it's worth noting here on the subject of impeachments um, that uh, it is just to um, an impeachment is not removal from office. An impeachment is basically the equivalent of an indictment. And the House of Representatives issues the impeachment and votes on it and says yay or nay, and then it goes to the Senate, who holds a trial. And there have been four impeachments. There has never been a successful vote in the Senate to remove the president from office. I believe there have been other officials who have been removed from office, but no president. Even the one who had two tries at it. That was, just, was our next thing. The impeach, the, how the Senate, the, that's a trial. Yeah. What goes before the Senate is a trial. And the only, as it says in the Constitution, the only punishment they are allowed to give is removal from office and disqualification to hold other office. But it also specifically says in the Constitution that... And, you know, double jeopardy was not yet officially legal because that's in the Bill of Rights, but um, they will be liable to further punishment by law for the same offense. So if you were impeached for, yeah, let's throw out inciting insurrection as a possibility and removed from office for inciting insurrection you could still go on trial for treason and sedition and still suffer whatever legal consequences came from that, even though you had been tried in the Senate and found guilty. It is not considered the same thing. Uh, is that all for Section 3? That's all for Section 3. Um, the Senate, sh the, the Congress should meet sometimes. Uh, so, so Basically is what Section 4 says. Uh, we, we might as well get together sometime, you know, and uh, discuss some laws and stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. And I believe that uh, the first Monday in November is one of the ones, yeah, that's Amendment 11 changed. Or, hold on, let me follow my own link here. Um... Oh, you're not going to actually... Great. But, uh, National Archive site is not giving me a direct link to the uh, amendment that changed that. But, that was changed by amendment. It does not have to be uh, the first Monday in December. It is now a different day that they have to meet. But they have to meet at least... Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, 20. Um, they have to meet... At least once a year, and such meetings shall begin at noon on the third day of January. Now, unless they decide that doesn't work for them, uh, unless they shall, by law, appoint a different day. But they have to meet at least one day a year. What day it is is in the Constitution. Unless they decide that day doesn't work for them, somebody's got a brunch scheduled, and then they vote for a different day. That's Section Four. then uh, five is is the very very basics of how they actually work um you know the ah, the george santos thing is kind of being held up by article one section five right now because the only people who can decide if he's qualified is the House of Representatives. And with a Republican majority, then George Santos is staying. Um, they need to have a majority 
of the house in order to, to do business. Is he the one? I, I might be wrong. Is he the one going to war with Walt Disney World? No, that's that's DeSantis. Okay. Yeah, no, that's the governor of Florida. George George Santos feels like he should be from Florida, but is, well, honestly, nobody quite knows where he's from. But he represents New York. He's the one who has consistently and bewilderingly lied about every single aspect of his life. My favorite of his lies is that he claims to have been one of the producers on the Spider-Man musical. Is that the good thing he's bragging about or a bad thing? I mean, the Spider-Man musical is one of the most infamous flops in Broadway history. Or as I told a friend the other day, they mostly they mostly closed it so that it would not actually end with a death count. Yeah. Why he um, wanted to brag about it, I don't know. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you're the weird flex, but okay. Um, but they can't, the, each house can punish its members for disorderly behavior. Uh, if two-thirds of the house ag agrees, they can expel a member. They have to keep a journal and publish it. They have to um, enter the vote into the record. And they can't adjourn for more than three days without the other house agreeing that that's okay. So basically, this is the, the bare bones. This is how Congress is actually going to do its job. Uh, section 6 is they should be paid. And they can't be arrested while actually doing their job. And then there's the emoluments clause. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time, and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. This one is basically, you can't have two jobs. You can't be, you know, a senator and a postmaster. You can't be, you know, a, a representative and a current uh, head of the CIA, or what have you. You can only do one of those two things at a time. So you're saying, uh, 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 after I get elected to the Senate, I have to quit my job at McDonald's. No! Because that's not a civil office under the authority yeah. of the United States. <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna quit. It, I'm gonna quit it anyways. <laughs> I mean, certainly the Senate pays better. Um, and most of the time is less dangerous. Except, um, for, except for the time when that one guy came to death. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, it wasn't to death. It was almost to death, but it wasn't to death. Um, and they named a town in Washington after him. The king, the king E, who was an abolitionist. Sumner Washington is named after the guy who was beaten to death for being beaten half to death for being rude about slavery in in the in Congress. The speech is a lot, by the way. Um, it it may contain the word whore master, so. Highly recommend seeking out and reading that one if you can. Um, but basically, they get they they get paid for working the Senate, working out. They get paid for working the Senate. They can't be arrested except for treason, felony, and breach of the peace. So I guess murder, because that's a felony. Um. But they can't be arrested literally on the Senate floor for parking tickets. Um, this guy spent 
25 in the 20 zone. Kick, kick him out. Kick him out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, the, the requirements for impeachment are so vague that theoretically you could be removed from office for, for speeding. I think it would take a lot to get the will of Congress behind that, but it's technically possible. Unless, it's, unless it was like the, the, that Tennessee rep, Tennessee Congress where they kicked somebody out for protesting. Oh, yeah, well. State houses, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's, a, that's a whole other can of warm episode. Yeah, well, and, and because it's so varied by state. True. You know, some states actually don't have two houses to their legislature. And yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, you know, I bet a lot of people don't even know who their state representatives are, probably. I I know mine. Um because I'm the person who looks all this stuff up for my friends at election time. But um I think most people don't even know who their member of the House of Representatives is. Um I will say actually um, I am one of a handful of people in the United States who has two female senators and a female representative. In the, so, in the, in the, in the U.S. Congress. Right? In the U.S. Congress. All three of my Congress critters are women. And what about your state, car- uh, your, state your, 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 your state capital one? I mean, Washington kind of does them weird, so I've got different, but I have I have male representatives there. Um, but on a federal level, three women, one of whom is actually a woman of color. So. Only one job in civil office. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think actually under this, you would technically be able to be both a U.S. senator and and a state senator, because I think it is purely at the federal level that this is enforced. Like, yeah, under the authority of the United States. Like, wow, that'd be double, really double dipping. Like, like I gotta go real fast, go, 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 go for my state. Go, go back. Yeah. Go back to the country. I, I'm sorry, I've got to leave Washington, D.C. and go to Albany. Um, like, well, I guess, <coughs> I guess the planes would be a lot faster now than back in, in the, the horseless carriage days or the, or the train days. It, well, yeah, the, it, I mean, the Constitution was just horse carriage, not horseless, even. Um, yeah, I forget how long it took George Washington to get from Mount Vernon to Philadelphia, but it was not a short trip. Yeah, because this is. Even before Washington D.C. time, yeah, yeah, uh, I believe the first president to actually live in Washington D.C. was Adams, who hated it. This, I think it'd be funny if he Washington because he he probably lives a lot closer to Washington. Virginia is a lot closer to Washington D.C. than it is to Philadelphia. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then they moved to New York, which is also not close. Um. Oh, next thing, the house gets to start money bills. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but the Senate has to approve them. I believe that is also originally from Parliament, but my knowledge of Parliament is shaky. Um. But this is a lot of, uh, how bills get passed and veto power and and so forth um including the pocket veto if i remember it, the most i know about most of my vetoed bill miles comes from the 70s cartoon i mean you know the 70s cartoon is not a bad simplification of section 7 of of article 1 you know it's it's clear it's concise it's this is how laws get made and it rhymes and it rhymes and now it's stuck in my head um but this also makes it clear that 
who votes how is a matter of public record. Especially now since it's televised. Yeah, well. We'll see. Have you ever wa actually watched the uh, C-SPAN channels? <laughs> Oh, I mean, first off, when I watch the conventions, I only watch it on C-SPAN because all I want is just to watch the convention, not to listen to talking heads. True. Um, but I also watch quite a lot of it on January 6th of, of uh, yeah, um, two years ago. Because, wow, that was, there was a lot going on on C-SPAN that day. Um... You know, and the thing is, is, is watching any job is kind of boring, honestly, if you're watching the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's, but most of, most of what really influences what laws get passed is not done on the floor of Congress. It's done in people's offices. Behind, behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. It's a lot of, I mean, yes, a lot of lobbyists, but even leaving aside the lobbyists, it's a lot of, you know... People having conversations, people making deals, people quietly reading. <laughs> That's gripping television, the quietly reading part. Because you'd hope that these people would actually read at least some of the text of these bills. Yeah, the most thing we see on TV, I think, was this, this guy votes for this, this guy votes for that. Yeah. And that's important, but, you know, the whole of what goes into making a law is not ever going to be broadcast. And even if it were, again, a lot of it just flatly wouldn't be interesting. Somebody's got to do the typing. And, you know, hopefully most of the people have read at least some of the text and not, not must-see TV. So basically, write me down. Two thirds of both. Two thirds of both things need to vote for it. If it's money, it starts. With, if it's money, it starts with the House. Anything else starts with the Senate. It matter. Well, most most laws are simple majorities, but for money, it's got to be two thirds. Um, which is part of where things are complicated right now. Um, because. They do have to get a supermajority to pass to to raise the debt ceiling, and the Republicans have decided that this is a hill they're going to die on. Um, which is going to shoot them in the foot because so much of their base draws government checks, but two thirds has to to pass to raise the debt ceiling. Um, so they've got to get not just every single Democrat, but a substantial percentage, percentage of Republicans on board with raising the debt ceiling. And then the president says yay or nay, or I like it, or mm -hmm. and then it goes back to the Senate, and it goes back to them, that they can override it. It's, 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 it's going to law no matter what. Yep. Very seldom is a presidential veto overridden. It happens, but it doesn't happen a lot. And you can tell a lot about a president by looking at the number of, of overridden vetoes he has. And that is all stuff that is possible to find. And then we go to the, the actual powers of the Congress. The actual powers of the Congress. And... What falls under these has been a matter of debate since 1789. Some of it is really obvious. Um, but we get back into, well, what is the common defense and general welfare? Um, like... Yeah, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin in the United States. Obviously. Okay, Congress decides what the penalty for counterfeiting is. But what is promoting the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors 
the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Like, yeah, that's copyright and patent law. So are but... Po so are post roads what the post office drives on? Post roads are toll roads, basically. They are... Um, generally speaking, though, in more recent years, um, the... Uh, the federal highway system has been decided to be part of post roads because there is that well it it holds the country together and it's you know common defense general welfare um yeah, i'm like it says it's out post office and post roads i'm like are they connected or something that are these the roads that the post office people have to drive on <laughs> i mean technically every road in the united states is a post road because it is federal law that the United States Post Office has to serve every single address in the United States. Um, which is one of the reasons the uh, Post Office is a more um, encompassing service than UPS or FedEx. But yeah, officially, a post road is a road designated for the transportation of postal mail, but in the United States, that is just literally all of them. Um, and the Congress can declare war. Congress can declare war. Only Congress can declare war. Now, Lyndon Johnson figured him out some ways around that, but legally and officially, only Congress can declare war. It's what's... what's so, like, so uh, I guess it, in technicality, were we at war with these countries or just invading them about, about the approval of Congress? Yeah, formally they were police actions. Well, send, the, well, send the police then. That is a recurring joke on MASH, yes. Because the Korean War was not a declared war. It was a police action. Likewise, Vietnam. Um, that got really dicey really fast. Um, I, I do love that you can tell how different our country is now from when the Constitution was written, that some of Congress's powers include granting letters of mark and reprisal, which is basically establishing privateers. And to that's, define it... That's like mm -hmm. legal pirates, right? Pirates, yeah, uh, privateers are legal pirates. They are pirates in the employ of a government who basically uh, attack the ships of a specific list of countries. Traditionally speaking, it's the English attacking the Spanish. <laughs> it's privateers. But also, uh, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas. You work for us, you work against us. Mm-hmm. Um. An interesting one that uh, probably will be changed by constitutional amendment in my lifetime. <laughs> To exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may, by session of the particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. That establishes Washington, D.C., And I believe that in my lifetime, there will be an amendment that will take authority of Washington, D.C. away from Congress. That seems to be the direction things are going there. Execution of execution of foreign powers, of foregoing powers. Yeah. Are there, I, I, was that, I, was that, I said only the Congress can execute the foreign foreign people. No. <laughs> no, but basically, it's saying any law that 
Congress needs in order to execute these powers, they have the authority to pass. Also, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof um, gets into prohibition because uh, the, the amendment gave Congress the power to pass legislation to enforce prohibition. So that would have fallen under Article 1, Section 8. You know, I forgot how long the first, the, how, how, how big the legislative branch was in powers. Yeah, well, and again, part of that is because they thought about this a lot. I mean, you compare this to Article 3. The, the judicial one? Yeah, no, yeah, the judicial one, which is just bitty. And, you know, Article 5, which is, and then we can amend things. Those are the ones where everyone's like, yes, that's a good idea. You know, I, I sum up the legislative as, ooh, Supreme Court, we should have one of those. And that's pretty much all the Constitution says. But these guys fought for weeks about exactly what the legislative branch was going to look like and exactly what the executive branch was going to look like. And so it is so detailed. Because they wanted to make sure that nobody took an inch more power than they were given. These were men, I get mostly, terrified of tyranny. And these also, also make sure we didn't make hit the same mistakes we had with the Articles of Confederation, too, probably. Right. Right. So you wanted to give Congress and the executive enough authority to accomplish literally anything but not so much that they would become tyrants. And so it's more compromise. Basically, anytime you want to know why something in the Constitution looks the way it does, it's almost certainly a compromise between two factions. Number nine. Uh, yeah. About the slave trade. Mm -hmm. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. And if you didn't know what that was about, you wouldn't know what that was about. Mm -hmm. And before then, they can be taxed, but not more than $10 a person. Okay. And that's $10 back then, not $10 now. That is $10 back then, and if you'll give me just a second here, I have bookmarked on my computer like a smart person, a site called the Inflation Calculator. So $10 in 1789... Uh oh, they won't let me do it. That's that's we'll we'll go with eighteen oh eight. That's because seventeen eighty nine is before they will let me do it. One hundred eighty seven sixty three. Only only a hundred dollars. Almost two, but yeah. That's still. That is still very little money. And that is the most tax they were allowed. What's worth noting is that for quite a lot of U.S. history, um, Congress has not really had much tax money to work with. It wasn't until the establishment of the income tax that Congress actually had any kind of real serious budget to work with by modern standards. They could pass tariffs, they could uh, tax... What was our phrasing again? Uh, per such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit. Um, but they are not allowed 
to tax very much. They're not allowed to pass direct taxes, and... Um... Yeah. Less than $200 a person in today's money. And also talk about taxes, too, because the old Congress couldn't, 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 couldn't tax anything unless the state approved. Yeah. All the states, all the states approved. All 13 states approved. Recall the Articles of Confederation flatly prevented Congress from levying any taxes. Like, like you think it's hard enough to get two-thirds of its degree on something... All 13 states at the time. All 13 states had to agree on everything. And none of the representatives from that state just had to be in a pissy mood. Because if you're having a bad day, sure, screw up the entire country. Because you can. Articles of Confederation are worthless. Um... Oh, and finally, last thing, no, no, no nobility here in America. Yep. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office or profit of, excuse me, office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, except of any present emolument office or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state, which means not only does the United States not have nobility, but if you are an American citizen, you have to get Congress's permission to accept a title from another country. Like, like, like to be knighted or something. Yeah. If, if Charles III wanted to knight me, which I can't see that he would, but let's go with it, I would actually have to get permission from Congress to accept the knighthood. And technically, that is not even just an, you know, a title. That is, if I wanted to get a, you know, an official government job from another. Now, in practical terms, you know, I got a quasi sister in law in Sweden, and I'm sure the U.S. does not care if she got a job working for the Swedish government. Um, I believe she works for the American embassy. But she could, if she wanted to, work for the Swedish government and no one would care. But technically, she has to have U.S. government permission. Um, and then basically, Section 10 is, states don't get to do any of this nonsense either. The states have to work together. Is basically what Section Ten is. Uh. Oh, they work together. Yeah, all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control uh, with a U because 1789 of the Congress. No state, state huh? Oh, sorry. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter en into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. So basically that's the, the, the ongoing battle between, between state power and federal power? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'd have to look it up to be sure, but I'm pretty sure that Section 10 is what Lincoln was drawing on in 1861 when he sent troops into the South. It's like, no, you don't get to just back out. You signed up to be part of this, and you have to work with us. Like, like imagine if every state could leave like, like, like an election. Right, exactly. They're so, why they left them, like, like, stop playing with that. Like, we like we don't like who came president. Let's leave. Mm hmm Speaking of president, <laughs> it, Article Two, which um, I'm I'm reading off the uh, National Archives, and anything that has been 
altered by a later amendment on the National Archives is in blue text. And so much of Section 1 are, are, of Article 2 is in blue text. Because so much of this has changed. But, um... Sentence 1. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. And that alone took so much fighting because some people there were a couple of people who were kind of holding out for an American king um and there were some people who wanted uh, a tribunal basically they wanted three people in charge and there were people who wanted life you know a, a term of life and there were some people who wanted five years and there were some people who wanted ten. And some people who wanted one, and can you imagine the chaos that would have been? And just... That is, again, so detailed through here, because so much fighting. So that's what we got. Two for, two for reps, four for president, and six for senate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Compromise. And you can tell that they expected senators to be more powerful than the president because the term for senator is longer. I guess the and this is establishing the Electoral College. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed elect an elector. Which means postmaster general cannot be an elector. If you are in a government job, basically, um, you cannot be a member of the electoral college. And then exactly how all of it worked got changed because they realized very quickly that the way they'd originally established it didn't work. Um, and within three elections, almost <laughs> like half of Section 1 had been changed. That was like the 12th Amendment, I think? Yeah. Yeah. I remember. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. It's basically, there will be a determined election day. And here, here's the difference here. I want, the senators and the, the, and the representatives can be, can, can be born foreigners, but the president cannot. Yeah. The president has to be... <sighs> Oh, cheerful phrasing. A natural-born citizen. Now, the important thing to notice here is that that's not defined. Clearly, that means somebody who is a citizen at the time of their birth. But, there have been multiple elections where exactly what constitutes natural-born has been a matter of intense conversation, and the courts have technically never clarified that. Um, we'll pick a relatively non-controversial example. John McCain. John McCain was born to two American parents in Panama. His father was, at the time of his birth, stationed in the Panama Canal Zone. Uh, I believe he was born in an actual Panamanian hospital, but either way, certainly he was not born within the borders of the United States. But wasn't at the time Panama technically United States territory at the time? Well, the Canal Zone was. All right. Um, the entire country was its own country. But the area immediately around the Panama Canal was a possession of the United States until relatively re within my lifetime. And obviously John McCain was older than I am. Um, so at the time that he was born, um, Panama 
was its own country, but the Panama Canal Zone was American held. But does that mean that he was a natural born citizen? Well, that depends on who you ask. Another, and and when I say uncontroversial, I want to make it very, very clear that I'm just talking about the circumstances of his birth and not his politics. But another uncontroversial uh, person to bring up in this context is Barry Goldwater. Um, notoriously of the slogan, in your heart, he know he, he's right, to which the response was, yes, far right. Um, but he was born uh, in what would become the state of Arizona. What is now the state of Arizona. What was at the time not a state. A territory. It was a territory. It was the territory of Arizona. Now, it was an American territory. Um, and became an American state. Does that mean that he was a natural born citizen? Well, probably. But at the time, that was not really a concept that was in anybody's mind. Um, Congress eventually passed a declaration saying that he was eligible to become president, but if somebody had challenged it to the courts, it's theoretically possible that he could have been declared not a natural-born citizen by purposes of the Constitution. Um, I always thought it was pretty clear that the reason people were arguing about whether or not Barack Obama, the child of an American citizen mother, uh, was really a citizen whether he was born in Kenya or not, while well, nobody was talking about how McCain was arguably not a citizen based on the place that even he admitted he was born, uh, kind of had one explanation of why we were having one conversation and not the other. And that reason started with an R and rhymed with acism. But natural born. Now, of, of course, there is an out here because technically... Um, I forget who our first person, our first president born a citizen of the United States was, but it might have been Martin Van Buren. <laughs> it was a while, because either it, way. Because everyone else was born as, as a citizen of, of, the, of, of the British government, because... Technically a subject, because people born in the UK are not citizens, they are subjects. But yeah, a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution. Because until 1789, there was no such thing as a citizen of the United States. Which means, theoretically, for 35 years, <laughs> there would be no president because literally no one was eligible. You know, I always thought that it was awkward when the... When the when, between Obama and Trump, when, you know, the, the, the former president has to introduce the, the the new future president to the house you know and like they'd be, they'd be nice to each other because oh yeah after, that was after eight years mm -hmm. of saying you're not you're not the citizen like like hi how are you doing new new elected president yeah things were really touch and go during that and um trump didn't want him to introduce him to the white house it was yeah like obama is uh, in some ways a better person than I am and was willing to be gracious and dignified and Trump didn't care. So, yeah, a lot happened then. The but there have been unambiguous cases of ambiguity, if you will, where there is no dispute that, yeah, that's a poser, all right. Huh. The same what? thing happened when he was leaving office. That the, the person who he quote quote claims stole the election. Yeah, as I recall, he just bailed and didn't run there for that, which is fine because it's not like Biden didn't know his way around the White House. Yeah. Oh, and, but and the and Beat says, yeah, it was Martin Van Buren who surprisingly spoke Dutch as a child. He did, in fact, because um, 
up until about World War I, there were still parts of the country where it was possible to have a European language that was not English as your native language, because that's what everyone in that town spoke. A lot of places in the Midwest and the Great Plains were German and Scandinavian languages. Um, but yeah, um... And, and finally, last thing I think is... Oh, oh, the exciting thing is about the uh, removal of officer dying. Mm-hmm. Next, Which... Another blue, another blue one. Blue text. And then the president will get paid. Um... They even get paid after they leave office, too. I yeah, think. Um, there is a pension. Um, that is not actually established by the Constitution. That is established by federal law. Because Ulysses S. Grant died desperately poor. Because Ulysses S. Grant was many things, and one of them was bad with money. And as he was dying of, like, throat cancer or something ungodly painful like that, Mark Twain helped him write his autobiography so that Grant's family wouldn't be destitute when he died. And that is why we have presidential pensions today. And finally, the last thing it says, will they have to be sworn in by the Chief Justice? I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, that's my ability, reserve, protect, and defend the country of the United States. Two things. Number one, it's not the not the Chief Justice. It can be anyone. Oh, okay. I don't know that. Yeah, Calvin Coolidge was sworn in by his own father. Only president to have been sworn in by his own father. Um, Because he was on vacation at the time. And... um. Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, was sworn in by, you know, a judge they grabbed in Texas because he refused to leave Texas until he'd been sworn in. Traditionally, it is the Chief Justice, and certainly if the president becomes president on Inauguration Day, uh, it is the Chief Justice. But... Over the years, there have been more than a few who were sworn in by someone else simply because circumstances were complicated. And Bede says, yuck, Calvin Coolidge. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not exactly his biggest fan either, but it is an interesting historical footnote that he was sworn in by his own dad. Who was, I believe, a justice of the peace. Um... Section two, uh, president is officially in charge of the military. But they can't. But they can't. But can't declare war. <laughs> right. You're in charge of it, but you, you can send troops yeah. to the places, but, you, but it's not officially a war unless Congress says so. <laughs> and this basically establishes the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, he may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments. Is basically the um, the cabinet. Um. You know, he has the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. Uh, which means only federal crimes for people who want to know why, for example, uh, Biden is not just pardoning everyone with a marijuana record. It's because legally he can't. Because most of those are state crimes. Uh, but he can't pardon in the case of impeachment. Um, he can make treaties, provided the senators agree with him. Note, it's just the senators. He can pardon impeachments? He cannot pardon impeachments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. So, like, if, like, if he was vice president, became president, after, and Obama was impeached, then he could, he could, they go around like, you're pardoned. Yeah. Yeah, any federal crimes that Obama was convicted of, or to use a non-hypothetical example, uh, when Gerald Ford became president, he 
pardoned Nixon for, you know, any federal crimes that Nixon might have co committed. But if N Nixon had uh, been impeached instead of, and removed from office, which everyone was very, very clear that they had the numbers to remove Nixon from office, but if he had gone through with it and been impeached and removed from office, um, Gerald Ford could not have pardoned him from that impeachment. So. That's why, that's um, why he quit first. It's it's a lot of why he quit first. He was not going to stick around to be removed from office. Um, you think that would, that would have been the only or only president we ever had impeached that would have actually got out, kicked out? Oh yeah, no. There are, there are interviews from the time with Republican uh, congressmen who were very very clear that they would have removed him from office. He did not have the numbers he needed to prevent a supermajority. It it was just going to happen, and everyone knew it. Um. Yep. Um, give the State of Union address. Um, any extraordinary other speeches. Uh, receive ambassadors. Basically, this is what the job of president means. Oh, oh, we skip. We skip the net one part of two where. It he, 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 the president appoints and stuff like 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 yeah. justices and stuff and other offices to be approved by the Senate because they're the ones who are really important. And, and, um, and thus it ends up the uh, the the fun power of president presidents appointing judge, uh, judges and, and kind of like nope. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I I I love the double standard they had in the last two elections where. First, they when Obama was leaving office, like, oh, we can't appoint, we, we can't appoint a, a we can't a, a justice during the election year, and the next when Trump was leaving office, but still, 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 all these people appointed. Before what, you... what do you mean? There's only three hours until the election. We can still appoint somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Nice double and, standards. <laughs> yeah, and he can fill vacancies that happen during the recess of the Senate. And then he, too, is subject to uh, removal from office for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So, you know, reasons. What are high crimes and misdemeanors? Meh. Doesn't say. Like I said, it's, it's, it's big, but I'm, it's not as big as the first one. Only four. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to the judges. So we have three. Yeah. Supreme Court. We should have one of those. Also some other courts. Courts are a good idea. And this is the power of the judiciary. Um, the interesting thing about Article 3 is that the most commonly thought of power of the Supreme Court isn't in it. Stuff. Yeah, well, to, to say whether laws are constitutional or not. Like, that like, is not technically a power of the Supreme Court. Like the uh, most recently abortion overthrowing thing? Yeah. Um, in 1804, I want to say, the Marbury versus Madison case is the one where the Supreme Court was like, it is up to the Supreme Court whether things are actually constitutional or not. And it makes sense for them to have that power, but it is not actually a constitutionally mandated power. Um, it's one that they decided they should have because uh, somebody should and it seemed like their job. Um, so, so why was the justice people so important that they, they, they need their own section of the Constitution? Well, it's very much the 
idea of the separation of powers, which is one of those like junior high kind of phrases where everybody learns it, but maybe what it means doesn't 100% stick. But it's basically, I'm going to use the phrase again, the founding fathers thought that it was important that everyone have somebody who can tell them no. And nobody have full power. And they had seen what could happen. And this is a universal they had seen because it's, you know, English case law from the time is, is a lot. Um, but they had seen what would happen if the executive or the legislature had control over the courts. And they firmly believed that the courts needed to be independent, which, you know, I've said a lot that you can tell that they considered the Senate to be the most important power in in Congress because it's a six-year term. And it's true that uh, Supreme Court justices are for life, but that was in theory so that they weren't beholden to political interests. In practice, not so much. I have seen that front line of the Thomases. Thank you very much. But the theory here... The problem is that there's just a little bit too much idealism in the Constitution in, wrong, in the wrong places. There's a lot of, well, but nobody would do that. And then along comes somebody who absolutely would. But the thing with the Supreme Court is it was very, very clear that there needed to be one court that was on top, controlling everything. Everything went through that court because there needed to be a final say. Because without a Supreme Court, theoretically, things could be in the courts forever. And it was whoever had the money to pay the lawyers longest wins. Supreme Court's at the top. Supreme Court is the last say in how law works in this country. And you'll notice that Section 2 makes it clear that things like um, cases affecting ambassadors, cases... Uh, controversies to which the United States shall be a partner, controversies between two or more states, between citizens of different states. Like, a lot of federal law has to be done not in a state court, but in a court that's above the state courts, that is separate from the states. Because otherwise, you know, let's say that um, I sued somebody in Idaho... Well, where the lawsuit is held is going to influence who is who is um who's got the home field advantage, basically. And so the idea of a federal court cuts off the power of the states in that specific way. And makes the power more balanced. Yeah. And then we, we could actually talk about at least two or three of the mo more controversial issues, like the one, the Dred Scott case. Oh, yeah. We're like, oh, uh, you're not a citizen. You're a property, so you don't get to Yeah, well, it, no black person. Dred Scott found that basically no black people have rights that any white person is bound to respect. That is that is not subtext, that is text. Cause Tawny was a terrible person. Um I I maintain that actually if you read where Roberts falls on a lot of decisions, it is very, very clear that he wakes up in a cold sweat at night sometimes being seen by history as being the next Tawny. Like that was the guy who voted for that. Yeah, well, that's that's the chief justice who wrote the Dred Scott decision. And Roberts does not want to be that guy. Roberts is not great in a lot of ways, but he knows the limits that he can push things to as far as conservatism before the entire U.S. is just not putting up with it. Because he has read Dred Scott. Thank you very much. I think that next one was the one that was overthrown by Board Brown, which was over. I forget what exactly it was, but it was overthrown by Brown. Plus E.B. Ferguson. Yeah. Plus E.B. Ferguson, separate but equal. Yeah. Um, and that's another like, uh, 
The Supreme Court is made up of individuals. How many individuals depends on what era, because if you'll notice, Article 3 doesn't say how many people are going to be on the Supreme Court. I think they had more... They've had more... There have been... The court has been bigger and smaller over the course of, of the last, you know, 200 and change years. Um, there are also, if you'll note, no qualifications for being a Supreme Court justice. The Constitution does not say what you have to do. If you're president and the Congress likes you, you're, you're in. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the thing they, they didn't really... <coughs> When they when they overthrew it and they, they like they realized, hey, this is this this isn't this isn't equal at all. The, the, the other side has a terrible school school board. And um, basically, Brown versus Board of Education found that separate but equal isn't equal at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Separate but equal is just separate. Um, interestingly, one of the one of the people who filed an amicus brief with the cons with the Supreme Court um, was my my historical nemesis, uh, Dr. Frederick Wortham, who did very very good work about um, the dangers that that segregation posed to children and the you know, effects of, of racism and all of these things, and also wrote, and this is why he's my nemesis, a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which is about the evils of comic books. Um, I have written uh, a full, it was years ago, but I wrote a full examination where I went through every single chapter of it, giving that its own um, its own article examining exactly everything that is wrong with seduction of the innocent spoiler it's a lot a uh, lot is wrong basically he's one of those people who are like pokemon and my little point of the devil mm -hmm. and he he came at it from the best of intentions but his research is terrible his oh he just mm, such such a bad book such a bad book. Um, and I, I will shoot you the link, and if you want to post it, because I don't really have access to the comments. Cool, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, it's, it's, it's sent to me on Discord, and I'll post. I will. I will send you the link to my series on Discord, and because it's a tag, it's in reverse chronological order, but that is my series about Seduction of the Innocent, which lasted quite a long time with me. I think I said five good things about it. Um, but he was also one of the people who filed a brief with the Supreme Court saying separate but equal is an inherently damaging system. So much as I hate the man... That is one thing he did really, really well. He He's the one who did the test where he gave uh, black dolls and white dolls to kids and showed that all children at the time inherently preferred the white doll and thought of it as better. And that was a result of segregation and separate but equal. So he did really good work there. Shame about the rest of his career. And finally, trials of all crimes. Except for impeachments, are, are by jury. Mm-hmm. Yep. Impeachment technically has a jury if you think about it. It's just that it's a jury of the number of states times two, because it's the senators. Finally, something about treason. Yeah. Treason is only levying war against the United States, against them, You'll note it's referring to the United States as plural, or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of, testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act, or on confession in open court. Yeah. Like, like, so, like you said, unlike the 
the le le legislative branch and, and maybe well, executive branch, the justice is pretty much simple. The justice is really simple. They all have the same basic mental image of what a court looked like. And so they don't have to go into the same exhaustive detail of what a court will look like, because everybody knew. And that's why the running joke with one of my friends is that my cat is technically constitutionally eligible to be a Supreme Court justice. Well, I, I, well if, if a cat can be elected mayor of a, of a, of a, of a city or, or a state, then pretty much makes sense. And he would not be more corrupt than some of the justices that we have and have had. Though I will say his his uh, decisions would all be meow. It's like, huh. Every, every person that has a right to a dead bird in their, on, their, on their plates... Mm hmm Everyone should have scritchies and be allowed outside. I'm sure I'm sure the bird congress would, would veto that. <laughs> yeah. Though to be fair, my cat is also scared of deer, so he's a lot less excited about being outside right now. Deer are big. He doesn't trust them. I probably have one if I was a, if I was a worship, worship the cats, I think. Or cats. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know I was until I was at my niece's house and I, I, I was playing with their kittens, you know, and like, mm -hmm. like, like, are you, you look red. I'm like, I, I do. <laughs> yeah. Found out. <laughs> um. At number four. Uh, Congress has to keep records of things. All of the actions of Congress have to be above board. I'm sure that's um, never been anything. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's why we have things like C-SPAN. That is tied to Article 4, Section 1, is, look, here is here is your government at work. Isn't it boring? Except when it's terrifying. Um, section 2. Um, your rights in one state are the same as your rights in other states, which... Mm -hmm, that's... Uh, well, that's... Iffy nowadays. Yeah. Always has been, really. Um, and the establishment of... Um, extradition between states being required. And then the blue part, uh, we're back to person held to service or labor. Basically, it's saying that you gotta return escaped slaves. Um, which no longer applies. It's funny how they had to, they had to read it. I think it was two, they, they, they had to make it two or three different laws about that later on. Because someone was following the yeah, law. the Fugitive Slave Act, and yeah. And the the more the southern states fought to have it enforced, the less happy they made the free states. So, um, ah, the, 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 the admission of new states. The admission of new states, um, and how you can't just make states out of bits of other states except West Virginia, which, you know, was during the Civil War. So, what do you do? All the people who would have objected to the existence of West Virginia were in rebellion. Um, and Congress can control their territory. Um, Congress, Section 4, Congress has to, the U.S. has to protect the states. Um... They've got to make sure that every state has a state government and protect against invasion. And, it, and basically, again, pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, we're getting into the stuff where they're like, yeah, this is this is pretty much it. Um, this one we talked a little bit about in the last episode, but... Yeah. Like... They knew what they wanted this part of things to look like. They wanted Article Five. They wanted there to be amendments. Because they, 
even then they knew everything we wrote in here. It, like, um, uh, not not be that not this might not be good in a few years. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, though you'll note, um, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article. Basically, you can't have a constitutional amendment against slavery before 1808. And I didn't, not until 80 years, 60 years later. Yep. Um, Article 6, the, the U.S. still has the debts that they garnered during the Revolution and under the Acts of Co Articles of Confederation. Like that would be for the federal, for no, no bankruptcy, don't start saying over from scratch again. Like, the last four years, mm -hmm. the last ten years didn't count. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that was one of the real problems with the Article of Confederation was the United States had taken on a lot of debt during the Revolution, which the government under the Articles of Confederation was required to pay despite having absolutely no way of raising any income. Like, like, like again, because all 13 states had, had to redo it. Right. So, um, basically this is saying, yes, okay, we'll pay that. Um, and the Constitution is in charge. It is the supreme law of the United States. Have we ever paid that back? Are we, are we, are we still in debt? Have we, have we paid that back yet? Or... I think we officially paid all of our Revolutionary War debt, but the thing is, is the United States' debt has been a constant thing for almost the entire history of the country. So what any specific debt that we have is... Uh, yeah, well, not to mention that some of the countries that we owe debts to don't exist anymore or have gone undergone multiple changes of government of their own, and yeah. Like, if we owed money to France, who would we owe the money to? Yeah, France has, France has a little bit, has, has had a little bit of government changes since the, the revolution. Yeah. It. France was undergoing some some times of their own in 1789. Like, and like in 1789, Prussia was a thing, and now it's, now it's Germany. Yeah, it's there was a lot happening, and yeah. Um. And here's here's a clause that doesn't get paid attention to in certain circles very much. No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Legally, constitutionally, you can hold any damn office in this country you want to, regardless of your religion or lack thereof. There are people who don't believe that. Uh, there are people who have enshrined in state laws religious tests. But those laws are legally invalid because the Constitution, by Article 6, is the supreme law of the land, and by Article 6, forbids religious tests. They have to be bound by oath or affirmation. Uh, they have to pinky swear that they'll uphold the Constitution. But they can't, you know, the, George Washington swore his oath of office on a Bible and said, so help me God. But that is tradition. And we read the oath, oath of office and so help me God isn't in it. And the idea of swearing on a Bible isn't in it. Like, Legally. It's like the Pledge of Allegiance ad under God later on. Yeah. Yeah. In my mother's lifetime. Um. Which I've pointed out to a few people who insist that our parents as children said the Pledge of Allegiance. It's like, well, my mom as a child did not always say under God. So, Yeah. Also, the only U.S. president who's tried to get um, in God we trust off U.S. currency was Theodore Roosevelt, who thought it was blasphemous. Finally, 
finally our goal is how and to, how to how to get this thing approved. Yeah. Only nine states. Well, they only needed to have nine in order for it to be official and formal. They need the other ones to agree to, 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 uh, just because. Well, in order to be part of the country, you had to ratify the Constitution. But in order for the Constitution to be considered valid, they only needed nine. Which was sort of, it was another one of those compromises. Like, it was there to kind of push the last few states that didn't really want to. So, um, so what's nine with the first, what's nine, at least two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so what's nine with the first ones that can part of the country? Oh gosh, I'd have to look that up. Uh, give me just a second here. Uh, that is, that is not a fact that I have memorized. As you may have noticed, I have a lot of facts memorized. That's not one of them. Uh. A timeline of drafting and ratification of the United States Constitution. Yes, that will work nicely. Um, and I can just scroll forward to 1789, because... Okay, so... Um, it was Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland... South Carolina, New Hampshire. So with New Hampshire, officially that's nine states. So that was the, that was the country into the other, other, other four mm -hmm. that came up later. Then Virginia and New York uh, are the two most important of the ones that are left, arguably. Um, uh, North Carolina and... In 1790, Rhode Island. A little Rhode Island held the longest. Yep. Um, officially, it was... The, the government uh, existed as of 1789. You know, the it was written in 1787. Officially took effect in 1789. Um, and... Well after everything had been going on. The Supreme Court had already convened by the time Rhode Island ratified it. So basically, you know, Rhode Island was part of the country until then. Mm hmm Less than a year later, we had a 14th state. Vermont. So, yeah... The Bill of Rights had been proposed already. You think that's what you think that's what Rhode Island was holding out for? <laughs> I mean, that was part of it, honestly. A, a lot of the debate in ratifying the Constitution had to do with the concept of a Bill of Rights, which the original argument had been that it didn't need because any right specifically mentioned might suggest to people um, that other rights didn't exist. Which I guess they, 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 they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you'll... The, the concept of a right to privacy is not enshrined in the Constitution officially and formally, but it is generally held to exist based on other things that are in the Constitution and in, in the Bill of Rights. Um, but the idea that it doesn't exist because it's not specifically mentioned is one of the reasons that there wasn't initially a Bill of Rights. Um, so, for, does anybody in, in the chat right now have any questions for our... Is, for our, our established guest, esteemed guest, whatever the word is. <laughs> well, wait, wait. You said you said you're a, you're a freelance writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I write for a volunteer film website called the Salute S O L U T E. 
It's a terrible name. I voted for something else. Um, I write an average of four articles a week. Uh, today I wrote about uh, unions in film history and on the sc mostly on screen. Um, I also um, mostly do the obituaries, which uh, I will say I have just found out that I have to write an obituary today because Tina Turner has just died. Um, yeah. I mean, she's not a young woman. These have been and, very bad years for celebrities. Yeah, well, I wrote an article a few years back about how really, yes, 2016 was that bad a year in celebrity deaths. We really did have that many. Like, what was the year that both, uh, Carrie Fisher and her mom died at the same same time. Oh, I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. And and you know, I I write a column on Sundays called "Celebrating the Living," and I'd already covered Debbie Reynolds, but I had not yet gotten to Carrie Fisher. So, um, yeah. So so you're so you're, so you're not a, a good co-writer for a, a fic, for for science fiction then. I some science fiction. Um, because I'm writing, this, I'm trying to write this novel, and I'm stuck right now. So I, I, <laughs> so I no, know. I get that, but uh, yeah, 2016. So that was that was that was a bad year. That was a lot that year. Um, let's see. I don't know if it's a question or not, but Bead says based and union piled. Uh. But anyways, yeah, what's come, what, what what do you have coming up on on, on, on your on, 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 on your own channel? But what's coming up in your future? Let's see. I've got. I'll be writing about the goofy cartoon "How to Dance" for Friday. Um. Sunday, uh, I'm continuing a series of Deep Space Nine themed articles uh, with an examination of Terry Farrell, who is uh, Jadzia Dax for Deep Space Nine. And then I'm taking a break from my Deep Space Nine articles because uh, I always do Pride for, um, for June. And so I've got people like Fanny Flagg and Alan Cumming. Um, and then getting back to Deep Space Nine in July with Cole Meany, um, who, to my knowledge, is not eligible for Pride. Funny fact, fun fact about Deep Space Nine, that was the only ever Star Trek series that I watched from beginning to end when it originally aired. I've actually done that for any, because um, at the time that Next Generation <laughs> debuted, it was it was after my bedtime. Well, so it was after mine too, but I, I keep me from when I was sticking out at my TV at at, at, at sticking out at my TV. Uh, I first watching DS Nine. I first watching started watching TGNG in a, eighth grade, but it always is already the fifth, it's fifth season. It was. I think it was about there for me. Um, maybe about second or third. I'd have to. I'd have to look it up exactly. But about then, yeah. But I went through a few years in the Deep Space Nine and Voyager years without regular access to TV. So, yeah. and then I watched all of DS Nine and then Voyager. I stopped watching sometime after Seven and Nine joined. I just I, know, I just got bored or whatever and just stopped watching it then. I will be getting to a Voyager tribute in a couple of years, but I've got to reconfigure some things because I realized I've already written about Kate Mulgrew. So. And I didn't watch Enterprise till years after it aired. I watched some Enterprise because I really like Scott Bakula, but it turns out I don't like Scott Bakula that much. And I, of course, I, I didn't watch the original series because I wasn't born yet. <laughs> right, likewise, likewise. And I, I, I didn't even know about the first few years of TNG until <laughs> later on. Literally, I remember being angry because I was sent to bed rather than being allowed to stay up to watch Encounter at Farpoint. So... I think I, I would have been seven or six or seven when that when that, when that originally aired. So I don't, so I probably too young to watch it then. 
Um, I would have been. I think I was in fourth grade, 1987. So yeah, I would have been just shy of my 11th birthday when when Next Generation yeah, debuted. I was seven in 87. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think first or second, second or third grade then. Yeah. And my older sister could stay up and watch it, and I couldn't, and I was mad. That's what I can tell you about the premiere of, Deep, or of uh, Next Generation. Okay. Well, as for me, this Saturday, Beadle will be back on my channel to talk about his favorite French kings. And on that the, and on England, they had no queens. Yeah. Salic Law. But he'll talk about more, more about the Salic Law this coming up this Saturday. What? Until then, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Bye. All right, welcome to Talking Time with Caffeine. The only podcast we, we, we take what no one's talking about and talk about it anyways. I think my headphones are dying, so while I get, try to find new ones, hopefully, I'll let the guest introduce himself. Hi, um, I'm Jill. I go by Jillian Wren. Um, I am kind of an amateur historian. I do a lot more about movies these days, but I have definitely done a fair amount of studying of history. Um, I am here today to talk about the amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Um, I believe we're going to be talking about the history of how and why they got passed. Um, I have done another podcast, but the last one I did, I talked about Blackbeard's ghost. So this is going to be a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, here goes nothing. All right. So first of all, how do you, how did you learn about the amendment? Basically school or stuff or, or what? It's a lot of school stuff. Um, I kind of, I mean, I went to a college that doesn't have majors, but if we did, my minor would have been in history, pre predominantly U.S. history. And then in the mumble mumble years since I graduated, I've done a fair amount of just continuing reading on the subject. Awesome. So let's get this All right. Let's see if now it took a while and a lot of things, but I think I, I think I made the slides to be. You know, yeah, it's it's I, in the slides are what I. I forgot how 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 well, uh, long these amendments are and. And try to put it in a box is a little tiny print like that. Yeah. Oh, and you know, because it's not just legalese. For some of it, it's 18th century legalese, which is even more dense and complicated. You know, some of those sentences, I don't know when or if they're going to end. Uh, how we change the Constitution. Now... What are amendments? How do they work? So our, our original form of government as a country was the Articles of Confederation, which didn't work. Just everybody very quickly knew that they did not work. And so in 1789, originally the plan was, we're going to alter the Articles of Confederation, except basically everybody sh sh showed up to the Constitutional Convention knowing they were going to throw out the Articles of Confederation and start over. 
But as they worked on the Constitution, they realized that they were not going to be prepared for every single legal eventuality. And to leave themselves sort of a loophole, it says in the Constitution that the document itself can be changed following, you know, fairly strict procedures and requirements so that if the entire country or a substantial enough percentage of it agrees that something needs to be part of the foundational documents of the country, then that can become a law. And the Bill of Rights, the first 10, were the compromise to get the Constitution ratified at all. Um, a lot of people did not like the Constitution, and one of the things they didn't like about it was that it didn't have a Bill of Rights. So the first thing we as a country did after really establishing ourselves was change our own rules to enshrine certain things as rights of citizens in the United States. Yeah, it says to change it, or to propose it, first you need two thirds of both houses, and then you need three fourths of the, of the, of the, of the Senate and the House and three fourths of the states. To yeah, do it. yeah, it is difficult to get an amendment to the United States Constitution ratified. You know, it was probably much easier when three fourths of thirteen and three fourths of fifty. Yeah, that is that is definitely true. Um, and but it's interesting if you note that the the number of amendments goes up faster the further along you get. It was ten for a really long time. And then it took until 1865 to get to, to number 13. Right. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my kid wanted fruit snacks. Huh. Um, so, you know, and then from 13 to to the the rest of them, just the, the pace of them has just been speeding up over the years. Yeah. Hey, so what amendment would you like to see? Um I mean, I'm I'm the kind of person who really would like a specifically set constitutional limit on corporate personhood. Um I would really like that defined as our national law. Here's what it, what rights and responsibilities a corporation in the United States has. Um, and keep them out of our elections because they're not people in that sense. That would be my first choice if I could pick one. So you, you, you don't, but you don't want to, uh, sh say Shell to be a, a voting person. Man, I live in Washington State right now. We got Jeff Bezos to worry about. One vote for Jeff, one vote for whatever he whatever he, he does. Yeah, one vote for Jeff, one vote for Amazon. Um, you know, at least uh, Bill Gates seems to be sticking to getting people vaccines, which I can definitely support him on. Well, let's talk about the one everyone knows about, at least well, the first. And that's number one. Yeah, people get a lot wrong about number one. People miss the important part, which is the first word. Congress. Congress. Shall make no law. Freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequences. It doesn't mean, you know, everybody's got to give you a platform. It means... And, this got expanded so it includes the states but that's a 14th amendment thing which we'll get to but it means the federal government cannot tell you what you can and cannot say what you can and cannot print um who you can and cannot associate with what you can and cannot believe um it is in the text of the 
con uh, the Constitution itself that there can't be a religious test for office. But the First Amendment was what made it, you know, it's legal in this country to believe whatever you want, even as a private citizen. Um, and this one, you know, the United States has kind of played fast and loose with freedom of the press since this was passed. Um, in the in the early 19th century, you get uh, sedition acts, and that gets really messy and complicated. But uh, in theory, the First Amendment is where all of the other rights are based. Um, especially the last part, to petition the government for redress of grievances. You have the right to tell your representatives that you don't like how your government is going. They don't have to listen to you, but you have a right to tell them that. Um, you know, in theory, this amendment means That's me again. Oh, sorry. Could, could you not hear me for a sorry second for there? That. Yeah. Um, well, I wasn't saying anything for a little bit too. So, but in theory, this amendment means that you as an individual have the right to think and believe and say what you want. And with that enshrined, that helps the government be the government that you want. I mean, you've got to convince a lot of other people to agree with you, obviously. But, you know, there's a reason they chose this one to be the first. It's, uh, it's, okay. It's, uh, so... So Congress can't make an official state religion. Yeah. Yeah. A state religion in the United States is unconstitutional. And part of that was religion in, it was still England for most of the, the colonial era, uh, didn't become the United Kingdom until the 18th century, I think. Um, but religion. It's the Church of England. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that stems from originally, you know, England was Catholic because that's kind of what Christian was. And then Henry wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't give him one because it turns out you can't get your marriage annulled when your wife's cousin has an army in the Vatican. Yeah, when your wife's uh, cousin or, or nephew, I think, yeah, nephew is a Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. And the king of... Yeah. So, you know, for the 200 years or so after what was called officially the King's Great Matter, religion in England was really complicated. Because years. Hey, you still can't be a Catholic and be King of England. You still can't. No, it is still illegal. If you look far enough along the line of succession, you'll see people who are left out because they're Catholic. And I mean, they're like, they would be 28th in line for the throne if they weren't Catholic, so it does not really matter anyway. But there are still, to this day, people who cannot take the throne of England because they are Catholic. And that was uh, after, what, James II, I think, they passed that law. Yeah, his son, when his son-in-law and, and daughter took over. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean religion in in England leading up to 1789 you know it depended on who was in charge and you got the the whole Cromwell thing and back and forth and this and that and waves of people trying to get away from whoever was in charge religiously in England at the time kept coming to to the colonies and 
and even we, and even then, look at Massachusetts. It wasn't freedom of religion for them either. It was freedom of for my religion and anybody else's. Yeah. Go I mean. Suck. Fuck there themselves. were one or two colonies that were freer of religion than the others, but there's a great book by Sarah Vowell called The Wordy Shipmates, which is about the Plymouth Bay colonists and their relationship to religion. And, oh, that's, that's messy. And very much, you have the freedom to worship the way we want you to. Yeah. Um... And the line they were walking, trying to uh, please England enough so they didn't have their charter revoked, but still do what they wanted to do and what they believed they were called upon by God to do. And so basically the First Amendment was like, look, we're avoiding all of that nonsense. You believe what you want to, we don't care. And in... Um, I think it was the 1800 election, there was a congregation that voted, uh, like Baptists or something, that agreed to vote for Jefferson over Adams because they preferred an atheist to an Episcopalian and felt the atheist was more likely to leave them alone than the Episcopalian was. So, you know, the the relationship the founding fathers had to religion was not the way a lot of people picture it today. It was a lot messier. You mean it wasn't a Christian nation? Oh, man. I, I want to slap those people with a copy of Thomas Jefferson's Bible, which he edited to leave out the, uh, and the, this is a, a direct quote, obvious exaggerations by Jesus' biographers. Which includes the resurrection. Thomas Jefferson edited a version of the Bible that leaves out the resurrection. You know, good Christian stuff. <laughs> yeah. And also, also I, I like to point out to people, you know, if we ever, like, if we, if we ever get a state religion, and what what if one day that a state religion isn't the religion you like? So you're you're out of luck then. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, say uh, majority religion. Okay. All of a sudden, all, maybe all of a sudden Muslims are in yeah. the United States. What what a lot of people don't realize is that these early anti-church and state laws were passed at least as much to protect the church as to protect the state. Because they knew at the time very, very well how a church that believes a fairly slight difference from what you believe can still make your life as a person of faith miserable. You know, broadly speaking, these were all groups that believed the same rough thing. And some of the differences in theology are so exhaustingly nitpicky. Like, yeah, I know the, the you're not a real Christian thing yeah. from, from like Quakers, Catholics, whoever, yeah. Orthodox. But I mean, these were even just different kinds of Protestant. You know, the, the, the Plymouth Bay settlers were going from what was at the time a Protestant nation to form their own slightly different Protestant area. <laughs> You know, these were not yeah. these were not extreme differences in a lot of cases. They were points of doctrine that would probably take half an hour to explain to get someone today to fully understand them. But it had been bad enough for them to cross three thousand miles of ocean. Yeah, I'll talk about the same topic too. It's it's like when people say. We, we took away prayer from school. No, no, we didn't. The kids can still pray. They want to. I, I, I prayed a little bit yeah. when I was still a Christian and thing, but it's just the teacher cannot make you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a, uh, there was a court case not that far from me about a coach who was making the kids pray. And it's like, no, he doesn't get to lead the team in prayer. That's the point. The kids could pray yeah, but, if they choose yeah, to. But, yeah, if if a, if a kid wants to say a say a silent prayer, like please don't get my head knocked off in this in this next football game, right? Thank you. No, because it's please God. Thank you. They can. Yeah, absolutely. So you know the 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 idea that 
the separation of church and state is there to protect the state from the church is exactly backwards from how it was originally intended. And I think it's just as valuable in both directions. But the people who wrote these laws would be bewildered by this attitude that the state should reflect your specific religious beliefs and that that's the important problem as opposed to preventing the state from making your religion believe a thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Freedom of spe speech. I mean, you can say stuff, but like I said, you can't like go out there and I heard this, I heard this argument before. You can't yell fire or something. Yeah, it, it's, no it's a misquote. The, the statement is supposedly you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And it's you can't falsely yell fire in a crowded that, that, theater. That's what I meant. Yeah. And the thing is, is you aren't protected. There's a lot of back and forth. There has been for, you know, a couple of centuries now about exactly how far your right to freedom of speech goes. Um, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that um, my right to swing my fist ends where the other man's nose begins. So I can't go around lying about you all I want to. That's illegal. You know, I would suffer consequences from doing that if it could be shown that what I said had damaged you. Now, I can call, you know, for example, one of my exes, I can call him a waste of space and no one can do anything about that because that's a statement of opinion. And I'm entitled to my opinion and I'm entitled to express it. But... If, God forbid, my ex owned Facebook and banned me for saying on Facebook that I thought he was a waste of space, he'd be absolutely within his rights. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. If you look at, like, a few years ago, like, when they banned the ex-president yes. from Twitter and Facebook, is, is it, is it, it's... It's Twitter was not a public square statement. It was a privately owned company. Yeah, absolutely. You you don't have the right to someone else's platform. That is not what the First Amendment says. And and I think that is one of the biggest misunderstandings about the First Amendment, right up there with the whole religion thing, is the idea that just because I'm entitled to free speech and entitled to freedom of the press, that means that you have to let me say what I want to in your platform. Yeah. Be like, I can mouth off to a cop all I want. Yeah. Good luck with that. Um, you know, and, and legally, that, that's one that's going through the courts right now is how much right you have to, um, satire of the police the the onion actually wrote a brief to the supreme court defending your right to satirize the police because we live in the weirdest timeline yeah not that i agree that everything the police does nowadays but you know i'm not gonna nothing off to them yeah well i mean i'm i'm a mentally ill person i'm very circumspect around the police Mentally ill people don't come off well opposite the police. But, you know, even leaving that aside, you still have the right to say whatever you want to about the police. How and where you say it is something you need to be careful about. But there is no law on the books saying that you can't criticize the police because that law would be unconstitutional. Uh uh, next one, the press it is so is liable. I think it's called li liable. Liable. Libel. Is, that, is that protected against the constitution? No, or not? no. Libel is not protected. False speech is not protected. Um, especially again, if it causes demonstrable harm. The the standards of libel, and I am not a lawyer, but the standards of libel vary based on how public a person they are. Um. 
my right as a private citizen to be protected against people making out, up outrageous claims about me is different than Joe Biden's, for example, or even Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is a public figure. I am not. Um, like like a certain someone slapping someone during the Oscars. Yeah. Um, I could say whatever I want to about that event. Even if I if I ran a newspaper, I could print whatever I wanted to opinion wise about that event. And unless one or the other of those parties could prove that I had acted with actual malice, like intending to hurt them, and that it had caused them harm, they can't do anything about it. Now, if I did that about you, because you are not, you know, a celebrity who is on billions of television screens around the world. I can't really fight that much. <laughs> not last I checked. Um, the standards about what I can get away with are different because you are not a public figure in the same way. So libel is its own kind of separate issue. But um, and in the United States, actually, it is considered an absolute affirmative defense against libel and slander charges that something is true. So you cannot sue for libel or slander if what the person said is, if they can prove it's true, then you cannot win that lawsuit. No matter how harmful the thing is, that it's true is a defense. But um, other than that, you know, Freedom of the press is freedom of the press. Um, the, the Pentagon Papers back in the 70s were a big test case about this. How much were they allowed to print of these um, leaked documents? It's, it's back in the news again, the leaking of documents. Um, you know, someone smuggled out a ton of Pentagon uh, papers from the Pentagon about the war in Vietnam talking about um, how pretty much all of the reasons we were there were shown to be false or exaggerated or based on misinformation and how arguably we were doing more harm than good. And the Pentagon had all of this information and they were keeping it so that they could keep fighting the war in Vietnam because the Pentagon's going to Pentagon. And there was a case about, well, did, for example, the New York Times have the legal right to print these these papers? And the answer was yes, in fact. Yes, they did. Uh, and finally, the, the freedom of... Oh, hello from Canada. Hello. Uh, so it's, 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 it's right to the people to peacefully assemble. Peaceably is the important word there these days. So, and, yeah, throwing a throwing a rock in the window, I guess that that makes it. Yeah, happen. you know, hitting people with fire extinguishers and breaking windows and pooing on the speaker of the house's desk and things like that are generally not considered peaceably assembling. Uh, Supreme Court has also held that you have to, they can require you to have a permit for your assembly. You can be required to have a permit for your march so that, for example, uh, and this has come up in, in my town, the town where I live now, we used to have May Day marches and they would never get a permit because they were anarchists and it's a whole thing. But where they marched was really close to one of the local hospitals. And they wanted to um, know where the march was going to be so they could reroute ambulances. And you can be arrested for, you know, not getting a, um, a 
permit for your march. But if you can show that they are deliberately blocking permits for marches based on, for example, political reasons or, you know, they don't like your ethnic group or religion or what have you. I mean, good luck, but you can sue. That, you know, if you can show that your government is being unjust in that, then you can get redress, but it is legal to require a permit. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, much as we, that, that includes, said that, that includes people we may not agree with too, like, there's feet in, like, the KKK. They can yeah. assemble, we might not, we might not, not like it, you know, but. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, is that right? I'd say they have they have the same constitutional amendment, uh, same constitutional rights as everyone else. Um, odious, yes, yes, they are, but they still have those legal rights. And if we the the danger of course, of course always, once they, of course once if they start say lynching somebody in the middle of the, the protest, then that's a little different story. Yeah, that is not a peaceable assembly. You know, what uh, What you get away with may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But if you stop being peaceful, then you are legally considered to be forfeiting your First Amendment right of freedom of assembly. I think my favorite recent example of this is uh, two years ago or three years ago now, I think, when the when when they when they were uh i think they're peacefully civil when they were thrown out of the church so the president could yep. get a, a bible pick yep upside down oh yeah because he's a good christian yeah all right that's one there's another the next one is something a lot of people will like to talk about too number yep two. number two and, you know, my favorite story about number two is I had, I was, I used to pick my son up at his bus stop and there was another parent there who I would talk to occasionally. And I mentioned something about um, the first clause of number two, the well-regulated militia part. Because that's, again, the, the part that people don't, seem to remember is there and he asked me when they had added it and i told him 1789 and he didn't believe me and then i pulled out my pocket constitution because of course i own a pocket constitution uh well for one thing the aclu was giving them away free a while back and i ordered one because hey free constitution but the well-regulated militia thing what people don't remember is we didn't have a standing army in 1789. There was no United States army. Part of that was under the Articles of Confederation. We couldn't pay for one. Just because then the states would agree. Right. The, the federal government had no power of taxation under the Articles of Confederation. It relied basically on donations from, from the states. And if the states did not want to donate, um, they didn't. And so we didn't have a standing army because we couldn't pay for one. Yeah, this was back during the days of who has more power, the federal government or, or the each individual state? Yeah. Are we a country of are we, are we a country of different will are we a country of different states or are, are we at one it's, country? It's been pointed out by people more knowledgeable than I am that one of the interesting differences post Civil War was in grammar. Yeah, I've heard that. Because I've it went that. from the United States are to the United States is. Um, but because we didn't have a standing army, it was basically, you know, you never know when you might need to defend your home from the British. And also, another thing, I, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's that relevant or not, that to culture of times, too. Yeah. Back then, people had need, not this for perspective. People need guns to get food. Right. There you was know, a lot of there was no, a lot of hunting. Yeah, there was no we can't go to Walmart to get a right. steak. We had to go kill. And depending steak. on on where you were, there were dangerous animals. You know, 
Um, if if it was a choice between, you know, even if you were not hunting and you were raising, you know, pigs and beef cattle and and what have you, but there were bears in your area. Yes, you were going to want, you know, to be able to kill the rattlesnakes and the alligators and and depending on who you are, the traders too. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, so a, a lot of the uses for guns at the time were a lot more practical than I have a gun because I can have a gun. Also, let's be real, even when we did first have a standing army, uh, the U.S. standing army was not notably better equipped than it was possible for the average citizen to be. Um... I personally couldn't make a cannon, but I know people who can. Um, Renfair will do that for you. That's another thing I, I, I like about people. They think, uh, maybe I'm not, this is their opinion or, or my opinion, but they think only a, only a, a little handgun is the same thing as owning a Magnum bazooka. Or a fighter jet, you know? <laughs> like. My my friends may be skilled, but I don't think any of them can build even like a a B two bomber by themselves. Yeah, but it's my right to own this B two bomber and fire it whenever I want to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so it it was a very different culture. There were very different needs, and a lot of of supreme court decision ink has been spilled on things like the placement of commas in this amendment because it is not as clear as i would like even if i were a strict constructionalist which i am so not the construction is bad from a grammar standpoint and it's ambiguous and yeah, my dad owned my dad owned the gun, but he didn't go around doing stuff with yeah, it. Yeah, I've know? I've known people I consider to be safe gun owners and people I've considered to be actively dangerous gun owners. And more than a few in between. And I just we need common sense gun legislation has long been my stance and the problem is because of how the second amendment is written it is possible for even the most common sense gun law to get stricken down as violating it because who the hell even knows what it says yeah i don't think i i like people who say we should like uh, like like if someone says we should help like make it harder for certain people to get like crazy people with guns or harder we get harder to uh like get guns to kids and they're like they're gonna yep. take away all my guns no i yeah. did not say that well and, and i we had a couple of of gun control legis uh amendments here um uh, initiatives i mean here in washington a few years ago and i got a call that i am 99 percent certain was an nra push poll um asking me about these initiatives and one of the questions they asked was if i wanted to keep guns out of the hands of uh law-abiding citizens or and this is a direct quote which i still remember dangerous mentally ill people now a couple of points here number one the law they wanted to keep from being passed would have required background checks and if you can tell me how to keep a gun out of the hands of a mentally ill person without a background check proving their history of mental illness I'm all ears. Number two, mentally ill people are far more likely to be the victims of violent crime than the perpetrators of violent crime. And number three, I am mentally ill. I'm bipolar. It's one of the reasons we don't have a gun in my house, because the highest risk for having a gun in your house is actually an increased risk of suicide. And I'm not saying I would, but I'm saying this is the kind of thing you need to be aware of. And I did not yell at the person who was doing this poll. 
that I was taking part in on the phone, because I was also fairly sure she was just doing her job. And as a person who has worked in phone service, I don't... But I like it how they say it. It says, they put all in one word. Normal citizens and that... Yeah, this. yeah. Mentally ill people are not citizens, apparently. Which is uh, news to me. But, you know, again, I didn't yell at this person, but I was like, yeah, I see what's happening here. And then I ranted about it to all of my friends. But the, the fact is, you know, we can't we can't do anything with guns without it being at a Second Amendment risk because the amendment is short, ambiguous, and over 200 years out of date. Because, I mean, define arms. Do you have a right to a musket? Do you have a right to a bazooka? Do you have a right to a nuclear warhead? All of those count as arms. And it gets to a point where everyone agrees the average citizen shouldn't have it. But where that point is changes wildly based on the stance of the person you're talking to. Yeah. All right. Next one, I think I don't think it's as controversial, but let's find out. <laughs> there has literally never been a Supreme Court case that relied on the Third Amendment. The Third Amendment is the least controversial amendment in the entire uh, Constitution. No, I guess I, I'm guessing this took place when during the, the revolution, British people were like, "Hey, I, I live here now." Well, it, there were no barracks. There were no during the colonial era. There were no barracks, so the soldiers stayed in private homes. They stayed in inns. They stayed, you know, wherever the the army decided to put them. And sometimes people were compensated, and sometimes they weren't. And it was a really complicated issue, you know, for, say you ran an inn and it was your livelihood and, oh, wait, suddenly three quarters of your rooms are being taken up by soldiers and you're not getting paid. And so it's a very, very important issue in the 1780s. And just never comes up. There have been a couple of people who have tried Third Amendment challenges, but there has never been a case heard by the Supreme Court where the results depended on the Third Amendment. Uh, number four. This one is, I believe, based on Old English common law, which a lot of American law is, except in Louisiana where they do the Napoleonic Code. Um, and it's basically why the police have to get a search warrant. And why they have to get an arrest warrant. And, you know, basically there has to be a paper trail so that we don't have people being disappeared into, for example, uh, prisons run by, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which apparently was happening for a while under Charles II. Charles I. Charles I. Oh, the one that got Yes. Um, yeah. I earned this from back in the 80s and 90s when I used to play when I, uh, on school computer. I used to play Carmen San Diego, yes. and sometimes I got the warrant and kind of got away. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's basically taking the risk that sometimes people will get away, so that the innocent are protected. <laughs> it, 
yeah, Charles and Parliament, that was a whole big thing. Um, the, uh, the whole balance in criminal law is between the risk of damaging the innocent versus the risk in uh, letting the guilty go free. And the consensus has historically been, we would rather let the guilty go free. Um, and the Fourth Amendment is one that is, again, in the law or in the news right now because it turns out that I guess they just give away classified documents as napkins in the White House. Based on everything I can tell. But certainly no one's no one wants to do away with this one except for, you know, certain extremists who just want everybody locked up who isn't them personally. Uh, yeah. Uh, number five. This one I've heard a lot of times. Yeah. I was actually just watching a, a Rockford Files episode the other day that relies on this one. Um, and I don't I don't remember if this is still true or not, but in theory, if you are held in contempt before a grand jury, you can be locked up until the end of the grand jury session. And then in theory, you could just it could just keep happening and you could be in prison for contempt indefinitely. And the reason it came up was that Jim was using his Fifth Amendment rights to try to avoid testifying because the guy didn't believe what he was saying. And so, you know, Fifth Amendment is very, very important. And the important thing is standing on your Fifth Amendment rights is not intended to be a proof of guilt. You know, if you don't want to testify, you legally don't have to testify and it doesn't mean you're guilty. It just means you are choosing not to guilt to yeah, testify. It means it mean because you know you never know. You might say something which you think is innocent, but they could some people could like uh, use right. that right. Something. Um, you know, and it, and it does mean that you. This also enshrines your right to trial by jury. You know, to to um protection from double jeopardy you can't be tried twice for the same crime which the movie double jeopardy is not how it actually works but the concept is there you cannot be tried twice for the same crime um yeah, I, you know, we're fast i did not know those were part of the same amendment yeah yeah this is basically yeah never talk to the cops without a lawyer even if you're even if you're innocent always ask for a lawyer um I went to, to court on a traffic ticket once and asked for a lawyer because I am not a lawyer. Um, basically, the Fifth Amendment is the single most important amendment as far as your rights in the criminal justice system. The last time I saw that in a movie was, did you ever, have you watched uh, No Way Home yet? Yes, yes. Where Aunt May and MJ are like, don't talk about my lawyer. Yeah. When they're going by. Yeah. Because, because you know, Peter would say oh say, say something stupid. You know, I I, the first science lesson I remember learning, I learned from Peter Parker at the age of about four or five. I learned which one was stalactites and which one was stalagmites, in a Spider-Man comic in electric and uh. Electric Company magazine. But Peter is still kind of dumb. Like, Yeah, he might be scientifically smart, but he's not that. Yeah, uh, yeah especially, you know, current uh, Peter is teenage Peter, who is a teenager, and therefore there's a lot of stuff he does not know. Uh, number six. Trial by jury. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, I don't think there's one of I don't think the one is 
speedy trial. I don't think that's that thing anymore. <sighs> the thing about speedy trials, it has to be as speedy as they can get it. And the court system, you know, is busy. Part of the problem is we do not have enough pu public defenders. A lot of the problems that we have today in the court system would be handled better if we had about four or five times as many public defenders as we do, because there are a lot of them who basically don't have time to consult with their clients before cases, and there's a lot of problems there that I am not entirely qualified to talk about. But if it takes, you know, six months worth of motions and what have you to get your case, but you're still going through the process of the courts the whole time, that is considered a speedy trial. What basically it means is they can't just, you know, not do anything with your case because they don't feel like it. And then 10 years later, you, you know, get put on trial for something that's been hanging over your head this whole time. Um, you know, I, I served on a jury earlier this year, and that was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed it. Can you talk about it, or is that, that illegal? Oh, no, I can talk. Now that the case is over, I can talk about it all I want to. You just can't talk about it during, during the trial. Was it for like a, a simple, simple No, simple, it was, was a it, criminal like a... case. Um, it was a, the guy had, was up for the third time for violating a restraining order. Uh, we didn't fully find out why the restraining order was in place because it had been put in place by the state and not the victim. But w reading between the lines, it was domestic violence. He had been in prison twice and done domestic violence counseling twice for violating a restraining order against someone else. And he claimed that he needed to be there to help his, his fiancé, they were still engaged, with her kids. Only when he was busted, he was sitting around on her couch smoking weed and watching the Mariners. So uh, we found him guilty. <laughs> It was, it was quite the experience, and I thought it was fascinating. I, you know, being part of the system like that was, was a whole side of things. And there were three true crime enthusiasts on our jury, too. So we all knew a bunch of stuff about the law because true crime. So it was a, a unanimous decision? No, no, no holdout. It took us, it has to be unanimous in order for a guilty verdict to be to be determined and it took us I think, two or three hours to come to a verdict and that was partially because one guy felt really bad for her kids and wanted a better outcome and we pointed out to him that we couldn't do anything about that all we could do was get this guy out of the house that was all our job was but it was our job and it is an important job you know, I find the whole, the jury is made up of people too smart to get out of jury duty thing really frustrating because the system falls apart without people being willing to be on jury duty. And if the smart people all get out of jury duty, that means that should, God forbid, you end up on trial, then the jury of your peers is not the smart people uh, and it also says sorry, come on. yeah it, says, it also says they, they have the right to be informed of their crime and accusation yes so you can't just arrest somebody for the, for the hell of it yeah yeah and and there, there are a lot of countries we could name where people are imprisoned for years without ever finding out why they've been put in prison. And in the United States, then they have to tell you when they arrest you, what they're arresting you for. And oh, also, I, I, the, the last one, this is the one where you, you, can, you get the right to a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And, and how we've seen right to counsel has changed over the years. 
Um, currently, you have a right to have a lawyer with you through the entire process. And if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. But that has not always been seen as your right. For a lot of years, you had the right to an attorney. And if you were poor, good luck with that right. I guess also, what else is there? Da, 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 da. Oh, to be confronted with the witnesses against them. So I, I guess you had the right. To, some, so you have like right to, yeah, confront your witness. Well, it, it's you have the right to to cross examination. Okay. Yeah, your 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 lawyer. Hopefully, you have a lawyer. Do not defend yourself. Just don't. Um, but your lawyer has the right to cross-examine your witnesses. In most jurisdictions, not all, I don't think, but in most, you have the right to discovery, which is, uh, those of us who have seen My Cousin Vinny can tell you, um, you have, your lawyer has the right to look over what information the prosecution has. You know, you can, your lawyer can even talk to the prosecution witnesses in advance of the trial. You know, you have the right to all of that information so that you're not going in. The, the cliche of the surprise witness, uh, depending on your jurisdiction, not even the defense could have surprise witnesses. In a lot of places, the defense, the, the prosecution has right to discovery. And any surprise witness is just going to get thrown out. Uh, number seven. Yeah, this one could use a little bit of revision because twenty dollars. But in theory, in a civil, in any civil case where the uh, the value of the controversy is more than twenty bucks. You can have a jury trial. Now, in practice, I forgot how much small claims court goes to, but small claims court is just a judge, and most people are fine with that. But in theory, your constitutional right says you can have you can have a jury trial for that piddling little amount. Like, all right, like like you like you like you owe me twenty five dollars for lunch. No, like take you to court. Yeah, try, try. in in theory, it would be not worth your time and money, but in theory, you could do a jury trial over twenty five dollars for lunch. I I think that's pretty much basic. Yeah. The, besides the amount thing, I don't think that's changed too much. No. Number eight. This one. The big debate with number eight is what constitutes cruel and unusual. Because back in the 70s, the Supreme Court threw out the death penalty for a while as being cruel and unusual. And then it was decided that that was because of how the death penalty was done at the time not the actual methods of execution but the the court proceedings and then that got overturned a while later but it wasn't retroactive so there were a bunch of people uh charles manson most famously was given the death penalty but his death sentence was thrown out by this that supreme court decision and then when the law changed again, it wasn't retroactive. So he died in prison in an old and not stable man. But what's excessive, what's cruel, what's unusual, those are all really, really vague. And as the last one showed us, setting what excessive was, you know, theoretically could mean that it was illegal to have any fines over a hundred bucks, which 
for someone on my income is one thing, but for like a major corporation, uh, yeah, they can afford a bit more than that. So it's good that it's left vague, but that has caused a lot of back and forth over and the years. And the, they also have different prices for different types of crime, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and the debate about cash bail these days um, stems in part from an Eighth Amendment discussion. Um, because for a lot of people, cash bail is excessive just full stop and and not being able to have it uh makes things worse because then they lose their jobs and it's just you know even when they're later found not guilty they're still out so of all cash the means you have to pay, pay you still, that means you have to pay in cash or what yeah well it means that instead of um you know an ankle monitor or some other method of of tracking the person if they've been released from from jail waiting for their trial um they have to pay actual money to get out of prison and yes you get your bail back but if you've lost your job and and all of that in the meanwhile that doesn't do you a lot of good and that's what people bill jumpers that someone pays their bill and they leave them and yeah. those people are out of, out of yeah, uh, most private detectives make most of their money tracking bail jumpers. Um, I I knew one once, actually, who used to hang out in the public library doing, I mean, this was the late 90s, so it wasn't Google yet, but doing internet searches looking for people who had skipped bail. And that was what he did all day. <laughs> But That's... yeah, what's excessive? What's cruel? What's unusual? Number nine. Basically, just because it's not in the Constitution doesn't mean you don't have that right. And this one comes up a lot in right to privacy discussions because the right to privacy is not explicitly a constitutional right. You know, as we go through these amendments, we will not find a constitutional right to privacy. But per the Ninth Amendment, uh, there's no, there's nothing that's, you know, there's no rule that says you can't have a right to privacy. Just as it is not in the Constitution that dogs can't play baseball. All right, so I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Yep. The last one of the Bill of Rights? Um, basically says the uh, um, if it's not in the Constitution and it's not banned by the states, whatever you do, you. Has that ever been an issue at all? Um, it comes up occasionally, um, especially in the, the gray area between what's federal power and what's state power, um, which is who has more power has gone back and forth a lot over the years. Um, you know, it, it comes up, let's, it comes up a lot more often than the Third Amendment, but a lot less often than the first or the second or the eighth, for example. Yeah. Like, would last year's uh, Supreme Court abortion thing be a thing like that? Yeah. Yeah, this is another one that kind of ties into the right to privacy and things like that, where it's like, well, you know, the, there's no constitutional law against it. Do the states have the authority to regulate this or do they not and you know it's it's i think that's another place where we're going to have to end up getting a constitutional amendment at some point and boy good luck with that just because uh in polls the majority of people are at least vaguely pro-choice doesn't mean they're gonna pass a constitutional amendment 
uh, enshrining the right to abortion. Number 11. But this is one of the ones that I just, I'm just not enough, I'm not enough of a lawyer to fully understand the 11th Amendment. It's a lot to do with uh, who can sue the United States, who can sue which states, can the states sue one another, can the U.S. sue states, can states sue the U.S., I don't know. You know, there are whole classes in law school that are basically the 11th Amendment. Uh. And it came up because it was one of the big questions in the early, you know, this is 1798. We hadn't even got a full decade yet. But because it was the, the transition from the Articles of Confederation, where it was all state, no federal, to the Constitution, which is some state, some federal, there was, there was a transition going on. Well, I, think that, I think one of the big things like this time was probably the battle between, I, know, I think I've heard this before, like, like when, like when New Jersey and New York were battling over the river rights of the... Yeah, yeah. And there were, there were some trade routes that, you know, one state had assigned to one place and then the federal government gave someone else a monopoly and, you know, they weren't used to working together yet and so that got all messy and complicated and then when the 11th amendment got passed all of the lawsuits about the whole issue just got thrown out blanket because they were all covered by the 11th amendment go away <laughs> <laughs> number 12 number 12 okay yeah there he is yeah so it turns out that the way that we used to elect president and vice president was kind of the loser became vice president. Yeah, it was it was complicated and had some results that we didn't intend it. And uh, it turns out that in all of the fighting about the phrasing and so forth of that part of the Constitution, uh, we left in some pretty serious errors. And so the 12th Amendment is just like, let's let's fix that and let's make it as clear as we can, which is why it's as long as it is, so that there is no arguing about all of this. Yeah, it's like before, like if it's still in effect that, if it's still in effect today, that would mean Biden would be president and Trump would be vice president. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, but basically, yes. And so that's how we ended up with Aaron Burr as vice president. And uh, boy, he and Jefferson did not get along at all. And Jefferson cut Burr out of power. And it's this whole big, complicated thing. Especially after the vice president killed a guy. During yeah, the no. Killing, yeah. <laughs> it's, vice president kills a secretary of the treasury. That always looks good. And then he ran off to the south and committed treason. And yes. Aaron Burr was a fascinating guy. Um, and, you know, I, I tend to joke that you can tell how much discussion there was about any given part of the Constitution by how long that section of the Constitution is. Like, nobody debated the importance of a Supreme Court, which is why that article of the Constitution is so short and basically says, we should have one of those. Um, so, you know, how much longer? And everything else about it is just left out. Um, what the requirements are, how many people are going to be on the Supreme Court, it's there's nothing. So the Twelfth Amendment is really, really long because they wanted to make sure that nothing like the 1800 election happened again. Is this the one that talks about the uh, the electors uh, that that the, the main constitution? Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if the house the House of Representatives um, and the electors and the the number of electors and the quorum and the everything. Um, because they wanted to be sure that the next election and the election after that and so on and so on would work the way it was supposed to. Right. I think the next one is pretty self-explanatory, but... Yep. 
Because 1804 to... 1865. <laughs> and there's a very good movie about the, the uh, passing of this one. Um, I, I don't think this will be overturning time soon. No. No. And Lincoln was very determined to get this passed before the war ended. Because he wanted it to be the law of the land when the Confederacy returned to the United States. He wanted there to be no room for discussion, no room for argument. There would be no more slavery in the United States. And that's why some of them moved to Brazil. <laughs> yeah, well. That's a different story. Yeah. The important section of this one currently is except as a punishment for crime because there is still slave labor in this country and it's all done in prisons. It is illegal to import anything into the United States that was made by prison labor, but there are still a lot of things in the made in the United States by prisoners. All right. Number 14, first section. Yeah. Citizenship. This is where uh, birthright citizenship is doubly enshrined. It's in the original Constitution, as I recall, but here it's made very, very clear that everyone born in this country is a citizen of this country, regardless of the citizenship status of their parents. And this was originally because slaves weren't citizens. And that's what, and that's the argument where people cross the board just, just to give birth. Yeah. Yeah, which happens a lot less often than certain people would have you believe, in no small part because, man, it is hard to cross the border um, if you're not, if you don't have the right documentation. And having been pregnant three times, I wouldn't want to cross the border nine months pregnant. If you are strong enough to get yourself across the border nine months pregnant, by gods, we need more people like you, is my personal stance. <laughs> but, you know, the original intent was no one would be able to say that that people who had been enslaved and people whose parents had been enslaved weren't citizens. Section 2. Uh, representatives for those people, I guess. Yeah. Um, this is also um, basically, this is, this is a response to the three-fifths compromise. Oh, yeah. Uh, when they said... Three, three, three out of five of you can be used for taxes and representatives. Yeah, yeah, and and there's a lot to say about the three fifths compromise. Um, you know, because yeah, I because I, 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 I may be wrong. If I remember the fight correctly about that, it says the the South wanted to use the the slaves as use for you know more the, we have 20 slaves that's 20 more votes in the, the thing and they're like oh, that's 20 more taxes too like no they don't tax them this yeah representative yeah. it was it was basically they wanted the slaves to be counted as population for terms of um representation because it gave the slave states more power but all they wanted was the benefits of of that population they didn't want any of the negatives and the the north didn't want the slaves counted as population because they weren't in any other way treated as population and so that's where the three-fifths compromise comes from and it is awful you know it was a horrible system for really everybody but you know it was there for a reason and without it there arguably would not have been a united states um, and this was basically like, no, if they can't vote, they don't count. Well, back then, that was that included poor people too, poor white people too. Yeah, 
I mean, it depended a lot on what state you were in. Voting requirements used to vary a lot more by state than they currently do. And they still do some, uh, especially if you've ever been convicted of a crime. But, you know, women, obviously, across the board. Um, A lot of places, poor people couldn't vote. There were places with poll taxes. There were places with reading requirements. Oh, uh, and that got worse uh, under Jim Crow. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that one in the next one. Yeah. This is second. Uh, yeah, this oh. one is, yeah, Section 14 uh, is currently coming up these days. There are people who want certain people to be banned from Congress because uh, they committed treason a couple of years ago. And I'm here for that. So. Like, like. Like the former Confederate people that fought, that left the Congress and they, they, they got, look at me, we're back. Like no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like there were a, there were a lot of senators, representatives who left Congress in 1860, 1861, and were like, well, we're back now. And this basically said, no, no, you're not, unless Congress voted by two thirds of each house to let them. And uh, there are some people who I believe today should be kicked back out of Congress um, because they were, you know, encouraging insurrection a few years ago. Uh, and I, whatever thing do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> what, what, are you, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> there are there are some court cases currently going um, that might ban certain people from Congress if they succeed, and I'm. I'm here for it. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah, basically, you can't make the U.S. pay for Confederate debt, is what this says. Yeah, it's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Not ours. Do what you're supposed to do. I... Yeah. The voting one. All, all, all men can vote now. All men can vote now. Citizens. The previous condition of servitude is, I think, going to be an interesting point coming up for for uh, prison for for ex felons voting because there are a lot of places in the United States where um, convicted felons permanently lose their right to vote and i think i mean i think the current supreme court would throw it out but i think an upcoming supreme court could arguably make a 15th amendment decision that you cannot ban felons from voting and we'll talk about this last one also i i took in some of one time a few years ago um, um, we we took one of those uh, South voting tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the podcast, we had to pass this. Those thing. are those oh. are a lot. I've taken one of those. Like, I don't think even a normal person to all this can pass one of these. Oh no, no. All in ten minutes too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, of course, this is just. Every citizen man above twenty one. So yeah, like. it is still it is still limited to men, and there is still you know, uh, native of course, populations how, were not necessarily included in this. And of course, how they um, what's the word uh, enforce that? Yeah, <laughs> you'll note section two there. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Was basically saying. Don't mess with us, states. Congress can do this. Yeah. Of course, you know, like people like, oh, you can vote. You'll die if you vote, but you can vote. Yeah. Yeah. Good old Jim Crow. Oh, yeah. Oh, another time jump, the 70s to 1913. Yep. And uh, this is this is an appropriate weekend to be discussing the Sixteenth Amendment, 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's it, today's tax day. Mm -hmm. Well, today, technically today. Monday is because tax day never falls on a weekend. But yeah, it is. It is tax weekend. I've got a friend who's an accountant who's this is his busy time. Um, but this is what establishes the IRS right here. Um, and it is why blue states are currently supporting red states because they don't have to get the, the money back that they put into the system. Um, I got mine in done in January, February, and I used it to buy a PS5. Nice. I have no taxable income, so... <laughs> You know, I'm I'm on disability. I don't I don't have anything. But we got my partners done a while right. back. Um I consider myself a failure if his taxes aren't done by mid March. So Yeah, I try to get mine as done soon as possible. Not only because that's where I get my, you know, actual fun and mm -hmm. that's where I usually get my fun income. Not not I need this for bills to and yeah. to survive for food income oh absolutely well it, it, with us it was it took as long as it did because his employer took too long giving him his w-2s so but yeah this is you know regardless of what sovereign citizens say the 16th mm -hmm. amendment is right there and it says the irs is constitutional and i think before this most of the money came from tariffs yeah yeah before this basically the only system the united states had of raising money as a nation was tariffs the states could tax things but the power of the federal government to tax really stems from the 16th amendment and you know this is in the lead up to world war one and i don't think anybody knew exactly when world war one was coming but i also don't think it took a lot of foresight to know that a war was coming because the alliances were really, really complicated, and everybody was building a whole lot of weaponry. Like, what? War in Europe? That, that, that would never happen. Yeah, no. No. Not happening now, for sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, this is, this is where the transition to a strong federal government arguably starts, is with the 16th Amendment. Because... You can afford a strong federal government when they have taxes. Uh, next one, I th if I remember correctly, I think it's it might be controversial to some people. Yeah. Um. So we used to appoint senators uh, from the Congress, the, like the state, the, like the yeah, the state like, house. For me, from Columbus, or, or yeah, you from for, actually, well, I mean, mine are just downtown from me because i live in my state capital uh olympia washington but um lincoln the lincoln douglas debates are referred to as him debating to be a senator but technically they weren't because senators were still appointed by congress at the time so none of those people he was debating in front of were going to be able to vote for him anyway unless they're voting unless they're debating in front of the state right which they weren't <laughs> People. Um, you know, at the time, yeah, it, 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 yeah. yeah, people were like, oh, "We like that guy." They'd be like, "Good for you." We're going to write exactly some guy. of the shenanigans with with the Senate pre Seventeenth Amendment were just, you know. Now, I don't think th I think this is another one where there haven't been any Supreme Court cases based on it because it's dealing with a very, very specific, very, very limited problem. But, um, yeah, it, it was basically like, you know what? Let's let's give a little bit more power to the people. I, I've heard some, there are some people that actually want to repel this one. Well, I mean, there are people who want to repeal everything. So I'm not surprised. But I think that the idea would be... Um, you can't gerrymander a senator. Because, well, because everyone in your state votes for both senators. 
So your senator is always going to be more reflective of the actual political makeup of your area than your state house necessarily will be because you can draw district lines to divide up your state house in a much more partisan way so that a party that does not necessarily have the numbers of popular support still wins in the state house all the time. And you can't do that with senators because everybody votes for senator. Okay, oh, yeah. this one that... <laughs> 19th Amendment. Or 18th Amendment, rather. 1919. Mostly passed because of World War I, because all the people who would have voted against it were off surfing in World War I. Uh, I think that there are also different time too, where people people drank a lot more than they do. Oh, not. yeah. No, people drank a ton. And what's more, if you read the amendment itself, it doesn't define intoxicating liquors. And a lot of people who voted for it thought that intoxicating liquor specifically would imply, like, spirits. And were shocked when the laws passed actually outlawed things like beer and wine. And so there was a bit of a bait and switch played with this amendment. And it had the benefit of all of the young men, well, not all, but many, many young men being off at war. And so this one kind of snuck in through a combination of luck and deceit and was a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you, cause you know when when the, when you legal, make something illegal, that's the end of the, at the end of the day, nothing nothing to happen. Well not only that, but like I don't drink and I know how to make alcohol at home. Like, alcohol is the most... You, you accidentally can make alcohol at home. Just the... I, I, don't, I, I don't think I did, but one time I actually had a, a piece of... I don't think it was alcohol, because I, don't think, I, I think you add some more stuff to it. But I drank some, like... Two month old grape juice in my, my backpack. Yeah, that is mine. that is probably fermented, and that is probably I mean low levels of alcohol, but that probably has alcohol in it. They used to sell these bricks of during prohibition. They sold these bricks of grape juice concentrate, and there would be instructions printed on the packaging with things like "Do not reconstitute this and put it in a bottle in a dark closet for such and such a length of time, because then it would turn into wine, and that would be bad." Wink, wink. <laughs> you know, I mean, not only were they were they banning a substance that is extraordinarily popular, they were banning a substance that is extraordinarily popular and extraordinarily easy to manufacture. And so it failed, because of course it did. And here comes the Congress ha have the power to enforce these things. They yep. Need to. But a lot of them probably didn't. <laughs> no, there were a lot of, of people in Congress who were uh, well stocked with alcohol. There was a bootlegger to Congress. I mean, this was just not not enforced and not enforceable. Uh, yeah. yeah, even the that's why I, I think that's why they had to get the, get the federal cops into some of these things because the local cops were like, I'm Well, and there were, I forget how many prohibition agents there were for the entire nation, but it was not a lot because they didn't, they didn't budget for a lot of prohibition agents because, you know, A, by taking away things like alcohol taxes. You have just cut off a large amount of income. And B, they didn't want to enforce it. So, yeah, there was just, it was it was a joke. It was, and that just made the bootleggers, you know, fashionable and cool. And it, yeah, I like that. You talk about tax. Like, I like how all of a sudden, like, like Colorado has all these taxes. 
surplus I can use. Yeah. For stuff. Oh yeah. No, Washington, they, same thing. You know, we we actually passed our legalization on the same day as Colorado, but they're a time zone ahead of us, so they get all the press. Um, because they were technically first by an hour. Um, you know, and and we have a ton of tax money from the like eight different dispensaries within five miles of my house you know that we aren't now spending on busting everyone in the state who's trying to sell weed yeah and you can if it becomes legal in ohio, I, I thought about this if it comes legal in ohio i thought about like making my own little strain thing like like hey i'm gonna make this cross breed some plants yeah. you know Get, get the natural selection going, or I mean, artificial selection. Get better this, better that. I yeah. thought about that. <laughs> All right, I think the next one. I don't think it's kind of, I don't think it's controversial, but some people might disagree. When we can vote now? Yeah. Oh, there are some people who don't like that one, but I'm a fan. I mean, there were there were states who had Wyoming was the first state where women had the right to vote, but they couldn't vote in federal elections because it was against federal law. Um, Utah actually passed the right to vote fairly early because then uh, all the Mormon women could vote and they would vote for Mormons and that swung elections. Um. You know, so the Western states tended to pass these these laws for various reasons before the Eastern states. But Woodrow Wilson, for a long time, just refused to meet with anyone pressing the right to vote for women. Um, he was very opposed to the whole thing. Well, Woodrow Wilson was a was a wasn't that like, smart of, of a guy. Well, he was he was right smart, but he had some very backwards ideas. Yeah. Like, like, say, uh, watching a KKK movie oh, in the White man. House. And I, I've seen that movie, and it's an important piece of film history that I'm certainly never watching again. Yeah. Like, let, let's bring back this Nats, this almost dead thing, and make it natural well, again. Yeah. But yeah, I don't. Like, I don't see why anybody would be against this amendment, <laughs> even even nowadays. I believe it starts and ends with, with, with misogyny. Uh, so everyone above tw- twenty one can vote. Now. Yes. Yes. Like, all right. Double digits now, or double yep. XX. And this was basically, um, you know, we're starting with January and not March because at the at the time, um, inauguration day was in March, and there was a considerably longer what's called lame duck period, and the longer one made more sense in the days where everybody traveled by horseback and it took longer to get messages around. But by that but, time, trains have happened and cars have happened by now. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think planes were that thing yet, but the, they were starting There to was be. some commercial air flight, but not a lot. You know, Lindbergh had crossed the Atlantic by this point, and, you know. But I doubt, but I, doubt if, but I would doubt Air Force One was a thing where you could. It like, really, know. it was not yet. But there was still, you know, much more rapid travel and certainly more rapid communication. Yeah. Uh, this I, is yeah, just I as think, television is starting up. Yeah, I think. Oh, it was it was dangerous, like dirigibles, like the Hindenburg. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's put let's put hydrogen gas in a balloon. Let's I mean, balloon. it worked until there was all that lightning. <laughs> Then they're like, hey, this is helium. Oh, hey, this is light, too. This is on fire. Yeah, well, hydrogen was cheaper. Yeah, so like, this is like, we, we get to the, we, we get the, in, log in faster and like, and the other guy out sooner. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess maybe also in that, in the last two months before he got kicked out, they could do some 
stuff they wanted to. Yeah, there was a lot of judicial stuff that was that was done in those last couple of months. Um, and various other, like, let's get some stuff in real fast that we know that people don't approve of, but we can because we've got these extra two months. So it's like, let's let's maybe trim that, give them less time to do that, because it's not like he's got to, you know, ride across seven states on horseback. I mean, he can, but he doesn't have to. So at least once a, every a year. So yeah. So, so like, does that mean technically they, 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 they can go one time and then leave? Technically, Congress only has to assemble at noon, presumably Eastern time, on the 3rd of January. Sometimes it feels like they do, sometimes they feel like they do that do that sometimes. I mean, you know. But like that's a different whole new different, yes. different thing. Let's see. Yeah, and this is basically enshrining in law the the succession. Because technically, up until 1933, there was no law saying who took over after something happened to the president. It just happened to be like the vice president. This happened to be it's me. Like, like. yeah. Um, the the first vice president, I believe it was Tyler, was the first vice president yeah, with William Henry Harrison, who yeah, 30, 30 days in his office, like oh. thirty three. Yeah, he also delivered the longest inaugural address, I, I heard, three hours. Yeah, I, I heard there's it's a myth about that. He didn't die of pneumonia. He died of like water poisoning or, or, or whatever water is in the water system. No, it's um, oh gosh, not not Harrison, but the next one who died in office supposedly died of cholera. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's a disease. Um, but uh, the um, Harrison's vice president was referred to for his entire term of service after Harrison died as his accidency by people who didn't like him and didn't think he should have been president. So this is basically saying, no, but really, this is how it works. Yeah, okay, we've done this like six times now, but from here on out, this is officially how it works. But there was just the one that also was talked about this, the Speaker of the House is next, or is that the future, the future one? I believe that's not in the Constitution. I believe that is just federal law. Um because it's never come up so they don't feel the need to put it in the constitution is my suspicion okay, but there is a federal law and it goes through the speaker of the house and the president pro tempore of the senate and then all, all the cabinet members and all the there. cabinet members and uh, yeah and so you end up with, like, established the secretary of agriculture or something sitting out the state of the union address just in case By the way, where's our secretary of internet? Internet. internet? I did know YouTube. that about John Tyler's grandson. Uh, oh yeah, I think I heard about that. A bunch of people got married late. Is basically the version. And the, and then their kids got married late. And, yeah. And, but yeah, uh, we need a secretary of uh, of YouTube rights. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a secretary of internet is probably forthcoming at some point. Secretary of communications, I would suspect, is a cabinet post that will probably exist at some point. Because the, the cabinet is not set by the Constitution. It is set by federal law. So. Now, now this is interesting. If something happens, the, the House can choose a president and the Senate can choose a vice president. Yeah. And this, this has happened once. Uh, Gerald Ford took over after Spiro Agnew resigned uh, because of a few little tax issues he was having. And Congress appointed then-Senator, as I recall, Gerald Ford. And then Nixon resigned. And without having been elected to anything, Gerald Ford became president. I think the other one was during the ja Jackson, Jackson and... Quincy Adams election. Well, that was that was about the House of Representatives deciding the election, 
and it was based on who had a plurality and who had a majority because no one had a majority and that was a that was a complicated like the the electoral college didn't make a decision so it got thrown into the house of representatives but this was literally gerald ford was not elected vice president he was appointed vice president under the 20th amendment and then Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford became president, also under the 20th Amendment. Uh, 21. 21. Oops, my bad. Yes, that was that was the 1820 election. You're like... Hey, you know that thing you said about alcohol? You can do it again. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Our bad. Here, have a beer. I think this one is pretty much... Yeah, this is just like, yeah, never mind. All of that stuff. Never mind. There, booze again. No laws. Blah, blah, blah. Like, please stop buying from gangsters. <laughs> yeah, basically. I think that's when they... I think that's when they came to power, really. That came yeah. From... Organized crime really got its hold during Prohibition. Because, of course, it did. Ah, uh, term, the term limits. Term limits. This is basically uh, FDR's amendment. Because before, you know... It, it was uh, it wasn't said it was more traditional. Yeah, it was I tradition. Think. The thing is, is George Washington didn't want to be president, and they told him a bunch of delegates went to Washington and said that if he didn't take the job as president, which everybody knew was intended to go to him the first time, if he didn't take the job, it would be seen as proof that he didn't believe in the United States as a concept, and he sighed. And he went, and he became president. Yeah, I, I heard at least at least the first two elections when he was thing. He didn't really have that. There wasn't there was a big gap between electoral votes. Yeah, there popular. basically there were no other electoral votes. It was everybody voted for for Washington. And the thing is, is he didn't want to run the second time. And they told him that if he didn't run the second time, that it would be seen as him saying that the the country was a failure. But he, fine, and he became president. And then the third time, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm not third time, he's like, no. nope, I'm done. I'm going home. It's like, and they're like, oh, he's a, he's a wow, he's a, a good example for yeah. us. Yeah, and from then on, and I mean, and that included people like Teddy Roosevelt, who even under the 22nd Amendment, Theodore Roosevelt would have been qualified to run for another term. He did technically try to. He did, and he didn't win. But what I'm saying is, even if the 22nd Amendment had been in place, he would have been eligible for that run because he'd served less than two years of of um of McKinley's, of McKinley's, McKinley's term. McKinley was more than two years into his term when he died. Um and uh and so he would have been eligible for another term under the 20th Amendment. Didn't matter because it hadn't been passed yet. Um but this was basically because FDR um, felt that he was the only person who really was capable of getting the United States through World War II. That's why he kept running. Yeah, and first, it's it's funny that both FDR and Hitler came to power at the same time. But yeah, different results. Yeah, and you know, we were extremely isolationist in 1940. Like, people forget this now, but uh, FDR was practically alone in saying, in saying, you know, hey, guys, uh, I'd really like to, help, you help, know. Help, help the people over there. <laughs> yeah, like, be prepared for this war that is going to take us whether we want it to or not. Uh, no, 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 make it this way. Oh, look, there's there's Nazi subs off the coast of, of New York. Yeah. Um, you know, and so he ran in 1940 because he just, he knew that the U.S. was not going to avoid World War II. And no one else running seemed to know that. 
And then in 1944, he ran because it was war and he was president. The same and thing then, happened. I think the same thing yeah. happened with uh, Wilson. Well, I mean, Wilson had two terms. About Wilson, but I'm. I'm I never, never, never mind. I'm thinking something else. Wilson ran in 1912 and won, and then ran in 1916 under the slogan "He kept us out of the war." And a year later, we were in that war. <laughs> and a year later, we were in the war, and he had a stroke, and his first lady basically ran the country for a while. Um, and then he left office in 1920 because he would not have won. In his in his state of health, there was no way. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised. This one, I'm surprised that they didn't make the vice president president during this. Well, Edith this Wilson trip. lied about how bad off he was. She would say. Oh, I'm taking these documents in to have the president sign them. No, you can't come in. And everybody went, well, okay, I, I guess so. And then she'd bring out the signed documents. She was running the country. You know, arguably, our first female president was Edith Wilson. But and that's part of why the, the succession was set the way it was because of the Wilson thing. But uh, this specific one is aimed at we are not going to let another FDR happen. And it wouldn't have applied to Truman had Truman won in 52. Because it specifically says that it won't apply to whoever is in present, you know, uh, during the term with within which this article becomes operative. Um, but all presidents after, and of course Truman didn't win in 1952, but all presidents from that point on were going to be limited to uh, no more than, realistically, nine years, 364 days. Yeah, I think it's two terms plus Two, uh, plus two more years if they were vice president. So like 10 years, give or take 10 years in total. Yeah. No more than two years of, of being president after taking office as being under a vice president or under another president. So. Yeah. All right. One. DC can vote for things. The thing is, is when Washington, DC was created, uh, the idea that anybody would actually live there year round was not considered. So it was like, oh, well, we're going to you know, it's not going to be part of any state and it's not going to have its own government and blah, blah, blah. And the entirety of Washington, D.C. is controlled by Congress. They can set their own laws, but Congress has to approve them. Which is why there's the D.C. statehood movement, because uh, if you've ever seen a Washington, D.C. license plate, the slogan on it is taxation without representation. Yeah, I think it's between D.C. and Puerto Rico. Yeah. Well, Puerto Rico is complicated because there are territory, there are a lot of U.S. territories. Um, and there are some privileges that you get with being a territory, but there are a lot that come with statehood that you don't get. And there's, a you know, and not everyone in Puerto Rico wants Puerto Rico to become a state. I, I think... That's time I remember the '90s. It was it was a majority of people that did it. That at least that at least thirty years ago. I don't know if that's still the same now. Well, and, and as I recall, that left out a couple of other options that they could go with. Like I think that it was either independent country become a state or remain as we are. Yeah, and, and there are there are, I believe there are one or two other options that some people there support, and it's it's complicated, and I haven't read about it in a while. 
I did read a book about all of the U.S. territories at one point that talked a lot about it, but that was a while ago. Um, well, oh, but, but, yeah, I li- but I like the thing where people were like, why do they give money to Puerto Rico? They're not American citizens. Yeah, they, like, are. they are. They <laughs> absolutely are. And I got, uh, I mean, they're all in-laws, but I've got family in Puerto Rico, and uh, yeah, they're U.S. citizens, all of them. They can't vote. I mean, they citizens. can vote for president, I believe, now. But no, really? No, that's right. They get delegates at the conventions, but their votes for president don't count. Cause sure. Um, yeah, and they have limited say in their own local government, and it's this whole big thing. And get most of my my Puerto Rican in laws started on uh, things like disaster relief. Because uh, I have family distant by marriage family still living on puerto rico who have been through a couple of hurricanes in the last few years and uh yeah yeah i've had some arguments on facebook about people about yeah that. Like... um my my father's sister married into a very large puerto rican family and then two of her sons married into a different puerto rican family they married sisters and uh, watching some of them argue with one of my uncle's brothers, who is old and conservative, is interesting. Uh, they disagree with him about a lot of things. But with D.C., it's very, very clear the mandate is there. The people of D.C. want statehood. Um And while I understand the historical reasons laid out for why D.C. is not a state or a part of a state, I also think they don't hold in a current setting where, really, though, people live there. Yeah, except they probably, before people went went there, did their job and went back home. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a few months of territory. Number twenty-four, almost at, at the end. Yeah, this is this is one that affected my mother. Actually, my mother turned twenty-one, January fourth, uh, nineteen sixty-five. Oh no, this is poll tax. Sorry, we're we're not we're not there yet. But yeah, um, poll tax was partially a Jim Crow thing. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead in a moment. Don't mind me. Poll tax was mostly a Jim Crow thing. Mm. It was also partially a uh, poor people thing, just in general. Um, Initially, they didn't want people like, oh, say, me to have a vote. I mean, they didn't want me to have a vote for other reasons, but also because I am not a property owner. And I could not afford to pay a poll tax. I, I think most property owners can't afford to pay poll tax nowadays. <laughs> oh, God, no. Nobody can afford it these days. But poll taxes were sometimes applied in slightly more arbitrary fashions than others. And some people were asked to pay them and some worked, and sometimes they would get grandfathered in. And it was partially a Jim Crow thing, which is why, or, you know, 1964. Kind of, kind of like a, like a bouncer in a, in a club. Like, you don't need to pay your pull tax. Come on in. You need to pay your pull yeah. tax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so 1964, uh, the only way to, to abolish poll taxes. Make an amendment. Yeah. Um, because that was, you know, legally and officially all of the election stuff is set by the state which is a whole other thing and don't get me started but you know in order to set any election law on a federal level it's got to be in the constitution uh, 25 yep I guess this, this makes it official official <laughs> yep And it's only been removal from office or resignation once. Um, 
every other U.S. president, either their term has expired, you know, yeah. naturally in its time, or they have died. Naturally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, oh, this, is, this is right after uh, the Kennedy thing. Yeah. This is, this is under uh, Lyndon Johnson. Um, who... Who got sworn in during the plane ride. <laughs> oh, just before, just before, but it was... Ooh, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Ask a Mortician on YouTube, but she does a deep dive into... She's not talking about the actual assassination itself. She's mostly interested in the, the funerary issues involved. But she did a video about Dallas and covers the timeline of the day, including Johnson's being sworn in with a presumably fairly freaked out Jackie Kennedy by his side. Yeah, yeah, I think the two things that timeline will characterize is this one and the World War One starting sh shot killing the Archduke thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two of the two of the big examples about why you don't ride around in an open top car if you're famous. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, and this one, I, I think we talked about four. This one affirmatively says. Vice yeah. President could nominate one. Yeah, because before it was just the Senate's going to appoint somebody, and now it's like, no, the president can appoint somebody. And then, yeah. So there there was a stretch there. And I don't think it got used during that stretch. Like, I'd have to go back and look because, I mean, I know FDR went through about three vice presidents, but partially that was because he just kept running with different guys. Oh, yeah, no, the whole thing with Jackie is horrible horribly distressing um and uh caitlin doty's jackie kennedy impersonation is is kind of a lot too so um but yeah basically the the 25th amendment and lyndon johnson who actually was on the warren commission or not lyndon johnson gerald ford was on the warren commission had the best attendance record benefited from yes this is how things are going to go and here we get a little bit more of succession um i think, but, I, think yeah, I don't think this is exactly who's the line of succession but yeah basically it's the president has to has to send everybody a note i'm in charge now <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, and this is this is getting into the weeds of how exactly everything is going to be done. And they were trying to pull this one on Trump for a while, um, have him declared incompetent to serve at the end of his his term. Um, but Pence would have have had to have been on board on that, and uh, that didn't happen. So yeah. So I think it, it, weird or not weird, but, but he, like the people that want, want him hung too. Yeah, like they they don't eat, they probably don't know enough of the the Constitution to know what he could have done and didn't. Like, oh, I'm gonna like I'm just gonna say, say now nah, throw this out. Whatever, we're still we're still in charge. Yep. Uh, next one, I think. Is, next one, I th some people are. Next one, I think some people think is controversial, and that's the lowering the voting age. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a lot of debate about the relative ages of the vote and drinking and things like that. But this is a Vietnam response right here, because 18 is old enough to be in the military. And actually, if you are in the military at 18, I believe you can drink on base on the grounds of, well, if you're an adult enough to go to war and get shot at, you can drink. I, I can be wrong about this, but I think this is some same timeline where the voting age went down to 18, the drinking age went up to 21. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and, that, and now the cigarettes are the same, 
to back the same way now. Yeah. Right recently. But the big controversy in the late sixties and early seventies was, I mean, obviously very early seventies, but was being old enough to go to war and not old enough to make the decision about whether your country would go to war. And like, that's legit. Either the draft age needed to be raised or the voting age needed to be lowered. There was this three year gap, which is where most people were getting drafted was in that three year gap. You can go to war, but you can't decide the person to send you to war. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people were getting drafted out of high school. You know, if they didn't have some kind of, of deferral, you know, the kids who couldn't afford to go to college were going to Vietnam instead, and they could they did not have a vote. And so that is mostly where this amendment comes from. Because I think it was time after this, the draft, they, took, they, had the draft, they get, did away with the draft, yeah. I think. Yeah, there is no draft anymore. And actually, my dad was a recruiting sergeant for the Air Force right around this time. Um, And, you know, we had a, a comic strip that my dad had clipped out something about an all-volunteer army and about how you had to take what you could get. But the fact is, you know... We were talking earlier about juries, but when my dad was initially in the Air Force, a lot of the Air Force was people who couldn't come up with a way to get out of the Air Force. Yeah, so yeah, so now every citizen, 18 and above, men, women, black, black, white, yeah, can vote. Yeah. And next, uh, the final the final one is in, in our life. This one passed in our lifetime, at least, at least in my lifetime, because I'm old. <laughs> I was twelve when this happened. Yes, yeah. Um, I uh, I turned what sixteen that year, so we're about the same age. Oh. Nice. Yeah, and and the funny about this one is. I heard it was on the books since the beginning. Yeah, it was proposed. And it had been sitting there for a really, really long time. And if you'll notice, a few of the amendments have things like, you know, if this isn't passed in such and such number of years, it won't take effect. But only, but they only, a few of them specifically say that. And it was always kind of assumed that if it didn't pass in a specific number of years, it wouldn't take, an, take effect. But this one had been sitting around since 1789, and then some guy decided it needed to get passed. I, I like this. Basically, it means you can't get you can't get yourself a pay raise. You have to wait until next term. Yeah, because uh, and you, you have the hope that you get reelected to get the pay raise. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm like, myself a pay. And part of it was the assumption that the pay raise would then be part of the conversation about whether you would be reelected or not. I like that. Before that, basically says, I'm going to give myself a raise. If yeah. I, if I agree, okay, give yourself a raise. We got yeah. an, hour, an hour a week raise. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it's... We as a, a country are not enormously fond of the idea of the career politician. Um, there. That's one of the reasons we're so big on term limits. And there are problems... Hello? There are problems with term limits. Um, not least being, if you pass term limits, the only people who really know how the system works are the lobbyists. But there is something to be said for if you pass a law that gives you a benefit, you should have to wait until getting reelected before you get that benefit. Because you are not, in fact, a monarch. Yeah, I I, I think the, the people agree with the Senate, maybe in the House, but I think the ones people are iffy about or probably the, the Supreme, Supreme Court ones. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I think at least one Supreme Court justice needs to be impeached and removed from office, but that's 
uh, less and less controversial, really. But but that but that but, but that's again that's not a term limit. That, no, it is not a term limit. And the thing is, is that's a. It needs to become okay for Supreme Court justices to retire again. Because for a while, what happened was like, yeah, they could stay in office for freaking ever, but then they would choose not to because they were, as, in, in the immortal words of Thurgood Marshall, old and falling apart. Um, and then more and more and more just died in office. No, it was yeah. Thurgood Marshall who said that about himself, and then he was replaced with Clarence Thomas. Um, I think th I've heard this before. Like, I'd be wrong. That what they they said is that the thing was they they're supposed to be like quote quote not el not opponent to any person that appointed them. Yeah, they they were supposed. The theory is that the Supreme Court is not bound by politics. And if they have a lifetime appointment and don't have to cozy up to the next administration, oh, yes, yes, he absolutely is. Um, and be just saying, you know, Clarence Thomas is the one I think should be impeached. Yes. Um, but the, the theory was that, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court would not be responsible to the administration that appointed them. They would not be responsible to Congress. They would be an apolitical body. And that is a great theory. Uh, the practice has not been doing so well through my adult life. Can't speak much to before that. I mean, there are a few cases I can speak to, but mostly that uh, Tawny was a terrible person. Uh, he's the one who wrote Dred Scott. I oh, the one... Or, or... Yeah, even though you're in, even though you're in a free state, it doesn't matter. Your yeah, no, he, he was the one who was of the opinion that uh, no black person had any rights that a white person was bound to respect. I have this personal headcanon that what's going on in the Supreme Court right now is Roberts doesn't want to be seen as the next Tawny, and so anytime you see a decision from him where you're like, wait, Roberts voted that way, that's why. I think the other one, favorite one was the, I forget when it was, but the separate but equal. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, what, 1870s, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, you know, that was, I, I don't think they really were equal. Oh, they, they almost never were, and that was part of the point. But then, um, you know, under, under Brown v. Board of Education, it was basically declared that separate was by definition unequal um which is oh uh it's been argued that by people who don't know tawny very well that he was bullied into it by buchanan buchanan did hope that the dred scott would uh bring the country together but also i've read enough about tawny to know that he was just a terrible person who, of course, I, I, I've heard Buchanan was, was not smart, a great person either. Buchanan was not a great person either, though there is some theory that he may have been our first queer president, and that's based oh, on yeah. period gossip, which is fun. Um, and he also, he, he wasn't never married. Well, he was never yeah. married, and he had um, what was either a boyfriend or a heterosexual life mate. The evidence is not clear as to which one it was. He also said to Lincoln that if Lincoln was half as happy to be entering office as Buchanan was to be leaving it, then Lincoln was one of the happiest men alive. Yeah, it's funny though. He, he put the he he he, he put the thing on Lincoln's ha hand or head, mm -hmm. but pretty much they, they left during his, most of them left during his. Well, movie. to be fair, a lot of them were leaving because Lincoln had been elected, and they were afraid of what Lincoln would do. But still, he did nothing. To, Buchanan did nothing to stop him. Yeah, no, Buchanan just wanted to run away, basically. Um, but um, you know, I think Roberts is looking at the whole thing from a lens of history in a way that uh, the people who appointed him weren't expecting him to do, and looking at it saying, "Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be that guy." Um, because I, I don't think that, but thing that Buchanan, I don't think there's a, 
there's a, I think there's no amendment saying states can't leave, but it's pretty much established now. If no, you're, you're, you're saying. Well, I know that Sandra Day O'Connor resigned and Kennedy resigned. Over, over a state leaving the country? Oh, uh, secession, secession is basically assumed to be um, once you're in, you're in, but there is officially no law saying that, because how would you pass that? Um, you know, and, and the states absolutely, um, seceded over slavery. Like there's no debating that if you know anything at all about the documents, the states passed about the, the, the lost cause myth. Yeah. Like if you read the state, the, the constitution's written during the initial secession they're all talking about how we are leaving to protect our sacred right of slavery like i'm sorry no <laughs> like maybe the individual soldiers weren't all fighting for slavery but the aristocracy was yes and then later and it's opposite like i think it changed a bit in the north it some of them cared about slavery, other ones, most of them didn't know, I think. But later on, I think more, more people cared about slavery in the North. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, well, a lot of a lot of people never cared about slavery, honestly. Like, there were, there was a, yeah. there were soldiers yeah, who went from Gettysburg to New York to put down a draft riot that included murdering black people. It, yeah, it was the the Mexicans were taking our job, but now the, the slaves taking. Yeah, our it was job. it was freed slaves who were taking our jobs, but it wasn't like oh, slavery is evil kind of caring about slavery, you know. And they didn't care about slavery as long as it was in the South, and all of that. I, yeah, I heard, I heard some people who did that later on when they went to war and then then they actually saw it for themselves. They're so like, oh, this is actually a real thing. Yeah, exactly. Like there there were, you know. A lot of abolitionists, both made before the war and during the war, who hadn't cared about slavery one way or another, some of them not even in the they're taking our jobs kind of sense, until they actually saw slavery. Um, Lincoln had always kind of been anti-slavery, and then he actually went to New Orleans and... You know, he wasn't a radical abolitionist, but he was definitely a full-on abolitionist from that point on. Yeah, I think a lot of people that slowly pay the slaves, you know, pay them. Yeah, this. yeah. And also, the thing wasn't people. People. People get this confused too. That they they didn't want to. They got people that they didn't want to abolish slavery. They just when they they couldn't expand it anymore. New states. This was the slave. The people that had already had slaves, they could keep them, but like no, no more new states with slaves. Yeah, there was there was a lot of shades of gray in the slave debate. Um, there were people who wanted it completely abolished. There were people who wanted it expanded everywhere, and probably, well, yeah, that too. Lincoln's family was fairly constantly being displaced by slaveholders. But also, eventually, he saw slavery. It was like, oh, wow, this is really awful. But, um, and his father was, oh, boy, his father was awful. But, um, you know, probably 90% of the United States was somewhere in between on the slave debate. Uh, it's funny you mentioned New Orleans, because I think Louisiana, because I think it was, it was that, it might be others, I don't think it was other states, but especially in, in Louisiana and New Orleans, there were some black families that had slaves. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were black families in a bunch of places that had slaves. Um, and and then uh, Don Cheadle's family actually, he had ancestors who were owned by Seminoles. I want to say. Um, and interestingly, because his his ancestors were owned by Native Americans they weren't freed by the 13th Amendment. That didn't cover Native Americans who were not seen as citizens. They were seen at the time as sovereign nations, completely separate from the United States government. I mean, conquered sovereign nations, God knows, but sovereign nations. And therefore, the 13th Amendment didn't apply to them because if it did, then all of the 
benefits of the Constitution applied to them. And so uh, eventually the Seminole freed their slaves, but it took a few years for for that to happen after the Civil War. Alright. So wrapping this up, anything you want to talk about or advertise? Um, well, I write <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I do I do some fri some writing about film. I write for a website, and I'm gonna have to spell the name because it's a stupid name and I hate it, but not my site, whatever. It's a site called the hyphen s-o-l-u-t-e dot com the salute and that's a, a fan-based film website and it's all essays about all kinds of weird stuff i have an article that went up today about a minor actor named chuck mccann who among other things was the voice of sunny the bird from the cocoa puffs ad he he was cuckoo for cocoa puffs um, and I write nice. for that site about four days a week. So. For me, I, I got a few planned things coming up. Let's get my screen up real fast. And I'll just... All right, coming up next week, me and my guest, and talking about the all popular series Kingdom Heart, where the, the, where Disney and Final Fantasy decided to hey, let's throw some stuff together in Blender and see what sticks. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm familiar with the series, yeah. Oh, definitely, it was one of my favorite series. <laughs> then. I can't, I can't skip a thing. We got to that. The guy in chat here, indeed, we're talking about his favorite English monarchs and his top 50, I think, or whatever. We can rank them all from Alfred the Great to Queen Anne. Because after that, they're not English monarchs anymore. They're British monarchs. <laughs> Technically true. So, so, yeah. Then, in three. We will be talking about the trilogy of the Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man. And finally, if I get to it, we'll be talking about I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you just do it, <laughs> things will turn okay. Unintelligent Here design. on the internet, oh. where information is written and the world is full of mistruths, comes a show where you where learn what you didn't know you wanted you designed, to learn. Join uh, Vandalia 1998 uh, and many something. knowledgeable guests as Defects. they tackle the subjects of biology, history, vaccines, lore, geology, the video what games, cosmology, music, movies, and such more. Talking time with caffeine. Join the gang every Saturday evening and remember never stop learning and enjoy course, the random But yeah, that's I'll my you next month then of broadcasting. Nice. It's funny, I, I, I people look at the giraffe at the nerve, but <laughs> look at the, the mm. front of the source one. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> well, thank you for being. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being thank on. You for thank you for me. explaining the stuff that, that, at least the best of your ability. Thank you. 
I, you, you have anything to say closing wise? You have like a, a catchphrase you want to say? Uh, no, thank, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. I, as I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.